Good morning and a very warm welcome to the second edition of the Security, Education, Research and Innovation or SERI conference. Today's event is brought to you by the National Center of Excellence, which is a joint initiative of the Data Security Council of India and MITE. Now, SERI was conceptualized last year to provide a world-class platform for academicians, researchers, engineers, industrial participants, and students to showcase their cutting-edge research work in diverse cybersecurity domains with the global experts. This year's theme, ladies and gentlemen, is advanced development in the areas of cryptography, applied cryptography, cybersecurity, and privacy. The main objective of this conference is to present academic research as well as technical development in the industry. And the conference will all also, in fact, include high quality and focused technical programs on cybersecurity and cryptography with keynotes and panel discussions from prominent industry and academia experts. Now, um, at the outset, we'd like to thank our partners, our publication partner, Taylor and Francis, and partner tier one, Microsoft, uh, for uh, uh, their support and partnership for this event. And um, for all of our audiences, you can tweet about the event using the hashtag SERI2021 and also tag us using the handle uh, National COE. And um, that's how you can, in fact, tweet about the event. Now, to begin with uh, the inaugural session, I'd like to first of all invite on stage Ms. Rama Vedashri, the CEO of uh, DSCI. And uh, I'd also like to invite on stage uh, another guest, Sri Arvind Kumar, Scientist G. DG STQC and uh, Group Coordinator Cybersecurity R&D at MIT. And uh, we welcome uh, both of you. And without any ado, uh, uh, Ms. Rama Vedashri, I request you to kindly give the welcome note and the introductory remarks. Thank you. First of all, a warm welcome to everyone who's joining us at the second edition of SERI 2021, which is the Security Education Research and Innovation, and also a warm welcome and thanks to Sri Arvind Kumarji for joining us at this inaugural address of the SERI conference, uh, which is uh, brought uh, and hosted by the National Center of Excellence, which DSA has had an opportunity to partner with Ministry of Electronics and IT and set it up. As all of us are aware, cybersecurity and the industry in India is growing very rapidly. We are emerging as a global hub for cybersecurity. The product and startup ecosystem itself is about 250 plus uh, niche startups in cybersecurity already having crossed a $1 billion industry. And academic institutions in India, across all the premier academic institutions, whether it is IITs, Indian Institute of Science, several of the national institutes, NITs, have been doing a lot of cutting edge research. The objective of N National Center of Excellence and the purpose of hosting the SERI 2021 is, how do we get academic institutions and the researchers and the academic community working on some of the deep tech domains in cyber and our industry ecosystem, whether it is the startups, the emerging product companies, the services companies, the global tech R&D uh, units established in India to come together. The entire objective of National COE is to incubate uh, entrepreneurship and technology development in some of the emerging deep tech areas, whereas I think the mainstream cybersecurity products ecosystem is really scaling up on its own uh, pretty well, uh, while there is some more work to do that. But here, I think in NCOE, the focus is around working on some of the future use cases, which are very important in the strategic domain of cyber for India and for both academia, industry, and of course, government. And that is the primary purpose. You've been observing the kind of uh, programs that our NCOE has been hosting, whether it is the crypto innovation uh, series, the lightweight cypher challenge on which you'll hear a little more in the later part of the inaugural session. Also some of the call for papers that have been, uh, you know, hosted by our NCOE, whether it's in the area of 5G or SCADA security. We've also had the opportunity, thanks to the National COE being a nodal institution that has been established in partnership with METI, some uh, funded research projects with academic institutions in some areas which are typically where, which would have been, you know, some fundamental research happening in academic institutions, but how do we, take it to market, how do we productize it? How do we get 
uh, industry ecosystem to engage with academic institutions when these use cases and these research work is going on. That was the objective of those research projects. And we've had many such uh, research projects in the last couple of years, whether it is in the area of IoT sensor data, IoT network traffic. There was an, one around lightweight image encryption technique. When these research projects are being undertaken by some of the premier academic institutions, now we are making sure that it doesn't stop there. There's a lot that we are doing to be able to uh, evangelize it and take these uh, research projects and those researchers from the academic institutions who are all premier, uh, you know, academicians to the uh, to industry. Try and understand what that research is. Is there a way to productize it? Is there a what is the roadmap to commercialize it and take it to the market so that there can be application of the research that is done in academia? That has been an extremely important. Um, uh, design goal of this NCOE and I think we are making good progress in the very third we are currently in the third year of the NCOE. This particular security education research innovation conference in its second edition uh, the uh, what is very heartening to note for uh, DSCI and the NCOE team is the active support that has come from several academic institutions across the world. This year, it's truly have, having a much larger international flavor to it. We have professors and industry researchers coming in from various parts of the geography. We have uh, a professor from Australia. We have from Europe. We have from Netherlands, somebody joining us in Europe, Israel, UK, and of course, from across the length and breadth of the country, several academicians are participating. And this year, we are really looking at a theme of applied cryptography. And as digitization has really progressed or accelerated in the last two, three years, particularly post-COVID, and the focus on personal data and privacy protection, uh, what is clearly emerging is privacy as an opportunity area for deep tech research and technology development. And several use cases are emerging. So privacy is another theme that uh, to, uh, this year's SERI is focusing on. And while we have a lot of panel discussions, there are also uh, specific research themes in the area of crypto privacy, where I think the sessions are a little more deep dive. We've had an opportunity to have um, the agenda being curated in partnership with several of the academic institutions who have been engaged with us uh, over the last year, year and a half. What is surprising is, NCOE, particularly post lockdown, when the whole country was pretty much under lockdown dealing with the post COVID scenario, we've had really, uh, you know, several programs that have been launched thanks to industry members and also academic institutions, whether it is the RC Bose Institute, almost all the IITs that we can think of, who partnered with us in several of our webinars, and several of our technical sessions. Uh, what we are beginning to see as outcomes of the initiatives of NCOE and programs like SERI and the several call for papers is our industry ecosystems and the startup ecosystem is beginning to get a lot more visibility to the research that is, undergo is uh, being undertaken in academic institutions. And those professors' willingness and keenness to talk to industry ecosystem. And when I say industry ecosystem, two segments of the industry. One is the entrepreneurs in the security industry, whether it is startups, but they're also keen to engage with the user enterprises in government, in defense, in banking sector, so that whatever research they're doing, they can brainstorm on that with actually an enterprise which potentially is going to deploy when it gets productized or it gets reached a prototype stage. It's also giving us an opportunity to engage with a broad spectrum of academic institutions because of the national nature of the NCOE and understand what are the new futuristic areas in which research is being undertaken. And one thing that we are seeing in the research network that we've been able to uh, you know, bring together is the increasing interest of PhD students to actually move towards you know, product development or partner with a startup to be able to productize their research. I think that's a great 
uh, uh, that's a great uh, development or a trend that we are seeing, which is in the longer term interest of the country, both from government and from uh, uh, industry, that academicians are willing to collaborate, talk about their research projects in open forums. That not only inspires more students to take up the discipline of cyber for research for MTech, but it also probably encourages more of our startups to look at a deep tech domain, which may not be solving a here and now problem, which may be solving a problem which would become strategic for India's interest in maybe a mid to the long term. So we are beginning to see some startups willing to bet their uh, careers or their entrepreneurship journey to some deep tech use cases, whether it is in the area of crypto, whether it is in the area of IoT security, SCADA security, which is good because I think the mainstream commercial enterprise technology development has moved to a certain momentum. We have 250 plus startups, but now if we want to really challenge the rest of the geographies which have become cyber uh, hubs for the world and which have had a little bit of a time advantage compared to India, which was in a nascent stage in terms of product development in cyber for five years back. I think we now need to focus on some of the deep tech use cases and move from commercial, uh, not really move, but expand the commercial mainstream cybersecurity solution portfolio to the deep tech portfolio in India's national interest. And of course, take them to global geographies. I think NCOE is focused on that. Uh, my deep gratitude and my team's deep gratitude to academic institutions and the senior professors who are willing to collaborate with us, who are guiding us. And there's a lot that we, not only in the DSCI team, but the entire startups are beginning to learn because very rarely we get an opportunity to uh, get this kind of mentoring from academic institutions and senior professors opportunity to partner with organizations like RC Bose when we hosted this lightweight uh, cipher challenge. And even in the call for papers, the evaluation of the papers, several academicians have been supporting us. I think uh, we've always keep talking about uh, bringing academia, industry, and uh, government together. And I think NCOE is able to demonstrate the merits of this partnership and what outcomes we can deliver in a very short time frame. Thank you and thank you for joining us. We look forward to you, uh, you know, uh, joining us in all the sessions during the rest of the day in several and in all future programs that NCOE launches. Okay. So may I request Shri Arvind Kumar sir, who's been our mentor and our guide for while right from the, you know, conceptualization stage of the National Center of Excellence and its entire execution roadmap. May I kindly request you to deliver your inaugural keynote, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Rama Madam. Good morning to all. Uh, including the distinguished panelists, speakers, audiences, which are part of this second edition of the SERI conference. Uh, certainly, it's a pleasure for me to be part of this inaugural session of this uh, second uh, edition of SERI conference. Uh, the drama madam has uh, wide, uh, widely brought out the roles, achievements, and the objectives of the National Center of Excellence in a, in a big way. And it certainly, it, it provides a platform for industry, academia, and uh, and government to collaborate and work towards uh, the overall objectives of Atnit by Bharat and make, make in India productization. So that's how we look at uh, it. Said, I mean, just see in today's digitally connected world, we see there are, we are all at the cusp of innovation in various fields of life. We see there are in, in the area of cybersecurity, we find ourselves more vulnerable to the malicious attack, fraud, privacy threats, including other uh, other invasion etc but this requires a significant amount of work in the area of research and development and it's a it's giving a considerable value to the transition to the digital society to take this space forward in the future we need focused efforts towards enabling cyber security research and development in the country security education innovation and research theory is a very timely and apt idea as education institutes play a very crucial role in the cyber security research 
quality education is certainly a feeding research is feeding to the research needs and we need very cautious efforts of translating them to the innovative products so the productizations from the research is a very important step which the this platform provides and it's a collaboration of industries researchers startups especially in developing those product and bringing into the country into the market of uh, research, uh, cyber security products in furthering the research and scaling up of the innovation and ensuring tangible outcome it demands very concerted efforts of bringing different stakeholders together and mobilizing them to achieve the common goals ministry of electronics and it we supported the data security council of india to set up the national center of excellence for cyber security technology and product entrepreneurship ministry is working in on multi faceted approaches of promoting cyber security education and research the overarching program of information security education and awareness it targets various sectors or segments of the people in the in the in school going students undergraduate postgraduate phd students and scholars and the faculty it has support it has also supported and created thousands of undergraduate and postgraduate cyber security engineers more importantly phd in the cyber security academia plays a very very important role in articulating cyber security research and we both meti and dsi appreciate those efforts and we are we are want to be well connected with the academy ecosystem meti is mindful of the core challenges digitalization and technology transformation throwing it has engaged in support of fundamental research in cyber security and academic research institutions we have a program of promotion of cyber security research in the ministry which is uh, the rnd in cyber security we are supporting various various uh, industries academia and and research institutions to do the fundamental research to do the application oriented research to do the research at the higher trls levels <clears throat> which can take you to the productization stage and there be several number of ips have been created and which many projects are going on currently to support the development of ips at the same time besides having a different high level of paper publications to drive and create a cyber security capability we are looking forward to translate these ips into the product and commercializing them national center of excellence is taking concerted efforts in promoting cyber security research agenda in the country recently programs such as 5g 5g security scada security lightweight cipher they are the they are the examples of participation of cyber security researchers and enthusiasts in this program <coughs> sorry new advancements in the technologies as emergence of quantum computing metaverse and virtual reality require new skills and capability these advancement when many to come essentially they use leverage the data and share it in the vast scale thereby enabling growth and efficiency while posing cyber security and privacy protection problems the paradigm of technology used today will undergo a massive change in the years to come making cyber security in education and awareness and research an important societal goal we know not to we not not only does it help the individual organization government to leverage the technology but it also helps the researcher and the students to to take up those challenges and bring out with the new research and the technologies to build a secure cyber future we must commit ourselves our all resources to enable them to be available to the students researchers and technologists to develop to do the innovation build up new products bring out new technologies seri conference agenda underlines this very well i am very glad to see the speakers lineup for the conference i am sure the deliberation of the indian academic researchers and faculty with speaker joining from global geographies will provide an excellent direction to the strategic initiative we are outlining for the cyber security thank you with this i finish my address pardon
Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, now we are going to start the award ceremony for the lightweight cipher challenge. Uh, I would like to invite the guests for today, Ms. Rama Vedeshri and Sri Arvind Kumar sir on stage. Joining us, the jury for this uh, challenge would be Dr. Sachin Loda, Mr. Vinay Godse. And thank you so much for joining us today. I would like to invite Dr. Bimil Roy. And Dr. Sachin Loda. I'm there. Thank you, sir. So with this, Vinayka, I would like to hand over the stage to you. Yeah. So <clears throat> good morning, everybody. So uh, I have a couple of slides briefly talking about uh, what we had <clears throat> tried to do uh, in this lightweight uh, cipher design competition. So uh, this was announced last year, <clears throat> National Center of Excellence in, in association with uh, RC Bose Center for Capology and Sec uh, Security. Uh, so it's under Indian Statistical Institute. So this particular challenge, uh, um, uh, as we all know that we are into IoT age and uh, uh, IoT age has a, a lot of constant resources. For example, processing power is less, the, the power require, the power is also very less and the form factor is also less basically. So the, the existing conventional uh, cryptographic element uh, wouldn't not be uh, possible and feasible to implement in a very small uh, form factor plus power uh, capa uh, capability and more important the processing capability that the IoT devices and IoT ecosystem or uh, syst uh, complex system uh, you have basically. So uh, where where there are a lot of researchers in India and other parts of the globe which had been working on a cryptography, but there are there are very few researchers which had been now tackling this problem of uh, uh, designing the crypto or designing the cipher for the. Uh, such kind of a constant resources, basically, which would be becoming the norms of the coming uh, future, basically. So objective of this particular lightweight cipher challenge was to encourage the research in the niche areas of constant device security. That's very important uh, that we, we all are in IoT age. Motivate the researchers and research scholars working in the area of lightweight cryptography, basically, and appreciate and give the visibility of the work, which is in a way very complex and which has a lot of dimensions apart from uh, designing the algorithm is also looking at the hardware part or also looking at the power consumption part or also looking at the processing capability. And then uh, as the cipher had been designed, basically take these ciphers basically for the industry implementation. And that's what something that uh, National CO would, would try to do uh, with this particular cipher, which has got designed as a part of this uh, challenge, basically. So this challenge, uh, uh, we devised, we have a very good uh, able uh, evaluation committee as a part of this particular challenge. Uh, and we had been the, from the uh, National COE, uh, uh, me and one, some of my colleagues and from, uh, uh, <clears throat> from uh, uh, ISI Kolkata, Dr. Bimal Rai in his team basically, and Sachin Loda and Dr. Somnath Chandra from MIT had been uh, working to steer this particular challenge uh, effort in, in, since last one year basically. And we had and uh, we had first round of uh, this evaluation basically so initially six team participated in that round and we uh, from those 
six teams we would able to uh, shortlist three of these teams basically the team lights ocb team fpsp uh, team hayana basically and uh, uh, the these teams the jury panel had uh, gone through each and every cipher uh, design which was submitted to us uh, we tried to look at uh, uh, the jury team tried to look at how that has been uh, uh, designed what kind of security promises basically what kind of uh, implementation uh, consideration it had talked about if it has to be implemented hardware wise what are those consideration what kind of efficiency it tried to promise basically and and through one to one interaction through the presentation and you want to look at uh, uh, when we are promo uh, publish this kind of a cipher for uh, 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 cipher for the iot regime basically so just to talk about this i would uh, invite uh, bimal das sir basically to talk about what we try to do in last one year of time and uh, why this is a very important area from the from the cryptography perspective from the research perspective and then we can go for the next so bimal da uh, over to you okay okay thank you vinak and thank you the entire uh, coe of dsci uh, i think i'll just make a little correction here uh, we did have many more than six submissions yeah, but after yeah. the first rounds couldn't we found that the others did not satisfy all the criteria that are mentioned by you uh, in your first slide because we have put yeah. uh, many criteria and out of this 12 or 13 about six satisfied all the criteria so which they were ready for going through the thorough evaluation and we wanted to uh, get a evaluation by a very competent international uh, <clears throat> group of researchers uh, so we had uh, we had many people like uh, nishant from microsoft research we had uh, shubhadeep from uh, denmark we of course had um, people uh, uh, elsewhere also so we, we thought we should go for open uh, evaluation uh, open discussions and uh, we do a thorough job and my uh, my motivation for this competition was that uh, see i know that uh, indian many agencies uh, do use uh, iot devices and most of the things uh, this iot has come with um, already implemented uh, crypto uh, you know layers uh, and what my object uh, i am talking for last 20 years that we should be self reliant uh, so i would like our iot devices to have our own algorithms and just to check how our community is ready uh, to support us the academic community this was just a test that um, our community is strong enough and then we got went to this uh, entire competition and i found that all the three finalists they are extremely good they are of any any international standard algorithms uh, but as i say that uh, our indian government agencies have some kind of you know blocked in their mind that they don't want to use this publicly available uh, algorithms but there is a scope of you know uh, tweaking these algorithms and generating many algorithms out of this algorithm uh, which could be used as uh, indigenous algorithms so i think this uh, now the task of uh, dsci is uh, uh, is that uh, uh, you have to go to probably uh, to start with bell uh, in fact right now um, me and my team from kolkata we are giving a one semester long mm -hmm. training program for the bel bell designers so i think we should uh, talk to bell uh, then we should talk to kr uh, and see how do they feel because most of the government agencies will take solutions uh, the, from either bell or from, or from kr but there could be private industries too but uh, i know bell and kr does uh, support all the government agencies so let's talk to i think it's, i can also talk to but i, I think vinayak should uh, Uh, talk to at least to start with bell and uh, care and let me see what do they feel about it and if yeah. they need our help i think we can tweak it enough sachin is there um, we can tweak it enough to make it indigenous even rajesh is in our team uh, he is in the drdo core so we can tweak so my objective would be to take this algorithms after some tweaking to to generate many indigenous algorithms which the bell and care would possibly um, you know implement and then the government agencies can take it for use also we need shomnath chandra's active interest uh, in this so we need a lot of uh, work now so it's only the starting point and i, I hope uh, to see my dream come true that all the iot devices used in the indian uh, uh, in indian uh, context is ours okay thank you okay thank you sir thank you 
So Rama, briefly uh, uh, give us a few words and then I will request Arvind Kumar sir as well to yeah. talk about. Thank you, Vinayak. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Professor Bimal Roy and his team from RC Bose Center of Cryptography uh, and uh, Cybersecurity to actually partner with us in designing this challenge first and of course conducting and evaluating the challenge and uh, you know uh, deciding on the final winners. Uh, why? I mean, in the inaugural also, I talked about why the NCOE is focused on coming up with programs in nurturing deep tech researchers, both from academia and from industry, particularly the startups. I think a challenge like this, particularly the rigor in which the challenge was designed, where, you know, including the source code and the text test vectors had to be submitted. And that's why uh, Professor Roy was saying that some of them didn't meet the grade or didn't uh, cut the ice with the evaluation committee and the jury. Right. So the rigor in with which it was uh, uh, conducted, where uh, the, there was a challenge, the algorithm had to be designed, but also source code and the test use cases or test vectors had to be changed. What is interesting about these challenges, several uh, teams, I mean, it was open for startups from our industry researchers and of course, academic researchers. And there was a very tough evaluation round. And most importantly, the algorithms designed for this were also put into the public scrutiny as my colleague Vinayak talked about it, which I think really helps test the rigor of the design and the algorithm. And we are hoping by discussing with industry members and national institutions, maybe some of the different research labs, some of them can now be taken to you know a prototype stage and hopefully getting integrated because most important thing to remember is the proliferation of IoT devices. We need specific cipher challenges like this to come up with the algorithms given the kind of form factors where when I talked about the restraint constraint devices because everything in an IoT device whether it's a sensor whether at a smart city level or at a smart home level there's a very wide variety of devices that are proliferating the Indian market. How do we make sure that academia and industry can collaborate so that these algorithms can actually be embedded into the devices. Maybe also work with OEMs which are coming up with these IoT devices and how can they integrate our algorithms and embedded systems. I think it will give a fillip, but this is the first one. I think the proof of the pudding is when these algorithms you know, get an opportunity to be prototyped and get integrated with some devices and then hopefully that will uh, motivate us to host the second challenge with support from Meiji and ISI. Yeah. Thank you, Rama, and request uh, uh, Mr. Arvind Kumar for his guidance too. Uh, first of all, I congratulate uh, uh, Rama, Madam, uh, Vinayak and the team for, uh, I mean, designing such a, uh, I mean, sought after, it's a, it's a requirement of the day to have uh, such kind of uh, uh, lightweight uh, crypto kind of products or algorithms to be in place, which needs to be strong in view of the, the growing demand of IoT uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the technology domain, be it anything uh, from technical perspective to even in the smart city kind of scenarios, you find that IoT is becoming uh, very, very important in connecting the systems and the, and the society. So uh, I think it's a it's an excellent step. Uh, uh, they're in center of excellence, national center of excellence. They have designed such kind of program, and I'm really grateful the kind of uh, the challenge which has been developed and which is headed by I mean their collaboration with the uh, the, the, the the one of the best institute in this area of RC Bose Center for Cryptography and Security, which is headed by Professor Bimal Roy and the team representing DRDO. ISI and uh, others and my colleague also from uh, uh, METI, Dr. Swamna Chandra. I think the, the kind of challenge, the kind of issues which have been addressed is excellent. It's definitely motivate researchers and uh, other, <coughs> other research scholars to work in this area and appreciating their, their work and their visibility. Definitely it's going to go a long way. Uh, my my congratulations to all the team who have designed, who has implemented, who has scrutinized uh, the applications for this team. I think it will it pay a long way in uh, to the society. <clears throat> so.
So thank you, Rama and Abhin Kumar sir. So now we go for the uh, uh, award uh, uh, of this particular uh, lightweight uh, crypto challenge. Uh, so as this process conducted into two different rounds, the initial round was a, a filtration round and then second round was a, a very thorough evaluation that has been done by jury. So let me go uh, uh, to the uh, announcement of this hour. So I would request Amar to announce the second and uh, first runner up and uh, then Arun Kumar sir to announce the winner. So before uh, we go for that, let me basically uh, share my screen and uh, uh, so uh, I know so uh, so this kind of uh, I mean, we had been seeing a lot of challenges in a startup ecosystem, but this is largely for the uh, challenge for the designing uh, the crypto and designing the uh, basically the uh, cipher. And this is very research centric kind of work. So the first prize that we put here for uh, as a part of, uh, of this challenge is 3.5 lakhs rupees. Second prize is 2.5 lakh rupees, and third prize is 1.5 lakh rupees basically. So would request Rama uh, uh, to uh to announce the second runner up yeah i'm very happy to announce the second runners up it's team feasp led by dr argya Bhattacharji, professor avik chakraborty and professor mridul nandi and professor nilanjani congratulations to the team feasp would also request rama to uh announce the first runner-up? Yes. The first runner-up team is Team Light OCB. Professor Avik Chakraborty, Professor Mridul Nandi, Professor Nilanjan Datta, and Dr. Ashwin Jha. Congratulations to the team. And we request uh, would request uh, Arvind Kumar sir to uh, announce the winner of the challenge. Yeah, uh, thank you Vinayak. Uh, it's my pleasure to announce the winner um, of this lightweight cipher design challenge. It's not visible here. Yeah, the winner is team, uh, team Hayana. Team Hyana, Professor Avik Chakravarti, Professor Medul Nandi, Professor Nilanjan Datta, Dr. Ashwin Jha. Congratulations and uh, many, many congratulations. We provide your continuous support from our program as well as from MITI to keep the work going. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> So thank you, uh, 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 Rin Kumar sir, Rama, and uh, Professor Bimal Rai, uh, Nishant, and all the all the participants of this uh, uh, basically uh, challenge. And we would uh, reach out to all of the teams basically to distribute this award. But as oh, Professor oh. Bimal Rai, we will make these uh, designs uh, basically available for people to have a look at it. And probably we'll reach out to the industry uh, with care. Uh, with the RDO and uh, uh, BEL as well um, for see the adoption and probably uh, deployment, practical deployment of this particular algorithm basically. And we'll keep visiting such kind of challenge in the future as well. Uh, thank you for joining us, uh, uh, Arvind Kumar sir, Rama, uh, Professor Bimal Rai and Nishant, uh, um, then um, uh, Sachin, Dr. Sachin Dota, and all the winners uh, of the uh, Lightweight Crypto Challenge. So we look forward to see you all for the next uh, such kind of challenge. Thank you. Vinak, I, I have just one comment. Sure, sure sir. Yeah, just uh, uh, I, I am no longer the head of the RCBO Center. Uh, it yeah. is uh, currently uh, taken up by Mr. Midul Nandi, who is a member of yeah. all the three winning teams. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Very able one, so he has replaced me. And my suggestion to you and the, uh, the Meiti or uh, Rama is that Next, you go for the challenge for short signatures. Okay, okay so so if you think so, and uh, if MIT and you have the budget, let's go to the next competition for short signatures, which will also be very relevant uh, in this context. Okay, yes, okay. Sir. Oh, thank you.
Thank That's you. That's a great sure. suggestion. Sure, sure, thank sure. you, Professor, thank you. and thank you, okay. jury members. Bye bye. Thank you. Congratulations to winners. Thank you. Hello everyone. So we are back again for the next exciting session on organizing cyber research. It's a plenary session. So the format of the session would be as such that uh, we'll have a panel discussion and towards the end of the session, 10 minutes would be given for the Q&A. 
So I would encourage all the attendees to keep posting questions on the chat window on your right. With that, I would like to invite uh, the panelists, Professor Manjesh Hanavil. He is the Associate Professor, ICOR Associated Faculty, CMIN DS IIT Mumbai. Mr. Rajat Muna, Director, IIT Bilai, GEC Campus. Mr. Sachin Loda, Head of TCS Cybersecurity and Privacy Research. And the session would be moderated by Professor Manindra Agarwal, Professor of Department of Computer Science, Deputy Director, IIT Kanpur. Thank you so much, uh, all the panelists, for joining us today. Let's wait for the rest of them to, to join us as well. Hi, Professor Manjesh. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, hi, Sonal. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Professor Manindra, for joining us today. Let's wait for um, Dr. Rajat Muna. Good morning, Dr. Rajat. I, I hope you're able to hear us. Yes, I can hear you. Perfect. Thank you, sir, for joining us today. I think we are just waiting for um, Dr. Sachin Loda. Hi, so um, Dr. Sachin is facing some internet issues, so we would request uh, um, Professor Manindra to please start the session. Please stay with, with us for a few more minutes. Let me just check uh, if all the speakers are able to join on stage. I don't see, uh, okay, I see him now. Perfect, perfect. So Professor yeah. Manindra, uh, may I request you to please start the session? Uh, Dr. Lodha is not able to join us. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Vijay. Uh, so welcome to this uh, session on, uh, uh, which is a discussion on how to do uh, cyber research or how to promote cyber research in the country. Uh, my name is Banindra Grawal. I'm a professor in computer science department at IIT Kanpur. And I have some interest in cyber security research. So do the other panelists uh, of uh, this session. Professor Rajat Muna is well known for his work in cyber security domain. He's currently director at uh, IIT Bilai. And doctor at IIT Bombay in the industrial uh, operation research department. Uh, and then Dr. Lodha is heading the TCS uh, group in cybersecurity. Hopefully, he'll be able to join us soon. So I my job is to moderate this session. So one of the first thing that uh, comes to my mind when starts looking at cybersecurity research in the country is why there is so little of it, despite uh, the fact that uh, uh, every single day we are reminded of its importance. So that's the first, my first question to our panelists. I'll request Professor Muna to share his thoughts on it. Why do we have so little cybersecurity research happening? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Munin. Uh, I think it's a very, very important point that you have actually raised. Uh, why uh, cyber security is uh, so little represented in our community, in spite of the fact this is the most important thing. And every day we keep hearing of breaches, every day we keep hearing of uh, certain kind of losses and all that. Uh, I think. Uh, it's not the phenomena only in this country because the cyber security, when we actually look at, there are 
multiple things that one has to look at. One is the algorithm. And uh, in algorithms, I'm sure there are a lot of people who are working in algorithm in ensuring that mathematically and algorithmically we have, uh, you know, algorithms which are not breakable and uh, which are, you know, algorithm wise, I think we are actually very much at the forefront, even when we are looking at quantum computing, which is around the corner, people are looking at post quantum computing security, post quantum computing safety and all that. So there are algorithms there where we are actually going forward. The second part of this is infrastructural security, which is largely uh, focusing on ensuring that availability of the components, availability of the infrastructure is there. Um, it is not so much for privacy and integrity of data, but more focus on ensuring the services are available, systems are available on demand and all that. And that is one thing which is, there is no uh, methodical uh, or no systematic methods uh, to build a system around it. It is always a one-up kind of a situation. You find certain kind of attack, you plug in the goal holes there, and then, you know, hope for some time that there will not be any further security issues. And then the third kind of uh, thing, which is actually also very important, is using these security systems, creating a protocol for actually ensuring the data remains secure, infrastructure remains secure and all that. And I think this is the third part which is least uh, represented in the community. And primarily because Despite all the algorithms, despite all the uh, security infrastructure and all that, there are a handful of people who actually understand the scenario processes and all that. And it's a very, very complicated, uh, you know, uh, system, ecosystem. And without understanding, one when puts a, a security solution, it is often a security solution added or patched on to an existing system rather than security by design being built into the system. And that, in my opinion, is the biggest bottleneck and that one sees. And uh, often that gets compounded further, complicated further, because if you ask any technical person or a layman, so-called security layman, he would actually say, oh, I have encrypted my system, I have encrypted my data, and therefore it is secure. And the reality is that it is uh, far from being secure. The, another thing that for common public, banks and others have actually created enough publicity campaigns to say, do not give your passwords, do not give your uh, OTP and all that, which was a good thing. And probably the only way to educate our masses on how to remain safe. But in that process, the kind of things that were actually propagated were actually saying that, uh, uh, you know, like, for example, you must secure yourself only, you must actually send out your passwords and all that only on HTTP, secure socket HTTP and all that, which is one aspect only. And overemphasizing only one aspect leaves the other aspects unguarded and weakest link of security then becomes the largest security. So the real problem is that we need to educate our people in a proper systematic manner on how does one build security protocols around various infrastructure and applications. And that's the only way out, in my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Muna. And you've raised a very important point, and I'll pick on this uh, once I get opinion of uh, Professor Anwal also. Professor Anwal, what, why do you think uh, we are so let's say not at the forefront in the cyber security research. Okay, uh, first of all, uh, I feel very honored to be among uh, with Professor Malin Agarwal and Professor Rajat Munar, distinguished panelists who have a lot of experience in this. So I want to like uh, first uh, say that like, I'm a little bit newbie in the space, but I feel that uh, it is also important that we start entering this field. Like I have uh, worked in uh, DRDO before. We have worked on various security projects. And now I'm in academia. I work a lot on machine learning. But as you see that, as you are rightly pointing out, there is a, some kind of void here. Like somebody has to pick this. Somebody has to fill this void. And maybe that is where like I'm trying to pitch in. And uh, last couple of years, I'm actually involved in this. 
now uh, coming to your point of uh, what could be the potential issue like uh, i see is like maybe uh, there is not like connect there is work going on this uh, at uh, at very uh, different location and uh, that is kind of things that we can see uh, because like uh, most of the uh, bug bounty huntings these things are actually won by indians and most of them people doing it from india like people are indeed active but uh, there has to be some kind of consorted effort like to put all these things together possibly connect academia these people and also industry and in that sense i feel that uh, seri is a very nice conference and it is putting efforts in that direction the very three keywords like education research and innovation in the space of cyber security is what really required and i feel that uh, yeah i i right away see that yes it's not that we are into this field we are there but it is in uh, different patches that need to be collected and uh, more efforts like this where we all get connected like people working in industry and and also like in cyber security you see that there are lone wolves right like they will be working on their own maybe give them a platform connect that with the academia industry in that way like if we, if we all work in synergy maybe like yeah maybe all of us are together maybe like uh, make ourselves visible more and uh, these are my initial thoughts uh, for the okay thank you uh, uh... Professor Muna made a very important point that uh, uh, we are doing quite well in the algorithms aspect in cyber. Uh, did we lose uh, Professor Manindra Garwal? I can't hear him. Yeah, I think probably some internet issue. Yeah, I guess so. But we have been joined by Dr. Sachin Loda. Right. Yeah, good morning. Good morning, Professor Muna. Good morning. Good morning, Sachin. Yes. Uh, sorry, sir. Connectivity issue. I have to delay. Uh, I apologize for that. Yeah. I think Professor Manind Agarwal was also here as moderator. And uh, yes. he just dropped out probably once again. Uh, internet issue, you should be joining. Right. Okay, okay. So, good morning. Uh, <clears throat> so, maybe in the meanwhile, uh, uh, we can probably continue while Money yes. actually joins. So, mm -hmm. I think Sachin. Uh, one of the question that uh, Manind actually posed is mm -hmm. that while cyber security is a very, very important area and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, every once in a while we keep hearing issues related to cyber security. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, Manind has joined. So one of the yeah. uh, comment that Manind was asking was why there are so few people working in this area? Why is there a shortage of people? Uh, maybe you could actually say a few words on that before Manin can actually take over the second uh, part of it. Yeah, yeah so... Yeah, good to uh, have you. Yeah, good morning, Professor Agarwal. Uh, sorry, uh, some network issue I, I struggled to join earlier. Uh, so let me react to this question that Professor Muna just posed. See, I think... Uh, uh, there is a misconception in people uh, about who can be in this field, you know. Uh, many of them think that they have to have prior higher education in this field. Maybe sometimes people feel that there are so many certifications and they need to have those certifications. But I think that's probably not a... Uh, right way to approach this. See, one perspective at least we have is that you should consider this as a domain of problems. And then you can bring whatever uh, computational expertise you have uh, to tackle those problems, right? So when I look at uh, our team in T 
ACS, we have uh, several different expertise in the team, uh, right from algorithms design, optimization, program analysis, design thinking, uh, AI ML, and so on. And I'm sure uh, all of us who have been trained in some of these skills, right, can always bring them to table and solve these problems. So maybe uh, some awareness is required on this, that, uh, that this is a very rich area with plentiful problems, and essentially all are welcome to contribute. And that's, that's my quick reaction. Thank you, Dr. Loza. That's a very interesting point you make, and I think uh, uh, it is indeed true that uh, get into the field. But uh, I was uh, picking up on Professor Muna's comment that uh, we are very strong in algorithm, cryptography, and so on. Uh, but if you look at the cybersecurity breaches, more than 99% of them do not occur because of weakness in algorithms. They occur because of weakness in implementations. And oops. Hello. Yeah, I think once again, so it looks like the internet is actually becoming a little bit edgy at IIT mm -hmm. Kanpur uh, because we, I mean, this is number of times that Manindas try to join and is mm -hmm. uh, you know, getting disconnected. Uh, I think uh, Sachin, you also had the same issue. Mm -hmm. okay. uh, I think what Manin was trying to say is, you know, I made a comment saying in three parts, you know, algorithms, uh, the infrastructure security and uh, or infrastructure designs and the use of techniques to create protocol of data security. And I said, in algorithms area, we are largely uh, strong. And that's where Manin was. Yeah, I was uh, saying that, and you know, have we been lulled into a false sense of comfort that, oh, we are very strong in algorithm. And therefore, cybersecurity requirements are taken care of. And we didn't pay attention to the real heart of the cybersecurity, which is ensuring that systems implementations are secure. Is that Has that played a role in the, the fact that we see on the ground that not a lot of focused or collective research is happening? Rajat, would you... Yeah, so maybe I can actually say a little bit on this. See, there are, even in the algorithms, there are, uh, you know, I mean, I don't think there are going to be a stream of new encryption, decryption algorithms or hashing algorithms and all that will, that will keep flowing in. I mean, uh, maybe five or seven or 10 or 20, you know, numbers will be of that order, contemporary algorithms, which will be in use at any point in time. Uh, and there was a time when RSA was considered to be the algorithm for public key cryptography. Today, ECC is considered to be public key cryptography, and maybe tomorrow something else will come uh, as a practitioner side. Same thing about the um, you know symmetric key algorithm. Sometimes DES, triple DES, and all that, and now AES, and maybe few more algorithms that will come up. The the real algorithmic research, in my opinion, is not in designing new algorithms for encryption and decryption, but to really find weaknesses in the existing algorithms and the ways the algorithms should be used. Um, and these are very interesting topics. What is one very interesting uh, observation here is that it is because of these findings, the protocols will keep changing, the standards keep evolving, okay? And the findings typically are much ahead of actual exploitation. So in other words, in algorithm science uh, side, we are pretty much in good shape. Of course, we should be much better. There is a false sense of, uh, you know, uh, hope that guests in here think we are very strong. Um, and therefore, maybe people become a little bit complacent and, uh, you know, not get into this area saying this area is saturated or something or it's of not much use. But 
I must say this that it is because of the early and proactive research in this area, the there are technology and techniques which are available in uses of this in which is being done today, there has been a major shift in the way the research is being carried out, the topics that are being carried out. And more and more research is now moving towards uses of algorithms, creating protocols and these kind of things, more like engineering research than the pure mathematical research. But then there are groups who talk about pure mathematical research and very well organized in that to say, how we can actually find weaknesses and what kind of things can be actually uh, used to attack an algorithmic weakness. And that's a very, very strong, uh, you know, research needed in that area too, in order to implement it in the data security. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Uh, Dr. Hanwal, you uh, yeah. think it's a, yeah. somewhat, uh, we have been a little misled? Or I, I, I feel so, I feel so. Like as you rightly pointed out, uh, yeah, algorithms, see, like most of the academic algorithms, we put it in public, right? They are exposed to a lot of scrutiny, like RSS algorithm or other algorithms we have put, like they are in open domain. When they are open domain, like we, we know what are the challenges, like what, what weaknesses are there in the algorithm. But what I feel, like as you also rightly pointed out, the weakness is in the implementation and also uh, like also like what all the applications that are being developed, right? Those, those applications are mostly proprietary. Like nobody puts their, whatever the application they have developed in proprietary. And most of these applications are developed in such a way that they are more user friendly. Like if somebody, when using this application, they somehow misconfigure them or like they have been very casual, like for more comfort, they use, uh, often it happens that like for more, uh, friendly less that sometimes uh, reduce the security levels of these applications and this these kinds of things are opening up vulnerabilities which most of the hackers are getting into your system so what possibly we lack is a thorough implementation knowledge like like more people who know in and out of operating system like like we need more people like who know like possibly like in and out of kernel like so that they know that when something is implemented Fine. Vulnerabilities will be there. Like when you develop an application, you want after all it to be used by somebody and you want you to make it user friendly. But whenever there is a vulnerability, somebody has to right away, like figure it out. What is the vulnerability? And maybe like if there are tools like which, which, which actually have a very good knowledge of like how the kernels and all work, maybe they can right away look into uh, such vulnerabilities and possibly detect them or block them. I, I, I completely agree with you. Yes, we are, we are, we have reached certain level of sophistication on the algorithm side, but implementation side is what possibly making, missing. And that is where we need to focus more, like make people aware that how, how things should work, like right away kind of get a sense that if something is going bad and possibly this will help us like uh, prevent some of the attacks we see. Thank you. Sachin, your, your thoughts? Yeah, uh, see, security generally has a trade-off with number of things, right? I mean, classically, we have seen trade-off between security and usability. Right. Uh, off late, we hear trade-off between security and privacy. Uh, there is always trade-off between security and performance. You know? uh, my view is that uh, many a times uh, when we have formulated this problem as security community, we probably have not given enough importance to these trade-offs. And therefore, whatever we come up with, uh, many a times, even if well implemented, may not uh, meet the uh, requirements on the ground, you know. So I have two views here. I think one view I will have is that Maybe if we consider these trade-offs and reformulate some of these problems, like for example, what's done for this lightweight cryptography challenge, you know, where you said that 
uh, it's a IoT system, and you need a crypto algorithm which is lightweight. Uh, you see that there are different types of inventions, innovations required. You know, when you design that kind of algorithm. So I think that's a one line. I think we should follow as an algorithmic. I mean, since uh, our nation has a very strong base in algorithms and crypto. I think the possibility is to frame problem with those trade-offs in mind. Second view I have is that uh, number of existing security controls are really good. I mean, I'm sure Professor Muna can tell us a lot about that from a uh, variety of uh, national level, uh, whatever implementations have been done, where uh, process from these controls, you know, uh, give us uh, ample security. I think that again has not been carefully looked at. See, for example, people speak a lot about IoT security issue again, but many challenges are because people don't change the default password or people connect the device directly to the internet. You know, right. uh, basic thing like putting it behind some firewall or router will also work. So, so I guess. Uh, I feel that there is opportunity both for new algorithmic research, which incorporates trade-off, as well as looking at algorithms not in isolation, but as a part of bigger process that is being rolled out, uh, will also help in my opinion. Thanks. So that brings me to the uh, final point, which is uh, as uh, uh, Anjay pointed out that it is not that we are lacking in people. There are uh, very good uh, talent available on in the country who are routinely winning this bug uh, bounties and other stuff. Uh, Sachin also mentioned that it's not necessary for somebody to be a trained expert in cybersecurity. They can simply apply their domain knowledge into the cybersecurity applications. So given these thoughts, what is the best way forward? How should we build on this community of cybersecurity researchers in the country so that we start developing major tools? Today, we do not have uh, you know, cybersecurity products coming out of the country, and that's where we need to reach. So what should we do? So let's start this time with uh, Professor Guna again. So that's another very interesting point, Manin, that we actually talked about. If you look at, see, primarily I would actually say use of security, use of algorithms, use of various things are primarily for software engineering issues in some sense. Why? Because, um, you know, the way the software development has changed over decades, is a similar kind of a change that is needed in ensuring security is built into the system. In other words, uh, today, low side programming is a very common thing where people don't need to know programming and yet they can kind of integrate various components together to achieve uh, certain kind of uh, programming goals. Can we actually think of in a similar way where people don't need to know the nitty gritty or nuances of the security, but there are building blocks available using which the security can be built into the system. And one of the things that I think of is bringing an end-to-end -end security. In other words, we need to figure out who is the data producer and who is the data consumer, and we bring an end-to-end security so that rest of the infrastructure, at least from the perspective of privacy and data integrity, um, you know, they don't really need to worry too much about other kind of aspect. Then the only other thing that one has to look at is the infrastructure security in terms of availability and denial of service and such kind of attack. So in other words, one should be looking at software engineering based approaches, libraries, uh, you know, uh, creation of composition of software using certain kind of uh, integration systems and all that kind of things. Uh, major activity that one needs to look at is in this space. If we can make security uh, infrastructure, security solutions, a very small thing to be integrated into the system, I'm sure not many more security experts will come in in building the system. And moment we have this, 
uh, and natural filtering process would be some of them will get very, very interested in how it is getting implemented and probably move towards making our system more secure, making, you know, doing research into it, making better tools, making better system and these kind of things. So I think it's an ecosystem that will actually need to develop. And we need to actually create an ecosystem. Not every uh, person who goes into education goes into research. Even if it is 5% people who go into research, it is actually a very good thing. Similarly, not every security developer, security solution developer need to go into the research. But if we can create a system, create a mechanism where people can actually come out in a natural frothing process into the research, that will be the most wonderful thing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's very interesting. Lot. Dr. Anwal, you uh, Yes. Uh, yeah, I would like to reinforce uh, what uh, uh, Professor Mona told about creating this ecosystem. I think that is uh, very important. And already, I think uh, there is some concerted efforts uh, going on in, in this. For example, like yeah, Professor uh, Agarwal, you know that you have been uh, speaking uh, cyber security center at IIT Kanpur. And uh, there is also uh, such things across other IITs. One of the things I'm in myself involved is the uh, National Center for Excellence in Internet Security at IIT Bombay. So here, most of the projects are related to either internet security or cyber security. We possibly need more. And also, like maybe uh, this center should uh, connect with each other so that uh, we kind of uh, create a, like a, a common set of tools, like whatever we develop mostly. When we develop in academia, maybe we will make, we can make it open source and uh, and make it available to the others, like uh, so that they can use. And already, already there is uh, so much of open source that is available in cybersecurity, over which one can uh, build. Uh, I mean, uh, tools which are which could be used by end user. Like I see that uh, nowadays, uh, this uh, security operation center socks are like pretty much required by all the enterprises, and uh, socks require a bunch of tools. And uh, I see that most of the tools used in SOC, they are not developed by any of our indigenous companies. Like maybe they are Indian companies, but they are registered somewhere and uh, they do business elsewhere, not in India. So maybe there is a good opportunity, like uh, there is a bunch of tools that need to be developed. And uh, and uh, one can like uh, through, through all these centers collaborating, making our uh, whatever we have developed open source and also making people aware, like what is the requirement there? like. Maybe like, yeah, people just think that, okay, uh, maybe participating in CTF or maybe just bug bounty, participating bug bounty, just like that is all cybersecurity is about. Maybe no, like maybe more tool needs to be developed and there is a commercial value for this. And as we, as we talk about more digital India and we talk about more data privacy and all, there is, there is a scope for such tools and possibly that need to be made aware and make, make people aware that there is a career here and you can make money. So possibly uh, like if we, if we can start making our young generation start knowing about this by collaboration across all these centers, I think uh, I don't see like uh, this is uh, too difficult. Like uh, we, we create a whatever Professor Muna alluded like uh, to, to create a very good ecosystem and make ourselves uh, make visible in this cyber security space very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, Sachin, your thoughts? Uh, yes, Professor. So, no, I agree to what uh, what has been said. I'd just like to add to that. Uh, see, I think we do need an extensive collaboration between government, academia, and industry. And on all fronts, our country is very strong. So it's just, I think, matter of putting it together. See, for example, um, uh, as Professor just mentioned, several good uh, cybersecurity research centers have come up uh, in different institutes in the country. That's a very good sign. But see, they will need access to very good problems. And I think that's where government and industry, especially service companies like TCS, Infosys, you know, big companies can play a big role because they have a universal reach and understanding of problems. And all that can be fed into uh, the pipeline, right? Problem pipeline for the centers. Uh, I think one other thing, as you mentioned, you know, we want to build uh, strong products. So I think we'll need to put in place a good IP framework. And uh, number of uh, IP frameworks are there. Uh, we have seen in other countries or other geographies. We can take good lessons from them and come to come up with our own 
a nice IP framework that will act as an enabler and not a showstopper. And then the infrastructure availability. That's where I feel that Professor Hanwell's point, you know, I think we should get all these research centers connected. And if they start sharing infra, uh, we probably have larger infrastructure in place. Uh, companies like TCA should also contribute there, right? So that we have rich infra in place for people to experiment and explore. And obviously all of this is just uh, uh, sort of setting the stage. Important thing is to have talent in good number. And that's where again, our institutes have a big role to play. So I just want to add here that Professor Muna, I and some of us are part of this ACM India Committee on Cybersecurity where one important item we are discussing is some kind of modest curriculum uh, for cybersecurity. Uh, that may also play a role, you know, to uh, help us uh, train people and make them ready. And last, again, I think the important point on good products, I think we need some proof you know, that products work. That's where, again, I feel that industry and government should uh, step in and they should be early adopters is output of our research centers uh, and help uh, for sort of fine tune it, you know, because nothing will be perfect when you put it out first time. So I think that's where investment should again come from government and industry uh, to make sure that our research outcomes succeed. So those are my quick thoughts. Thank you. Uh, I, this is a very engaging discussion and uh, some interesting ideas have come about. Firstly, if I have to summarize that, that there's no lack of good cybersecurity people in the country, although it may appear so. They need to be better organized and uh, motivated to actually take up some of the challenging problems. And then uh, I think we have enough uh, talent to make a real mark there. With that the hope, uh, I will uh, those, if there are any questions, uh, I'll be happy to pose them to our panelists here. Uh, I can see one from Dinesh Kumar from Theta that first testing should be included CI slash CD pipeline itself as a dev set. So this is too technical for me to understand. Rajat, can you make sense of it? Uh... No, I think uh, uh, what uh, the question is about, uh, you know, DevSecOps, which are, uh, uh, you know, uh, software engineering approaches for uh, ensuring that you're, uh, you actually are doing security by design, by testing and all that. So the question is, uh, even the first testing should be included as part of uh, CI, CD pipeline so that zero day vulnerabilities are caught. So first thing that I want to actually say is that um, we can only be hopeful that zero day vulnerabilities are, uh, are actually caught because uh, any anomalies that one actually looks at in uh, during the development you know, integrate into the design and any anomaly that one would look at will eventually become non-anomalous with time. And therefore, it is not that zero-day vulnerability can always be caught. One has to be always on a continuous development and upgrade path to ensure that zero-day vulnerabilities are always, uh, you know, as much as possible, we are one up and therefore we are able to get that. Uh, so it is not like one kind of one time thing, it has to be part of uh, actual infrastructure design. But then having said that, I think uh, there are many other things which actually people build into the infrastructure side to ensure zero day vulnerabilities don't make their way all the way up to the application. Whether it is a IPDS, intrusion prevention systems and all that, or UTM and these kind of things in the infrastructure, which actually catch quite a lot of anomalous uh, behavior on the network uh, coming in and uh, even trying to analyze and all that. Uh, doing this at the site of application, I think it's less productive because that means that 
such vulnerabilities, such attacks have actually come all the way across the infrastructure and reach up to the application for application to decode. This means that all your layer of protections have actually kind of failed and therefore application must have that layer of protection. So this is uh, my answer. Yes, it's a good idea, but then having said that, DevSecOps themselves are not used in all the software development to start with. I think it's only about maybe 2%, 3% applications which implement Dexcept of a uh, large number of applications don't even get closer to that. So, uh, you know, this is this is uh, my uh, take on it. Okay, thanks. And uh, we are out of time. So I think it's uh, uh, time to close uh, this session. I will end with thanking all the three panelists for sharing their very valuable Parts and I hope that uh, on the suggested lines, uh, there is already a lot of activity happening and we can together take it forward. Thank you for joining. Thank you. Thank you, Manin. It was a very interesting discussion. Thank you. And uh, we'll now move on to our next session, which is the first keynote. And uh, this is on the rise of AI and automation in cybersecurity. And uh, we have with us Mr. Srihari uh, Nagaralu, who is the principal group manager, M365 Security and Compliance Division at Microsoft India. So over to you, uh, Mr. Nagaralu, for the keynote. Thank you, Samrithi. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm, in, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to be in front of you as part of the SERI conference and just share my thoughts on uh, uh, on the rise of AI in cybersecurity. I'm a data scientist and uh, applied uh, researcher by nature. Okay, and I have, I have had experiences in uh, building the search engines. Now I'm, uh, I have recently started uh, looking at AI in security, cybersecurity and now uh, this is where I'm at. Okay, so, to give you a, to give you a quick pulse on like uh, the kind of signals I mean the number of signals I mean that uh, we are processing I mean the 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 challenges in the, the amount of traffic I mean that we are seeing in uh, or the World Wide Web or or email or other uh, telemetry I mean that are there I mean in Microsoft I mean we are processing across like 24 trillion security signals every day across various properties and uh, AI, AI used very heavily to power the predictions. I mean, uh, if you just look at like uh, what we have done, like 31 billion uh, identity threats have been blocked. Around 30 billion emails have been blocked. Email threats have been blocked. So the scale is massive. The amount of uh, data I mean, that we are processing is massive. And A is, is helping us like uh, with uh, finding right set of uh, predictions and right set of models. I mean, like for us to help secure. Now, what do we envision from here? From here, I mean, we are envisioning something called artificial general security intelligence. So the way that any new signal that comes into play, I mean, automatically the model should be able to learn without uh, even writing anything. I mean, uh, using the security transformation models automatically. 
So that is the kind of uh, general security intelligence I mean, that we are aiming at. The next set of things, I mean, like uh, this is uh, across the attack vectors, I mean, that we are talking about. The next uh, thing, I mean, that we are targeting around is A to detect data leaks and insider attacks. So it is not only the external actors, I mean, who are uh, leaking the data or who are uh, exfiltrating the data. I mean, there, there are there are a lot of insider threats, I mean, that we have been noticing and then how do we really understand? How do we really use AI systems? I mean, th that is another area of research and data, uh, research that is happening, trying to identify the data leakages and insider attacks from a different dimension. So now we are using uh, artificial intelligence very heavily, trying to uh, correlate the signals across uh, different systems and get to the uh, get to the state of like uh, trying to figure out the correlations. From there, like uh, now that there is a next question. I mean, like if A is really helping, if we are relying so much on AI, I mean, like what happens when these AI systems themselves are attacked? That is the topic that I want to talk about today. So it is on adversarial machine, machine learning. Machine learning is an artificial intelligence technique that can be used uh, by numerous applications. So in responsible ML innovation, data scientists, developers build, train, deploy ML models to understand, protect, and control data and processes to build trusted solutions. The methods underpinning the production systems are systematically vulnerable to a new class of vulnerabilities, which we call as like uh, collectively adversarial ML. Adversaries can exploit these vulnerabilities to manipulate AI systems and alter their behavior. Eventually, I mean, why do they do it? To serve some malicious end goals, right? So now, machine learning systems can themselves be attacked, okay? How does that look like? So there are different phases in, uh, machine uh, in the generation of machine learning models. So the training data exists, the algorithms exist, the process there is how to, how to, incorporate the ML systems into there and the output. So there are different, uh, uh, the attack vector is uh, defined in uh, different places. Like uh, it could be a poisoning attack, it could be a membership inference, it could be evasion attack, or it could be model stealing. We defined, I mean, adversarial ML threat matrix. I mean, like Microsoft worked with uh, Meta to create that adversarial uh, ML threat matrix because we believe the first step in empowering security systems to defend against attacks on ML systems is to have a framework that systematically organizes the techniques employed by malicious adversaries in subverting ML systems. We hope that the security community can use the tabulated techniques and tactics to bolster their monitoring strategies around this organization's mission critical ML systems. The primary audience, I mean, that we think for this is the InfoSec team. The matrix is structured like the attack framework, owing to its wide adoption among the security analyst community. This way, security analysts have a familiar framework to learn about threats, which are inherently different from traditional attacks on corporate networks. The second one, which is more important, is I mean the attack vector I mean, that we have done, we seeded this framework with a curated set of vulnerabilities and adversary behaviors that Microsoft and Mito vetted to be effective against production ML systems, enabling security analysts to focus on realistic threats. We also incorporated a lot of learnings from Microsoft's vast experience in this space into the framework. For instance, we found that model stealing is not the end goal of the attacker but in fact leads to more insidious model evasion. We also found that when attacking an ML system, attackers use a combination of traditional techniques like phishing and lateral movement alongside adversarial ML techniques and our intentional failure modes. I mean, we have incorporated like a lot of failure modes. I mean, intentionally in the ML trying to see how the models can cope up. When, when there are failures across different stages. I will just give a quick example of the quick examples on the, the different types of attacks here. 
So evasion attacks. Attacker modifies this query in a way that causes a model misclassification. For example, I mean, if, if you are driving a self-driving car, if you are attacking a self-driving car, we can manipulate the images I mean, that are being processed to the, uh, uh, by the ML system. For example, I mean, ignoring a stop sign. The uh, ML system will start ignoring the stop sign, going down the lane, and it can break the rules, right? The next one is like poisoning attack. Attacker contaminates the training phase of ML systems to get the intended result. Here, the attacker wants to misclassify specific examples to cause specific actions to be taken or omitted. Now, take an example of a critical infrastructure system. If, if I submit something like an antivirus to a misclassification system, now, I mean, the antivirus software itself will be treated as a malicious thing and uh, its use will be eliminated. So the system can be easily fooled out there. Then you have membership inference. I mean, attacker can infer if a given data record was part of the model's training data set or not. For example, in healthcare information, I mean, we can, uh, the model can quickly reverse engineer by pushing and trying to figure out, I mean, what is part of the training data. So if the model is, uh, model does not go through that uh, set of, uh, uh, the model can go, uh, the model is not, uh, well, if the model is vulnerable, then it is very hard. Uh, it is very easy for uh, getting the information out what has been used in the training data. Then you have model stealing, right? Attacker is able to recover the model through carefully crafted queries. For example, in a financial algorithm, through model queries, an adversary could reconstruct the potential outputs of the ML model. That can be really used to put to any bad use in the first place. Okay. What are we doing to stay ahead of the curve here? So performing security assessments of production AI systems is not easy. We have uh, surveyed around 28 organizations and 28 spanning Fortune 500 companies, governments, nonprofits, and different SMBs to understand the current processes to place the how the security AI systems, I mean, how to secure AI systems. Out of which, I'm like, we found 25 out of uh, 28 businesses indicated the right tools are needed in place to secure the A systems out. To address the growing needs of adversarial ML, Microsoft released Counterfeit. It's an open source tool to help assess risk by allowing users to attack their own AI and ML. The tool was developed out of our own need to secure our systems and vulnerabilities in the systems. The next one is like I mean, uh, participating in the standards of addressing security of AI systems. The prevalent use of AI and ML across industry sectors and widespread mistrust and misunderstanding in the use of these technologies has led to an increased need for standards to define good practice and provide guidance to improve trust and market adoption. So the ISO and IEC organizations are developing AI standards, including uh, defining key terminology and concepts of MI, uh, ML and AI, and then like risk management, government implications, data quality, and various topics related to trustworthiness. So we are participating heavily and uh, trying to ensure that the AI risk management has a framework, and then uh, there are certain standards I mean, for addressing the uh, security of AI systems. With this, I say that, uh, I mean, though we are uh, using AI systems heavily for like uh, going towards artificial inter general inter security intelligence, I would say, I mean, securing the AI systems itself is a big task. So that's it. I encourage, I mean, every InfoSec, uh, every security analyst, every security operator, I mean, uh, every security researcher start looking into uh, helping uh, secure the AI systems. Thank you.
Well, thank you very much. Uh, that was a talk on the rise of AI and automation in cybersecurity by Mr. Srihari Nagarulu, Principal Group Manager, M365 Security and Compliance Division with Microsoft India. Thank you once again for joining us and talking to our audience here. And we now move on to our next keynote, which is a presentation on accelerating cybersecurity research and innovation by Mr. Vinayak Gotse, Senior Vice President at the Data Security Council of India. I'll request Mr. Gotse to, uh, he's here with us, and over to you, Mr. Gotse. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Samurdhi. So, uh, in this session, uh, what I will try to really take you through the effort that we as a uh, National Center of Excellence for Cybersecurity Technology and Entrepreneurship had been undertaking to, to really bridge the gap between the researcher community and industry, especially and more importantly, uh, see the uh, possibility of uh, seeing the research. So there are a lot of research which happens in academic uh, uh, paternity and there are some uh, R&D institutions as well, like a SEDAC, which we have been very deeply engaged in uh, cybersecurity research work basically but suppose some somebody from industry want to really understand that uh, somebody from industry really li like to have a look at it so there is no way for us to to at least get a get a understanding about who is doing what in a cyber security so suppose i have to really look at uh, uh, somebody working in a cloud security so is there a way for me to understand which are the professor working in cloud security specific work basically who is working in a cryptography basically so to to bridge this gap and, and so one is to one is to understand but once you understand once you have your cut of visibility then there is a possibility of collaboration in terms of the research collaboration and more more industries involvement into cyber security work would happen basically uh, from industry side, we certainly like to look at that part, and but from the researcher side and from the overall country's national strategy perspective, so all the research uh, uh, that is happening in academic and R and D institutions, basically, sometimes and most of the times, they may not lead to the security product and uh, the capability which can be used by industry or which can be used by the community, basically. So suppose they have the reason, tools and instrument basically to engage and deal with industry. So then there is a lot of this research which probably end up uh, in terms of the publishing paper or somebody getting PhD degree out of it basically could basically translate into a, a, a product and can also be commercialized basically. So we see that happening in other parts of geography, but probably in our geography in India basically we need a specific cautious effort for that basically. So here I'm trying, I'm trying to uh, help you with what exactly we are trying to do as a national C, uh, center of excellence from national COE basically. So we know that uh, research is happening. There are government is also investing in the research basically. And we are what we are trying to do is basically um, try to understand these 200 plus professors and the area that they have been working basically. So we we are trying to create a network of cybersecurity research basically. So we call this initiative as the CSRA initiative. Um, uh, we, we, we are trying to see map the work of the researcher basically and uh, make that available so that we can visually browse that research work basically and organize that information in a way that you have very good comprehension about the particular professor working in a particular area or personal institution working in a particular area so you can easily relate to that basically so tagging and understanding that research is also very important part so this is one of the important steps that we have been doing and through this exercise, uh, 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 we had seen almost 68 professors in India working in a, uh, cryptography and crypto analysis, almost 77 and net network security. Then there are so many researchers working in uh, IoT security and researchers in network security as well. And I will probably take you to that particular um, uh, tool that we have built for this one. And if you actually look at the, the areas, uh, and these are very cutting edge research area, right from helping with the uh, applying the cryptography to multi party uh, multi factor authentication to uh, cloud security to uh, to solving some of the crucial problem of a um, cloud security then uh, use of some of the architectural view for the uh, securing securing iot um, uh, even going to the hardware level of security issues and problem basically uh, or look at a uh, cryptography in an application of model cryptography to solve some of the problems of digitization is throwing out to us basically uh, even to the to the extent of uh, looking at the 5G network and security of that now we are talking about automotive uh, 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 
um um electronics and the way the self driving vehicles are coming or electronic vehicles basically electrical vehicles are coming basically so a lot of security issues in that basically um or a chip level security um uh, the the protocol level security the lot of those areas basically we are which are which which we see that cutting re- Age research which is happening in academic and research industry in the country basically, and we try to look at. So we, what we are trying to do at the National Center of Excellence is basically try to compile the effort that uh, academia and research community in this country has been put together in different areas of cyber security, and try to understand them, tag them, so that uh, industry can b- make better use of them basically. So let me take you to uh, the tool basically we have created uh, for this. So uh, so this is a. Uh, a csrn network and i'm, I'm sure uh, uh, you are uh, able to see uh, my screen here uh, so uh, uh, here uh, uh, you you would so this particular tool that we could talk about csrn tool what it takes basically it, it takes you to the the work that is happening in academic world in cyber security space suppose i click the cryptography you will get to say almost 68 different professors working in cryptography and if i really click with one professor basically uh, like this professor uh, uh, monik lal das or professor abhijit das uh, uh, from iit kharagpur or professor vishnu reddy from uh, <coughs> Uh, professor, professor Guntu or Professor Sushmita Roj, which works in ISI Kolkata. What we try to do is we try to look at basically the research work they have been doing and try to tag them. So, uh, the, if you look at the tagging, basically it's uh, largely the cryptography area, but in cryptography, what basically? Searchable encryption or secret sharing of the information or lightweight key management of WSN, basically relational ship secret engineering. And if you look at many of these professors work that we try to do in this tool is basically try to understand their work, try to look at, and then if you want to really go uh, to detail, there is a Google Scholar link is also up, uh, provided here in this particular tool, basically. So like what you can look at the researchers in network security, you can look at the researchers in hardware security, and also by clicking the individual researchers, you'll get to see what are those areas which they have been working, basically. And if you just look at the uh, tags basically in hardware security, you'll get to see what they have been trying to do uh, in a in a hardware security area. So likewise in a, um, uh, uh, different areas of a security. And so this tool is a is a largely the a very visual way of a, bringing the work academic research work to the to the community basically and um, also this is a first step towards that basically and most of the companies which are working in a very deep down technology areas basically they have been now started seeing this particular information available to them uh, seriously and probably this helps them to engage with academic competitivity basically so that's the basic uh, if you really want to bring the communities together academy and industry together the creating the visibility of the work which is happening is very important a step basically and so we we are taking that first step of a uh, creating this map creating this visualization about the r&d work which is happening in cyber security space uh, in a different academic world in the country basically in isa kolkata different iits basically it's so what we picked up is almost 200 plus um, nira prank engineering institutions basically and try to look at the professors working in them and try to analyze their work and try to put uh, that work in a way that you can easily consume it basically. So this information available to you in a very consumable form. So could be a first step towards uh, achieving the uh, the collaboration between academia and industry basically. And then likewise, there are a lot of other areas that basically we would like to work to bring the academia and industry community together uh, as, as we are uh, in the morning Rama, Rama CEO talked about is basically so we are also creating some kind of a, uh, funds at DSA so where in through industry, we can invest into the R&D project. So whatever the, the research IP which we got created, basically those research IPs can be converted into product and can be converted into uh, services. Basically, we are trying to see the productization, commercialization possibility as well. And we would like to see uh, industry coming forward and engaging with us. And also the academia paternity, basically, who are engaged into doing research, basically. So please help us uh, uh, understanding their resource so that we can 
create a better visibility of that and trying to find the opportunity of collaboration with the industry basically this is one of the important things that we have been doing at a at a national survey basically so and we will keep doing this we we are currently 211 professors work which has been uh, mapped here and we we would be adding another 100 plus in coming future time and we would be uh, having very good map of uh, making you understand if you are looking at very specific areas of security for that matter if you are looking at a malware analysis basically and if you have to understand ki any academic research was happening in that basically so this particular map this particular tool or utility can help you doing that basically and we have been asking people to come and sign up and use this information and help us improve this particular um, uh, utility that we have created uh, for this uh, uh, collaboration between the academia and industry basically so this is one of the important things that we have been doing at the National COE uh, uh, to really further the cyber security agenda. So another important thing that we have been uh, trying to do is, uh, uh, and that is what uh, we, we had talked about in earlier couple of sessions, basically, uh, that uh, the security capability development or technology development is a derived uh, effort, basically. So there's so many capability in open source and other part is available for that matter hundreds of open source capabilities which are available like uh, if you are looking at threat intelligence and there is open cti if your uh, assignment point there is a elastic uh, search which is available for you if you are if you want to do threat anything there is security onion as open source tool is available for you if you want to set up a security monitoring there is a uh, this particular tool is available for you incident response can be done with the the high the the uh, automation orchestration can the, can be done with shuffle basically and then if you really are interested into hardware security level basically then firmware extraction tool like binwa can help you basically so what i'm trying to say here is from the national cv what we are doing to do is we are trying to create a capability for you to help you browse through hundreds of the such kind of open source capability available and those capabilities can be useful to you in your day-to-day -day activities and as well as build something on top of them basically as your own product and own ideas basically so uh, for example if you are interested in a firmware security there are 100 plus resources available which are open source resources in uh, helping you uh, uh, to do this uh, firmware security kind of a work basically um, uh, in threat hunting security union is one of the key uh, repository which has been referred quite a lot all across the globe basically and people have been using that basically the yara rules which has been one of the important rules which has been created to help you manage the incident better basically so there are almost 700 commits it has seen until now and people all across the globe had been using and committing back to that those rules basically and they have been doing since inception almost 1700 rules had been created by the community so the community has been continuously working on that and uh, 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 out of that, suppose you have a specific problem, uh, security problem, and you want to see the answers for them, basically. You want to uh, get an aggregation level of a view of them, or you probably need to go the oh, quite a drill down view of a particular uh, uh, specific areas of cybersecurity. So this utility we have created, and I'm taking you to that utility, basically. Uh, uh, so this is a utility that we uh, have created as a github visualization so we all know that all of these elements are put on a github by uh, so many different open source research community and in that what we are providing for example if you are uh, coming to this utility and this is available you can go to the national coe's website and coe website basically uh, click the github research visualization utility and there if you suppose you are uh, searching firmware security, so you will be able to see uh, the the effort that people have put together until now on uh, on a firmware security basically, and the, all of those kind of effort which has been put, so you can get a snap uh, uh, shot of that basically at the right side basically, um, and you can see uh, the resources available here. If you are interested in support for example application security, you can just put an application security here. Uh, and um, uh, you can look at uh, at a very broad area application security you can look at some of those um, uh, resources available on github and this visualization can help you to reach out to that as many as you can and then more importantly to to specifically have the larger aggregate level comprehension about this and then if you want to look at the uh, particular area of application security so then it can also throw you 
um, a lot of those resources basically. So the, here I just tried to put DevSecOps basically. So there are a lot of those DevSecOps frameworks available and a lot of those resources available basically which you can use to to uh, to to for your day-to-day -day work and as well as if you're building some solutions and capability basically you can uh, quickly look at the uh, scan the larger horizon and look at very specifics of the capability you're looking basically so these are two two key things that we try to do as a data security council of india and uh, its national security co initiative so both of these tools have been now launched as a beta tools or utilities basically so anybody interested basically can have a look at them can can uh, sign up and basically start using it basically and help us also to refining this kind of utilities that we set up for the larger benefit of the community both for academia researcher and startup and uh, larger industry community as well so these are some of the efforts that we have been putting and we'll keep putting many such kind of efforts. Another important thing that we have been trying to do is uh, helping you understand the patent uh, filing happening in cyber security space. Suppose in the last six months, you want to understand in network security, what kind of patent has filed or in network data security, what kind of patent has filed. So that could be another thing that we have been, we will be shortly launching and the, the, those could be also very important, uh, insightful at aggregate and specific level, you'll be able to understand that basically. So these are some of the efforts that we are putting together and we look forward to see, engage and collaborate with the industry people and plus academia community here joining here today or, uh, <clears throat> or otherwise as well. Uh, with this kind of effort we are putting together to bring the community together and most importantly further the R&D and product development and uh, developing the niche security expertise in the country. So with this I would like to conclude uh, my session. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vinayak Godse, for uh, that comprehensive presentation on accelerating cybersecurity research and innovation. We'll now move on to our next segment, which is uh, once again a plenary session on QUAD, the Cybersecurity Capabilities, Collective Efforts for Research and Education. Now, to moderate the session, we have uh, amongst us this afternoon, Mr. Deepak Maheshwari, Public Policy Consultant. And to talk to us and share with us their insights, uh, Ms. Aditi Chaturvedi, Head Law and Policy with uh, Cohen Advisory Group, Ms. Sonia Arakal, Policy Fellow at uh, Perth US Asia Center, and Mr. Pranay Kotasthane, uh, who is the Deputy Director at Takshila Institute. And uh, as you may be able to see on your screens, we already have our panelists here. And without any further ado, I am going to hand it over to the session moderator, Mr. Deepak Maheshwari, uh, to take it forward from here. Thank you. Uh, hi, um, Mr. Maheshwari, I'll request you to start the session. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Amrudi. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Deepak Maheshwari here. And this particular session, what we are going to focus on is how do we utilize the opportunity of the quad? Uh, quad at itself as a concept is not that old. It's just a few years old in terms of geopolitical uh, arena. But at the same time, what we have seen is that this is something which has evolved very, very quickly into something which is multifaceted right now. So across the US, India, Japan, and Australia. And how is it that we can use this particular platform of Quad to deal with the growing challenges of cybersecurity 
around the world. And of course, uh, specifically within the India, how do we look at these things in terms of research as well as for innovation. So we do have uh, three panelists with us. Uh, we have Tranai from Takshila Institution. We have Sonia from uh, Perth USA, US Asia Center. And we have Aditi from uh, Koan Advisory Group. So what we're going to do in this particular session is I would like to each of them to focus on one particular dimension, of course, uh, within the uh, concept of PARD. And then uh, initially, I'll request them to limit their responses to about four or five minutes. And after that, we'll do one or two more rounds of uh, questions. And uh, in case the audience have any questions, my request is that they can uh, type in the questions in the box, and we'll take up those questions also as we go along. Uh, so, when we are looking at this whole concept of quad itself, Pranay, let me start with you on this. How do you see the evolution of quad, not in general, but very specifically in terms of the way high tech and the cybersecurity arena itself is evolving in the past few years? And of course, the recent declaration which happened about six or seven weeks back. Uh, in September end itself, uh, and how do, you, where do you see that thing going on? Because we do have a lot of declarations which keep on happening. Uh, so any summit, any uh, sort of major dialogue, it does have close with some uh, sort of declaration, some sort of uh, affirmation or assessment of the situation. But what is the pathway that you see uh, going ahead? Because what we are seeing is right now, whether it's India or US or for that matter, many other countries. On one hand, there's a lot of focus on self-reliance in some name or the other. On the other hand, there's also this tendency about sort of working with others, with allies in different dimensions. So how do you see this particular thing playing out in the long run? Yeah, Pranay. Thanks, Deepa. Yeah. Uh... Thanks for inviting me. So let me begin with this. Uh, as you rightly said, there is this uh, sort of a tug of war between this idea of complete self-reliance and the fact that most of the technology supply chains today are global. So right there is one needs to strike a balance between them. So uh, regarding the quad, I think there has been a lot of progress over the last six, seven months and multilateral cooperation generally is quite slow. But I would say by judging by those standards, the uh, the progress on in the quad has been quite fast. So if you look at it, the there was a critical and emerging technology working group which was established in the March meeting. Back then, there was no common understanding even of what does this term critical and emerging technologies mean? Is there a common understanding between all four countries or not? But from then on, I think it's moved quite fast and it's no longer the case. Uh, the critical and emerging technology working group has done a prioritization exercise. And if you see the last meeting, we saw there is they have zeroed in on a few areas, space, biotechnology, 5G communications, uh, cyber security and semiconductors. So looks like there has been a prioritization which has happened and that's a really positive sign. Uh, broadly, I would like to just make three points that uh, I think the Quad group should focus on technology collaboration uh, for three reasons. Reason one, uh, I think there is a convergence of values, interests and strengths uh, in this group. Uh, why I say that is by values, I mean, uh, if you look at the Quad Principles document, which was released, there is already a lot of uh, uh, a lot of arguments made about how there is an alignment of values, especially giving importance to individual rights, privacy, etc. Uh, so that those values alignment is there. The second one is interest. I think the political interests of this group is quite clear. Uh, and th there is a realization that China used globalization to its advantage while blocking other countries from access to its technology market. So there is an alignment of interest that that needs to be changed in the new uh, post-pandemic world. 
and the third one is strengths there is there are complementary strengths between these four groups so if you see uh, us leads on a lot of intellectual property work uh, japan leads in precision manufacturing australia has a lead on things like battery storage and quantum computing and india has the human capital to make all of this work so sort of there is a coming together of all these things in this group Uh, the second reason why i think world is well focused is because it is a positive agenda on which many other countries can rally around so uh, this uh, works well uh, if you see geopolitically from the perspective of other countries as well and finally i think the quad is a small group uh, small enough group uh, to get started unlike the t12 or d10 groups which have been talked about earlier where there is a lot mm-hmm. of confrontation and misalignment of what should be done it, uh, between the countries in the group itself so within the quad that grew that sort of problem is less so i think what is a good point to build a, what my colleague nitin calls the bubbles of trust so start with a small group get uh, things going on the five areas that i talked about and then grow that into a bigger bubble coalesce it with other partners as we move on so from that perspective i think quad is well positioned and uh, i have worked on the semiconductor side and i clearly see there are a lot of complementary strengths between these four groups and that's why you also saw a uh, supply chain uh, semiconductor supply chain initiative being launched in the last quad meeting there is a positive move a lot uh, all these countries are realizing that self sufficiency in the technology arena is not the best way to go forward whatever one country might uh, be able to do uh, attaining complete self sufficiency is not a uh, possibility and hence i see this move uh, in the right direction thanks uh, pranay for this uh, so you are saying in terms of uh, i mean the values uh, strengths and interest then of course the positive agenda and of course the uh, small enough to get this whole thing kick started so yeah. let me move over to sonia so sonia you have written a lot and you have researched a lot on um, usa australia but not just us australia including of course on the quad issue also at the same time what we also observed in uh, australia for example there've been some very specific type of uh, legislative moves at a domestic level in australia so there was this whole thing about uh, the assistance for encryption for example i mean for decryption in a way okay and then of course uh, we also saw these negotiations uh, with the social media companies and with the research aggregators etc now these are the type of things that a particular country is doing let's say at a domestic front and at the same time when it is coming as a member of the quad what we are seeing is it has a very broader different type of agenda so how do you see these two things coexisting reconciling across these two different dimensions Uh, thank you, Deepa. Can I think you've hit the nail on the head there about some of the tensions within the Quad that might get in the way of the uh, ambitions or the rosy picture that Pranay has just painted. Um, while I agree with his interventions that you know theoretically this is exactly the space the Quad should be playing in, and indeed we are seeing after the recent leaders meeting that they are. um acting on their intentions through the critical working group there will be some limits um a lot based on either domestic uh appetite for regulation or domestic politics and i'll come to that but before we talk about the limits let, let's talk about the good news story and about uh the the evidence that we can point to that the, the quad is already in this space and indeed the australia india bilateral is in the cyber and critical technology space um and, and elevating it just last week prime minister modi spoke at the sydney dialogue and the sydney dialogue was a space where um the policy makers from around the world came to talk about cyber and critical technologies uh Mo- Mo- prime minister modi gave the keynote address and before him prime minister morrison also spoke um as a part of prime minister morrison's address he announced um that there would be a australian consulate established in bengaluru and in fact he then went on to speak at the bangalore um tech summit and uh, announced the center for cyber and cyber enabled critical technology so this is a huge area um for both australia and india not just within the quad but also bilaterally um 
Australia has been uh, engaging with India in, in cybersecurity uh, for, for many years and in a very deep way. Uh, and, and I think cybersecurity is one of the uh, specific areas within critical technologies where there is the most room to um, es establish some norms within the quad, especially when it comes to attribution and attribution of cyber attacks. Now, we've talked about, um, you know, the Sydney dialogue, the quad, the commitments both bilaterally and multilaterally to uh, uh, cooperating in this area. Um, area, but I would like to put on the table some of the limits to cooperation. Importantly, um, when we talk about you know cooperation in cyber and critical technologies, these are really sensitive technologies and areas which can bring huge militarily military defense or strategic benefits to countries. And I'm a little bit wary, given that the Quad is not a technical cooperation agreement or even an intelligence sharing agreement, that really um, substantive um, cooperation can happen between the Quad countries without agreements to that effect. And if anything has brought that into focus, it is the AUKUS agreement. So if we want to be developing as Quad countries or bilaterally Australia and India, you know, the cutting edge in uh, cyber threat assessments, in uh, cyber offensive capabilities, in the quantum technologies um, that Pranay mentioned, th there needs to be a more substantive cooperation agreement in, in place that covers both technical cooperation and intelligence sharing. And that is just a nature of um, the kind of research that's required in this area cannot be done without uh, sharing of sensitive information. And unfortunately, the Quad is not yet at a level where they, uh, as far as I know, where they have agreed to that level of um, deep uh, cooperation. The other uh, 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 kind of limit to cooperation that I'd like to put on the, on the table is Though we have shared values, we express those values, each country in the quad, in slightly different ways. Um, a fun example is TikTok. So we know that India has banned TikTok, but the other three countries haven't. You also see this illustrated in the quad countries' approaches to Huawei and how um, they have managed the risks associated uh, with 5G rollout. And each country has approached it in a slightly different way. Australia was first out of the... Um, out of the gates and they very clearly banned both uh, Huawei as an operator and as a technology provider. Whereas my understanding of the Indian context is that though in, uh, Huawei is, is banned as an operator, there are, there are, uh, it is more being sidelined as a technology operator and provider to Indian operators and that that is not explicit in the, in the Indian legislation. So, uh, I, you know, I, I bring up the TikTok and Huawei examples, not to say that you know the, the values are different. I agree they're the same, but when it push comes to shove, due to economic, geopolitical, and security considerations, countries will act in different ways, and that are the kinds of things that we need to overcome when we talk about cyber and critical technology research um, in the Quad. Okay, thanks, Sonia. So, Aditi, when we are looking at in India. So in India, a couple of things come to my mind. One is obviously there was this talk about national cybersecurity strategy, which the prime minister had announced uh, last year on 15th of August, uh, that it is in the works and it should be coming out anytime. So that's one. And second thing we have also seen that, for example, in India, we are also now getting ready for the G20 leadership next year. Okay. Uh, and uh, also India has similar type of, uh, I'll say, not as accentuated announcements or affirmance as we have seen in the case of Quiet, but nevertheless, almost all the recent bilateral or multilateral agreements that we have seen uh, do entail some element of cyber cooperation. So it could be a small country, it could be a big country, it could be a developing country, it could be a developed country, whichever way. And within that, how do you see the prioritization for Quad coming up front and center? And second, in terms of the, if you see cybersecurity, and uh, Sonia did mention about attribution. Now, even if you have attribution, ultimately one of the important thing is that you should be in a position to get that information and uh, have some sort of a prosecution, which results in a deterrence ultimately in some prosecution that way. And there, the only instrument right now we have in terms of the cyber crime per se is the Budapest Convention at this point of time. Now, 
there obviously india is not yet a member of the budapest convention we have not yet signed that so how do you see that for example the other three countries here uh, they are all uh, in the budapest convention whereas india is not and in that scenario so even if we have let's say this type of cyber security arrangement so there are this cooperation and there is a potential intelligence exchange and other things which are not yet there as uh, sonia very rightly mentioned it's not yet publicly at least announced that way but hopefully these things should fall in place but ultimately even without with those things without having an ability to exchange information on an operational level how do we make the most of this opportunity from quad right um so i just want to begin with saying that you know the cyber issues are per- pervasive we cannot we cannot pin them down to a specific system or you know a particular product but as we have seen that you know now that uh, technology has become a become global and it's it's dominating all kinds of markets and uh, you know we are we are what we are essentially noticing is that these are all interdependent right and hence uh, controlling a certain kind of vulnerable vulnerability in tech has become even more complicated because tech supply chains are such or the development of tech is such that you know these are coming from you know probably they are scattered all over the world so that is probably what we fundamentally need to understand here is the nature of tech in itself how are we trying to resolve this issue of security in tech so fundamentally the nature of tech is that we we cannot have local conversations and then try to resolve this um issue of cyber security or security in tech at a global level so our our approach in first approach should be to at least understand what kind of tech we are dealing with and um tech today will be very different from tech of tomorrow so we are we're going to be probably looking at more and more emerging tech you know which are riding on the backbone of ai ml and things will will eventually change so we will probably what i feel is that india needs to have very very um needs to form communities have very strong um you know uh, evolve first principles of how to deal with the with the kind of um you know first principles as to the kind of um, collaborations or the kind of um, or how to work around it i'll give you an example um when we look at ai for example what we essentially mm-hmm. notice is engineers work in isolation right and technology is evolving and we ha- and what businesses are doing is not very sufficient so how do we eventually come to a point where we can have uh, you know more and more um security related collaboration right so one way of doing it is through you know talking to businesses getting them getting more and more support from them but other kind of um aim could be let's say in ai where you where even when we talk about ethics of ai we only and only you know try to emulate what you know probably what is happening in some other countries but do we have a more regional regional approach to it maybe we could you know evolve some some criteria that is more important to us so that we can produce trustworthy products in our systems so this is the kind of um, approach that we'll have to evolve secondly is that um, india will have to really really reassess um, how are we translating our economic social and political realities at at an international level whether it's at the level of you know framing a, um, getting into a pact with some other country or an agreement or a treaty with any other country how do we really eventually translate all of this there for example i think um, sonia also mentioned something about 5g and you know be it our standards like you know india 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 is stuck between this this whole concept of uh, giving more access to people versus um, jeopardizing let's say itself in the sense you know isolating itself from the the larger 5g standards um that is one or let's say we are big on data sovereignty and i understand that because you know probably india realized much later that how how digital economies have you know progressed and to you know to take benefit of this how do we protect our data you know or how do we utilize it in the maximum possible manner so again these are many interrelated issues that actually come in the way of us you know working together working together for uh, you know promoting economic growth or even for plugging security related issues so this is something that we'll really have to introspect and figure out whether we can you know come together one thing is very important which i see is that uh, you know when we look at the recent development around g7 and when we see um, us japan's policy you know uh, dialogue um, around data flows these are actually in, in complete um, contrast to what india has been planning to do uh, you know if you see the groupings also they, they promote data free free flow of trust but what about india where does we may sign many as many regulations as we want to but how are we really working at a more practical level this is something i think we will need to evaluate okay so uh, pranay when we are looking at this whole thing around supply chain 
ultimately uh, apart from the software the moment we look at the hardware uh, the chips actually and you didn't mention about semiconductor industry i mean chips uh, is i'll say software is more distributed in terms of let's say from the places where one could potentially get or uh, obtain that uh, software and the services compared to the hardware and uh, chips for those and in that scenario if we see so for example uh, yes the, there's a quad uh, is there but across all the quad none of the four com- countries actually produce uh, mo- most of the chips in how in any of these countries okay so there may be companies they may be headquartered there they might be producing elsewhere uh, some of that stuff but other stuff is actually being produced in some other countries specifically in taiwan for example okay and not just one company m- multiple companies so that's one challenge and the second thing as aditi just mentioned in terms of these different type of groupings what else is happening in those groupings so right now for example uh, what type of first principles should actually be guiding us when we are looking at these type of uh, assurances across getting a better supply chain systems in place uh, rather than just having these affirmations i mean these affirmations and announcements are important these declarations are important but ultimately we do need something beyond these at an operational level uh, uh, for things to operate and for example we did sign ccra a few years back uh, but then we came up with some profiles which are ccra plus so even if you have a ccra certification elsewhere it's probably not that really practical in india to use that so in that scenario what are those first principles that we should be developing not just in india but i'm saying across the quad to ensure that we have better controls on these supply chains where we have an assurance from end to end on cyber security deepak is that question yeah, from you yeah yes sir for you yeah so i i just lost you uh, in between but you were mentioning about okay. uh, the fact that uh, none of the four quad countries have uh, semiconductor manufacturing did you mention that in a big way yeah. in a big way okay yeah, yeah. i mean yes so yeah, i i'll take that so uh, first of all yeah there is the countries do have manufacturing uh, ability it's just that you don't have the leading edge node manufacturing which is there in taiwan and hmm. south korea but we us does have a lot of semiconductor manufacturing at home as well so uh, yeah that uh, exists so that's why what i uh, meant to say is that start with quad as a group where you can uh, start this bubble where you can get people in and start uh, initially building trust in each other systems and then you can add other countries maybe because there are other countries like israel there are other settings like eu uh, not just taiwan and south korea which are important for the semiconductor ecosystem as well so you can bring them in at a later point of time uh, when they are more comfortable but the idea is can you at least begin with a few things now i'll tell you what are the kinds of things that they can do very specifically uh, one a lot of like really began uh, in this uh, session that they are trying for a lot of self sufficiency and every country is trying to fund their own entire semiconductor ecosystem and my argument has been that actually government should do what companies can't which means there are for example can the four countries form arrangements to facilitate more exchange between the companies in each other's countries right so for example in the semiconductor space there is a lot of uh, development which happens through research visitation joint development licensing uh, all of these things right and so the idea is can governments have a role in each of these elements right so reducing export controls reducing investment screening uh, reducing uh, visa requirements for uh, employment opportunities within the trusted groups having something like a trusted partners program where you can uh, invest in each other countries with lesser investment screening barriers or even trying for some moonshot ideas right like composite semiconductors etc so all these are some of the areas where 
these four countries have the wherewithal to begin right now right you don't need taiwan or south korea to be in uh, for you start off so that is one thing the second idea i think which these four countries can do is building trust in each others sort of legal ip enforcement mechanisms for example there have been patent prosecution highways between us japan us canada etc where we can sort of think of can the quad countries also agree on this so that they share information with each other on ip theft uh, etc and build a more trusted ecosystem and third final idea i think one thing which can begin now is Uh, we are speaking at this national center for excellence but can the quad think of a quad center of excellence where uh, some ideas like hardware security which uh, you mentioned deepak uh, that is one area of interest for all four countries so can hardware security uh, be one of the areas where the semiconductor supply chain reliance uh, supply chain initiative which the quad is working on invest in right so uh, that can bring in uh, expertise from all four areas and uh, can take the uh, expertise forward uh, last but not the least a lot of this uh, depends on movement of human capital uh, you movement of uh, experienced resources from one country to the other so again uh, as i said if we have uh, a, 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 the four governments agreeing on reducing barriers to movement of experienced professionals whether it is in cyber security or semiconductors uh, there is a lot of uh, organic collaboration that can take place currently as uh, sonia mentioned that there are still uh, some technology exchange barriers uh, and countries might not be uh, always uh, very happy with exchanging uh, our technology transfer so i think what is that platform where you can begin to sort of dismantle some of the really tightly wound uh, technology transfer um, regulations because there is no other way that you can uh, dominate the space until and unless uh, more and more countries come together yeah. it's not about one country building the entire ecosystem but i please can you just wrap up thanks okay so sonia when we are looking at these type of things uh, i mean movement of people movement of capital is Uh, are is one type of thing but of course uh, the moment we are talking of cyber security we are talking in terms of the digital uh, cyber space uh, one of the other important things is in terms of a uh, movement of data itself so how do you see and just like pranay did mention can we create something like a bubble of trust across these four countries for example to start with in terms of uh, movement of data itself okay and second thing is we have also seen for example india joined was in our arrangement a few years back okay and at the same time right from 2013 onwards there have been uh, discussions at was in our which of course in 2015 the department of commerce in the us had initiated a proceeding which uh, ultimately was halted at that point of time in terms of uh, coming out with some additional licensing requirement for export control in the us for example okay and i mean just to uh put it simply like this uh i mean any large it company and uh, in the us for example and if we, uh, many of them do have people from other countries so there are a lot of indians for example working in microsoft and google and uh, etc now those requirements if they had been implemented in that fashion which were announced in may of 2015 effectively would have meant that even if they have two guys sitting next to each other cubicles they could not share the information if the nationality was different okay and of course they this thing went back to the drawing board at that point of time so when we are looking at these type of things that some countries are talking at the was in our arrangement uh, i mentioned about ccra earlier and of course now we are seeing increasingly uh, things around data localization and so what are the first principles that you think we should evolve in terms of at least sharing data in terms of cross border data flows across these four countries at least to start with mm. 
I think it was um, Abhishek Prakash who's written a book called The World is Becoming Vertical. Um, and he described that we are in a world that has more and more walls and barriers being put up. And those walls and barriers are being driven by things like 5G and AI and technology in the same way um, you mentioned data security. That's another, or sovereignty. That's another wall that's being put up. Um, at, or IP or borders, they're all walls around us that. Um, limit our, uh, and make our world smaller. And I, it really resonated with me, um, Prane's comments around that bubble of trust. And if we are seeing that the new world order is um, characterized by uh, critical and cyber technologies driving up vertical walls and barriers, then I think the question might become who do we want to be trapped or who is in our bubble? Who is in the room? Who are we in um, enclosed with? And I, I really, um, you know, second the comments made about uh, the importance of interoperability of the digital ecosystems of the quad countries that both Prane and Aditi have spoken about. And whether that is, uh, you know, interoperability of our data sovereignty um, principles, whether it's about uh, migration flows of people uh, in our cybersecurity um, industries, whether it's about IP, whether it's about encouraging, creating incentives for the private sector to come along and lead and be in the same room with government uh, and working in the strategic interests of uh, government. Uh, these are all really important aspects to how we overcome uh, these barriers and break down these walls uh, with those that we want to. So um, I, I have nothing more to add to what Prane has said, because I think he has really listed out a, four really important areas to um, investigate further uh, from a research perspective on what it will take to go from rhetoric about quad cooperation and cyber and critical techno technology to um, actual uh, pro you know, uh, reality and, and, and some something to show for it. And it's not until we address the very um, ped pedestrian things of IP regulation, data sovereignty and migration, like that, that's not very exciting. It's a bit boring to talk about, but that's what needs to be talked about before we can talk about the, you know, limitless possibilities of what cooperation in this area can bring. Okay. So Sonia, you talk about, let's say, what is it that we should do in terms of from rhetoric to reality, from intent to implementation, how do we go ahead? So Aditi, when we are looking at these things, and let me come to two specific aspects here. One is obviously we have this whole discussion right now in the country from between 5G and 5GI, for example. I mean, so 5GI being a standard which has been approved by TSDSI, and uh, some of the operators recently have written to the government that yes, 5GI is a standard, but then this is something that should be taken to the international level so that not only the standard is implemented within India, but actually it becomes a part of parcel of the global standard, which is being uh, developed under the ages of 3GPP there uh, for 5G. And the, as and when that happens, obviously ecosystem will also develop. Um, whereas there are some indications that this in if this is standard is sort of enforced in a way mandated, uh, they may not be sufficient ecosystem at this point of time in terms of supporting that in terms of devices as well as uh, the equipment in the core networks side. And the second thing is, Sunya did mention about what is it that should be done across the, that the countries and the companies should, I mean, Pranay did mention about this point about countries should do what companies can't do okay and uh, sonia did mention about uh, having better cooperation across different countries but even if beyond going to different countries and different companies what are the type of structures that we have within india for example for cooperation across the government across the public sector and the private sector so two questions very specifically one being on the 5gi how do we resolve that and what is it that we do there which not only leads in terms of 5g itself but actually sets a standard and uh, gives a direction for us in terms of going forward in general about cyber security the way we are talking in terms of quiet and second is in terms of the ppp itself how are things evolving or where are you seeing some tensions or challenges in that yeah sure thank in you in india 
you know, I'll just use my own experience now and tell you about, you know, something that I learned while I was working. So I feel like uh, a lot of these conversations and, you know, development of standards are typically facilitated by, uh, not by governments, not even by industry. Sometimes like the thing I talked about community was important for me. You know, I felt that, um, mm. for example, a lot of regulation and a lot of um, standards around internet governance, right? They evolved because we had so much conversation going on on internet governance. And we have noticed that is it has grown and grown over a period of 10 years, right? We also have some standard setting bodies where admittedly, you know, a lot of uh, companies participate, world leaders participate. But, but I felt a lot of momentum around, let's say, network neutrality, uh, you know, open internet. All of this took place because there was so much momentum around these issues, so much awareness, so much, so many uh, decentralized forms of participation. It wasn't led by a particular government or a particular industry body, right? Um, as far as emerging tech is concerned, I think we lack that right now. Uh, I'm not saying there are nothing, there's nothing existing, but I feel in that in that concerted effort that the, the way internet took took on, maybe it was an easier thing to understand. And probably a lot of people by then had started using internet and they understood it. I understand emerging tech is a little difficult, you know, topic to understand, but but the more you work, and now uh, because now we have technology which is ubiquitous, right? Like we can, there's so many people, there are younger people who understand much better. So I think there is a need to have this 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 movement or not the movement, but you know, probably have these knowledge centers where communities can participate at the international level. And, you know, maybe even India, for example, can leverage, you know, its strength and leverage the strengths of these communities to take a take the conversation at the more global level to be able to push through, like, let's say, if you want to talk about 5G stand, 5G AI standards, it's, it, it has its fallouts. But the thing is that it, it is great for probably access, you know, for a lot of people who probably don't have, haven't been able to access internet so far. So I think these are some things that we need to speak out in the open and, and probably debate about merits and, you know, probably, you know, like, or talk about why it's important, what we need, what our priorities are. So this is the way probably in which we can uh, go forward. Um, I'm sorry, I think this was about 5GI and the second question I forgot. About is, the PPP, public-private public, okay. partnerships. So yes, I, I think what I feel now again about, um, I, I work very closely with engineers and as a lawyer, I now I work with those who you know create technologies. But honestly, I feel it's very difficult for um, uh, governments to you know or those people who are outside of technology development to really grasp what is happening or how you regulate it, or even like when we propose solutions for security because these are so critically and closely tied into how you've developed the technology itself, right? So. Um, in India specifically, we look at a lot of startups and it is it is absolutely essential to work with those who are architects of these technologies. If you are planning to leave out, like, you know, there was a time when engineers worked in isolation. But if you are thinking of leaving out engineers and not having them, you know, on the regulatory, um, in the like, regulatory talks, I think it's a high chance that they will not understand what you're trying to do. There's a very high chance they will never be able to produce trustworthy products. Trustworthy in the sense not that not just that they abide by ethics, but also the fact that they can have you know features like privacy by design or security by design in their products. Um, and a, a design a designer has to envision where the product is going to end up. Has to envision why and who is going to be using the products and what features he or she will need to add, you know, to make it use worthy. And if you don't have people who are, you know, if you don't collaborate and consult with people, it is never going to work. So I think what I feel is that when we talk, talk about PPP partnerships, we need to very cleverly strategize who we are going to be speaking to. Um, absolutely important that we speak to technologists. Absolutely, we collaborate with, you know, people probably who understand technologies, who may not mm. be technologists, like communities, so that we can at least have more information flow. Um, also, we can have better regulations around this. And better standards. Okay. Thank you. So when we are looking at these things, uh, I mean, one thing that's very clear to me is that while technology is global, it tends to be global, um, even if uh, technological flows may or may not be global in that sense in terms of IP controls and uh, other things, but technology in general is uh, global, whereas policy becomes uh, more, tends to be more local. And so obviously there's this tension between these two dimensions. On the other hand, we also see, as you mentioned, Aditi, that it's not just about the countries and companies, but it's also about communities of practitioners, of uh, interest groups and others. And that's why what we do need is, an, even within the system of Quad, although it's ultimately a multilateral, uh, plurilateral arrangement at some level, uh, but there has to be 
some platforms we do need where the industry, where the companies, as well as the communities, as practitioners, as a multi-stakeholder platform is needed uh, so that we have a better dialogue and also better decisions and debates on these type of issues uh, going forward. And the other thing that uh, comes to my mind is, I mean, on 1st of March 2015, when Prime Minister Mr. Modi spoke at NASCOM's Silver Jubilee, of course, it was uh, almost 45 minutes, uh, he talked about multiple things about NASCOM and the opportunities, etc. Uh, but towards the end, he did mention something interesting. He said, and this was, uh, by the way, when he had been as a Prime Minister less than a year. Okay. And what he said, that whenever he talks to his counterparts around the world and asks them what keeps them awake, the response is that is this cybersecurity for most of them. And one of the clarion call that he had given on that day was that can NASCOM create an opportunity, create a task force that can come out with a vision for people in India the Indian practitioners, Indian professionals, especially the youth, who can offer peaceful sleep to the world at large from cybersecurity concerns. So this was something, actually, if you, today if we see the PIB press release of that day, that was the headline. And in that context, today, when we are looking at this whole issue around the Quad, I think it's important for us to remember the same type of direction that was given there. So what we had seen on 1st of uh, March that time, and then what we saw quick in terms of uh, 15th of August last year, the announcement, and the way we are talking in 2021 in terms of Quad and several other things. I think going forward, what we do need is this whole multi-stakeholder platform uh, uh, and mechanism so that we these countries companies and communities, people from all these three can come together and uh, evolve something. Now, before I wrap up, I just want uh, Pranay to make a very quick intervention. However, Pranay, we are less than two minutes away from closing. Yeah, no, I just yeah, wanted Pranay. to take that point forward and say like DSCI itself came up with this handbook for data protection and privacy for AI developers, I think a few months back. I think that serves as a really good model where the government, companies, and communities have been brought together. And uh, Deepak, to your point, I think the Quad Tech Network expressly serves this purpose, which you mentioned. Uh, and this tech network has been established uh, where uh, think tanks, also uh, companies from each other's countries are collaborating on a few areas, you know. So that has begun. Uh, I think a lot of Australia is driving a lot of this Quad Tech Network ideas and you will see some of the uh, new projects coming out because of that cooperation. Uh, thanks, Pranay, for this uh, plug-in. And uh, as uh, we come to the close of the session, I think uh, DSCI's work is uh, cut out well. Uh, ultimately, what we do need is a scenario where uh, organizations like DSCI and uh, their uh, co counterparts in other countries also, uh, and not just one, there could be multiple of them. Uh, they all need to uh, support this type of initiative. And ultimately, we do need some sort of codification, as Pranay mentioned, where we provide broad guidance and let things evolve uh, from ground up. So obviously, there's this uh, top-down uh, declarations, but we also need some ground-up uh, community development. So with that uh, hopeful and uh, positive note, let me bring uh, this particular session to a close. I thank all the panelists, uh, all the three panelists, and it's back to the organizers. Thank you very much. Thank and you. have a nice day ahead or thank good you. night, depending on which time zone you are in. Good night to you. Thank you.
Well, thank you, everyone. That was the uh, end of the Quad Cybersecurity Capabilities Collective Efforts for Research and Education Plenary Session, uh, flawlessly moderated by Mr. Deepak Maheshwari, Public Policy Consultant. And we'd like to once again extend our heartiest gratitude to Ms. Aditi Chaturvedi, Ms. Sonia Rakul, and Mr. Pranay Kotasthane for sharing with us their valuable insights. Now, before I move on to our next session, which is also a plenary uh, session, a panel discussion. Uh, once again, like to remind all of our audiences that we have a paper presentation session that is going to happen between 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. And selected papers will be published in SERI paper proceedings and uh, also on the Taylor and Francis website. So do stay tuned in. Um, for this particular session on paper presentation that will happen between 5 to 6 p.m. And uh, once again, we have two business lounges for our partner, Microsoft. The attendees can click on the rooms on the top navigation bar to access the lounges for interacting with Microsoft. And we hope that you are uh, tweeting about the event. Uh, you can uh, use the hashtag SERI2021 and tag us on the national COE handle to tweet about the event and your experience and feedback uh, is welcome. So please do tweet about the event. So we'll uh, move on to our next uh, session now, which is uh, a plenary session, like I mentioned, on national interventions and programs for security education. Now, to moderate the session, we once again are being joined here by Ms. Rama Vedashri, the CEO of DSCI, and uh, Professor Vijay Varadarajan, Global Innovation Chair in Cybersecurity University of Newcastle, Australia, will also be sharing with us uh, his expertise and insights. Mr. Rangeet Chaudhary, Principal Research Group Head, R&D, Microsoft India, and Professor V. Kamakoti, Professor, Department of Computer, uh, Computer Science, IIT Madras, uh, is also on the panel this afternoon. So without any further ado, I'm going to hand it over uh, to you, Ms. Rama Vedashri, to take the session forward from here. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just give it a minute for Professor Kamakoti to come online. So good afternoon to everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us at the second edition of SERI. I think the last session moderated by my friend Deepak on the quad initiatives was a good uh, session. Um, uh, my panel and I, uh, I'm very pleased to have my industry colleague, Rangi Chaudhary from Microsoft Research, Professor Kamakoti from IIT Chennai, and Professor Vijay, uh, Vijay Vardarajan from Australia joining us. In this session, we are primarily going to look at what is it given the increased digitization and the new threat vectors and the cyber risks that we are beginning to see, the fast uh, pace of digitization and adoption of um, emerging technologies, typically the number of years that would have taken for an emerging technology to get mainstreamed, those cycles are getting cut down. We have seen that in the way cloud adoption has driven and got accelerated in the last couple of years, whether it is in the area of IoT, 5G, right? Any or one of these emerging technologies, the way it is getting mainstreamed, particularly in the last two years, we are beginning to see a lot more challenges in terms of cyber risks, whether it is the state actors, we are beginning to see new sectors, whether it's the healthcare or pharma sector getting targeted in addition to all the critical information infrastructure sectors, whether it is financial services, banks, oil and gas, those sectors were always big targets, any critical information infrastructure. We are also beginning to see how in the ecosystem of digital players, how services companies are also getting targeted so that the attack can be amplified to their global customer base. Right. So we are beginning to see really complex attacks, ransomware as a service is pretty much now mainstream, increasingly new ransomware attacks. The way the dark web is getting exploited by organized cyber criminals. Given all of this, we've had a lot of uh, focus in terms of upping the cybersecurity education programs in most countries. I think we have seen this across all countries and in India. And in India, we've had this information security education awareness program really driving this initiative in the formal education sector and also in other certification programs. A lot of our industry members have been 
you know, really stepping up on the kind of certification programs, whether it is in the deep dive areas of forensics, information security, in privacy. Right? There's a lot that industry uh, certification and training bodies and, of course, formal education institutions. But I think given the, uh, you know, the cybersecurity threat landscape and the new threat actors and the emerging technologies, whether it is in the area of IoT, the entire wearables in healthcare, right? What is it that we need to do? What is it that we need to do in terms of faculty development programs? What are those new themes on which formal education sectors, the premier engineering colleges, how do we look at building this capacity in tier two, tier three engineering colleges across India? There's a lot needs to be done. And this is one domain in which we cannot work in silos. I think there needs to be national level programs of government, academic institutions, tier one, tier two, tier three, they need to be roped in. And of course, industry needs to uh, set the uh, you know agenda for what is needed in terms of whether the critical information infrastructure, the startups, the fintechs, mm -hmm. health techs, so many of them, right? I think they need to give us visibility to what are the requirements of the talent pipeline, where are they struggling to get talent, what should be the bridge programs, and where do we need to refresh the curriculum. The objective of this session is to hear from three of my panelists, where we look at some of the global programs, understand what we are doing in India, where do we need to step up, what should be our priority for the future. And then uh, Professor Vijay uh, will also be able to come up with what is he seeing at Asia Pacific level, at a regional level. I think we are seeing some new developments at a quad or a bilateral levels, whether it is with US, Japan, Australia. We'll look at all of this. Idea is to you know, consolidate some of the learnings, what worked, what didn't work, and what should be our priorities for the next three to five years. So it's my immense pleasure to have Professor Kama Koti, a doyen in, uh, from the academia, from IIT Chennai, who's also very deeply engaged with Government of India and Ministry of IT over the years on this ICR uh, education program, information security education program. So Professor Kama Koti, if you can share your perspectives on why do we need a national level program, where do we need to step up, and also some learnings and future roadmap for the ICR program. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Rama, and uh, I'll just share my screen. I have a very short presentation. Uh, sure, sir. I'm, I'm just sharing my screen. Sure. Is my see screen visible? Yes, sir. If you can kindly present it. Yeah. Is it fine? Not yet. Yes, see. Yeah, you can go ahead. Sir. Yeah, is it uh, is it visible now? Yeah, yeah, visible but not in display mode. What? Just. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. And what I will be doing in the uh, next uh, five to seven minutes. I'll be presenting about one of the very proactive steps the government of India had taken, uh, specifically to create awareness and capacity building in the area of information security, education, and awareness. The project itself is called uh, ISEA project. It is funded by the Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology, Government of India. And the objective is to create a multi-institutional platform for large-scale awareness creation uh, and the research and development and human capacity building in the area of information security. I will quickly walk through what we have done so far, the learning, and what is the landscape of uh, uh, you know cyber security education in the country, uh, and then uh, and also present some what we are going to do in the future. Uh, we have now run this program for more than twelve years now, and we are now moving into the phase three. And what we did in phase one, what we did in phase two, what were the learnings and what we proposed to do in phase three, I think uh, uh, will be a, a good journey uh, uh, and uh, and also a future direction uh, for cyber education, uh, cyber security related education in our country. 
So we started the effort in 2002, where we had an interministerial working group to evolve a roadmap for cyber security education and awareness in the country. Uh, in this way, we are very proactive. Uh, and uh, where, uh, you know, mobile was just evolving and we never thought that this is going to become a major threat to any nation. Uh, we started this effort and in 2003, uh, we had certain recommendations. First thing was education. Always it starts with uh, uh, the uh, capacity building. So uh, we had a mandate for curriculum standardization and actually retrofitting uh, information security courses. Information security as a carrier was not that interesting at that point of time. And then, uh, so can we just have information security retrofitting uh, many of the existing courses at the MTech and BTech level? And we also wanted to have collaborative HRD uh, uh, in jointly with established partners, both domestically and globally, and also have a PhD program. So in 2005, this got a formal approval with the objective of human resource development in information security in the country, addressing major recommendations of this interministerial working group. So the 2006 to 2014, eight years, we did the phase one. We networked 39 institutions, model syllabus was evolved here, and then uh, information security subjects were retrofitted. And then in addition, we had spawned many research activity uh, we were just learning what are the important things that would crop up, what would be the future of the information security. Information security as a carrier to a student. For So these are some of the uh, learning aspects that we started in the phase one. In addition, we also had a go uh, many government officers training where we uh, had good collaborations with abroad, including uh, the CMU and also Masaryk University, etc. So this was the phase one. And uh, then we yeah. moved on. Professor, sorry to interrupt you. Can you look at moving your slides because we are still on the first slide? Is it? Are you seeing the slide ISCA journey? No, we are still on the opening slide. One minute. Can I try and try and? Yeah, now it's come, sir. Now it's okay. come to ISCA journey. I'll try to maximize this so that. As much as possible and see. The slideshow is not working. Yeah, now it's there. Okay, sure. And then uh, we moved uh, uh, in 2014, we started the ISCA phase two, where we now have 52 institutions in three layers. So we had the uh, what you call as the information security research, resource development centers, and then we had uh, implementing agency, principal implementing agencies, and then uh, certain regional centers. Uh, so we had a three-level hierarchy depending upon the competence of the institute. And then we started now delivering courses. So in phase one, we were uh, firming on syllabus, what should be the content, what should be taught, what, what are the background, etc. Now in the phase two, we currently have at least, uh, you know, 20 to 20 plus 20 to 25 advanced courses in the area of information security that can be used to frame a career for a student. And uh, now currently this uh, project is ending this December and we are now moving to the ISCA phase three. And I will give some very quickly certain salient features of what curriculum we had uh, developed and what we are going to do in phase three, what we did in phase one, phase two, very quickly. Uh, so we had uh, four types of, five types of programs. Uh, under the Indian cyber security education landscape, the formal programs, which are the uh, research-based PhD and then MTech, dual degree, uh, and retrofitting of information security courses in subjects. We had certain non-formal courses, which included diploma and PG diploma programs, CDAC, typically one, one year, uh, CDAC and NILIT. And, uh, and we also had certain certification schemes jointly by CDAC and NILIT. Then we had a lot of short-term courses, specifically targeting some very uh, 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 important aspect of cyber security, like cyber forensic, uh, mobile uh, uh, forensic, uh, mobile security, Android security, voice level security, network security. So we had many short-term courses and many faculty development programs. This was intended for the faculty uh, of different engineering colleges. 
and institutions. And we also had a separate program for professionals from industry, government research lab, etc. And uh, so these were all the, uh, uh, you know, cyber uh, security education uh, that has happened over the last uh, decade or so uh, in, in our country uh, in different forms. Now, um, very importantly, we had six major streams on which we started uh, developing our entire course structure uh, and uh, and anybody who wants to have a career in information security or even a minor in information security can now start looking at one of these streams. Information security itself is a vast version and to cover everything under uh, the information security is, is a sort of a lifetime, should be a lifetime ambition. So one specialization in one area and that too is very fast growing itself is very important. And we channelize this education by having these six streams so people can look at uh, one of this. And this more or less covered every aspect of a compute and a network stack, whether it was the, the micro architecture or the digital hardware or the, or the operating system or compilers or the application programming uh, and also on the network side. Uh, and then uh, subsequently, uh, cybercrime investigation, forensics, the legal aspect, ethical aspect, etc. All of that had come under this particular banner. It's quite cluttered, but I just wanted to present that it was a massive exercise, and uh, we do have very good, uh, 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 very good materials in this direction. And uh, some of specifically pointing because of this effort, we had we have some specialized MTech. For example, uh, IIT Madras has an MTech specifically targeted for industry uh, in the area of information security. Uh, there is a, a center of excellence in Pune also has the same. Uh, MNIT Jaipur, IIT, uh, ISM Danbad, Macau, and CEDA Kolkata has MTech, uh, and similarly Andhra University JNTU. Then we have the Cyber Siksha uh, uh, platform uh, where we have collaborated, uh, where there are skilling initiative for training of women candidates, and more than 500 candidates were trained here. And virtual cyber siksha batches are even currently running at Hyderabad, Patna, Noida, and Tirupati. Right. And uh, we had several massively open online courses. NPTEL, uh, eight courses under NPTEL, five from IIT Madras, two from IIT Karakpur, and one from Turkey. And uh, under the ISCA, currently we have 10 programs that are undergoing development. In, these are the formal and non-formal space. In addition, we had a lot of awareness programs. So in India, these are all the, we have gone to all, even Lakshadeep, uh, Andama, Nikabar, etc. Uh, and we have conducted many, many uh, uh, programs for three types of people. One is academic users, uh, government users, and the general users. And then uh, we have covered all the 33 states and union and territories around 200,000 people participated and we have conducted around 1,305 awareness workshops. And we also, so the, in the unity, in the diversity, we have this multilingual awareness content. We have created across multiple languages of our country. We have, uh, we have made handbooks, short videos, posters, six stickers, newsletters, and these are available in nine languages today. Uh, Bengali, Gujarati, Marathi, Telugu, Tamil, Malayalam, Kannada, Odia, and Punjabi. Besides English and Hindi, of course. Now, coming to the last uh, part, the, uh, in the phase three, what we have done, uh, in addition to the capacity, capability building, ideation, innovation, and human resource development and national awareness programs that we have done, we are going to have two important components, the last that you see at the uh, bottom, one is the centralized infrastructure facility at a national scale shared across ISCA ecosystem, which will have tool repos, which will have generic sandboxes, which will have cyber exercise platforms, prototyping uh, environment, test beds, generic databases, data sets, etc. So the, anything that anybody learns can be put onto this infrastructure and there will be a massive quick dissemination of all the learnings. And that is what we are going to create. And in this essence, we'll have an ISCA virtual academy framework portal where we have a one-stop uh, InfoSec uh, platform, uh, resource aggregator, content aggregator, digital proliferation of InfoSec competitions and challenges. We want to conduct multiple grand challenges uh, over the years to come. 
and uh, uh, this will serve as a complete digital forum and a repository for uh, information security. So this we believe is a sort of a culmination of uh, the 10, 10, 10 plus years of effort we have put uh, into a shareable national facility, right? So, so that uh, anybody who wants to uh, come and start working in the area of information security will not have any resource crunch and uh, and will also have access importantly importantly to data by which they could start this research and go forward and this is our biggest aim for uh, isa phase 3 and we will uh, we are very confident that uh, we could have many research groups set up in the country and also many startups uh, who will deliver products that will be uh, globally competitive uh, with this uh, i am i am stopping my presentation thank you very much and then we can uh, take up questions as and when it comes thank you very much uh, ms rama yeah. so thank you professor for this uh, initial uh, presentation where you have uh, you know walked us through the journey of icia across the phases what were the program objectives particularly to uh, you know spur both research and formal education and we are aware that more and more engineering colleges have started BTech Cyber, MTech Cyber. The uptake of uh, PhD students in cybersecurity domains across various domains, whether it's network security, forensics, right, hardware security, that has increased. And I do see that uh, ICA program and Ministry of Electronics and IT has a very ambitious uh, phase three, which definitely is going to meet the country's and industry's uh, requirements. And I'm glad you touched about uh, the Cyber Siksha program, which DSCI has had an opportunity to partner with Microsoft and uh, nodal institutions of maybe like CDAC and ICIA, where the entire focus was on drawing uh, young women into cyber, particularly from tier two to tier three cities, where we've been able to execute programs across the length and breadth of the country from Srinagar to, uh, you know, Gujarat, Rajasthan, even in Silchar, in many of these, uh, and Mohali, Patna, you name a uh, tier two, tier three city where we've been able to do. And there's a lot more that we can talk about it. So I would like to move to Rangit, my uh, colleague from the industry with uh, principal research uh, in uh, Microsoft R&D in Hyderabad. So Rangit, as a global tech firm engaging in different geographies, where do you see uh, cybersecurity, education, research, partnership with government and academia to move the needle on this domain, particularly in emerging technologies? And what are some programs that you see you and other larger industry members working on? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Rama. So uh, I think uh, as a company, you know, the culture that we have and our major focus has been to kind of digitally enable, digitally enable the ecosystem. But uh, even before we try to digitally enable every sector, uh, we have to understand the depth of cyber and uh, kind of uh, uh, cyber security in affecting these sectors and then advance the technology skilling in this areas. Like... Uh, gap in skill sets is a real problem uh, even though we are trying to enable most of our customers most of these sectors from a technology perspective uh, they do face a short skill uh, a shortfall in the skill uh, our predicted numbers are somewhere around 3.5 million security professional by 2021 we would need but then there is uh, the uh, the skill set gap is real so microsoft is partnering i think in various areas uh, you know the, to help a few of the programs that we are doing one is of course the cyber uh, cyber shiksha program where we are partnering with uh, dsci and uh, trying to enable women engineering graduates uh, in niche areas of cyber security and just not uh, you know kind of mentoring them coaching them but actually giving them industry ready know-how industry ready knowledge that would help them to go ahead uh, crack interviews you know uh, uh, land jobs that they have been aspiring for uh, other than that, there is also this uh, cyber uh, Surakshit uh, Bharat 
program, which is, uh, you know, nomenclature as CSB, which we run along with multiple industry uh, players. Uh, here we are actually taking up various uh, government stakeholders, you know, CISOs of various government organizations and trying to train them with the uh, uh, best in class, latest and greatest cybersecurity skills at that point, relevant uh, threats at that emerging at that point. Uh, our North Star goal is to kind of train around 1200 plus CXOs uh, in the government and program uh, is kind of going well for the last uh, few years. Uh, we basically need to create similar programs, I would say more such initiatives uh, that helps to upskill government employees and the industry and uh, create know-how in this sector. Uh, we are also focused on carrying out uh, uh, a kind of a program that train the trainers, uh, which is called the Project Saksham. Uh, here we are trying to, uh, uh, you know, kind of educate various uh, trainers, uh, you know, un uh, across universities. Uh, if I get into the numbers, it's around uh, 4,228 edu educators, you know, across uh, uh, 148 plus universities in, uh, across India, India has been trained as a part of this project and basically create a ripple effect where the trainers can go ahead and train their peers as well. Uh, this kind of helps to create, uh, create a, a more uh, uh, drive at the ground level, uh, at the grassroots level, because this helps to get these programs directly into touch with, the, with our candidates, with the uh, uh, college uh, grads that are passing out from these institutes. So these are some things which we are doing. Uh, we are also equally focused at uh, skilling the student community, uh, college students specifically in, uh, uh, in colleges of under national, which comes under the national eminence uh, program, which is running by run by the government of India in the AI and cloud security space, uh, talking around uh, responsible AI usage of responsible, responsible usage of technology and tech. Uh, so all these, uh, so we offer collaborative internship models to students. Um, around uh, you know to help them join and then we have impacted over 1.5 lakh students uh, between the time you know of frame of 2020 to 22 and uh, our north star is to carry out this program till 24 so that's something which we are doing across industry and trying to address this problem at the grassroots level to create more uh, skills and address the gap thank you rangi i just wanted to add some of the industry initiatives which is contributing to national level programs or which is adding to the national level initiatives like ICA. I am aware several of our industry members are working with select engineering colleges or universities where they are doing, uh, you know, almost like bridge courses, whether it is the large services companies or the global tech companies. And uh, we, we are seeing that they picked uh, some institutions, maybe where they're based, like, for example, I'm aware Tata Communications works with the with a university in Coimbatore. We are aware of one of our industry members, CrowdStrike, which is working with engineering colleges in Pune. And several of our services companies are partnering with academic institutions where they're doing either specific bridge courses for students based on the talent hiring requirements, because somebody is looking at uh, you know, SOC analysts or somebody is looking for forensic specialists. So we are aware of the industry initiatives. The global training and certification bodies are continuously launching new models. And we believe there is increased uptake in certification across the board among information security professionals. We in DSCI are trying to also roll out larger programs. We've done this CIO strategy training program where we covered almost 500 CIOs in the country on cybersecurity strategy. And we've also covered uh, recently about 100 uh, CIOs and CISOs from healthcare sector. Some of these programs. Another thing that we are focused is similar to Cyber Siksha. We are looking at how do we draw women on break with some experience when they are trying to come back into their second career. Can we draw them into the domain of privacy and cyber? So we are doing a focused women on break program on privacy. And I think uh, our CCITR in uh, Bangalore, we are doing some very advanced forensic training programs for officers in defense forces and law enforcement. But collectively, I think a lot more needs to be done. And that's the discussion. 
thanks for having uh, you know professor vijay uh, vardarajan joining us who's the principal uh, you know department of computer science uh, the, uh, from uh, australia from the newcastle university and is had some challenges thank you for uh, joining us so if you can share uh, professor vijay when you are looking at uh, you know various geographies in asia pacific and in australia what are you seeing as national priorities in capacity building and what are some programs that are being driven by government by academia or in partnership with industry and what do you think should be future priorities where we can step up this cyber security education okay thank you thank you very much i'm delighted to be here part of the panel sorry for the delay that i had some technical issues um i think uh, uh given the current uh, geopolitical situation and the subsequent to pandemic uh, um uh, there's been uh, I, i think a greater realization in countries for self sufficiency um uh, which probably was there to some extent maybe more in india than countries like australia um and asia fact so i think there's a uh, there's an increased imperative at the moment in countries like australia to be self sufficient in certain critical technologies uh, sector and uh, those critical technology sector for us uh, in australia at the moment is uh, manufacturing and of course cyber comes because of the geopolitical situation so one of the things i'm seeing heavily um uh, interested from the at least the federal government is uh, uh, advanced manufacturing and supply chain security that is an area of uh, tremendous interest to uh, uh, the moment the second area perhaps uh, i mean it was the first area before the pandemic and it's got uh, uh, it's got an increased uh, emphasis uh, now is the of course the critical infrastructure so as you know different countries have taken uh, prior to pandemic uh, different attitudes regarding uh, uh critical infrastructure particularly over the 5G sector uh and 5G and beyond and australia was one of the uh, early country in one of the uh, countries which was early enough uh, uh to take uh, precautions and to uh and to take put some restrictions and then which was followed by us and uk uh so that so critical infrastructures and supply chain security which is now overtaken uh with respect to self sufficiency and in this context of uh, supply chain i mean advanced manufacturing is an interest uh, is a key area so those i would say are uh, probably the three areas but the the other thing which has always been a focus in a country like australia also in asia pac and i presume in india as well given that much of our economies are primarily driven by um, smes or what you call in india micro or my uh, msmes so in that sense for instance in australia we tend to think something like about 92 to 94% of our economy is driven by sme so there's a great interest uh in the australian circles to enhance the capability of cyber capability of sme so both state government and federal government are having several initiatives there so i would say in a nutshell Uh, with respect to government initiatives is critical infrastructure and actually in fact it was just this week i believe um, uh, we passed a little bit of a controversial bill uh, in the parliament on critical infrastructure uh, and then supply chain security and the and uh, 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 you know the smes the critical infrastructure bill that was passed uh, last week is um, is uh, it, it gives the federal government government the ability to it has identified certain critical sectors for instance university is a critical sector apart from the cloud providers and the usual telecom infrastructure you know telecoms and uh, utilities but it gives the uh, government federal government authorities uh, who in this case particularly australian cyber security center authorities to uh, uh, to come and take over the infrastructure to control the infrastructure of the organization uh, in this case the critical organization whether it's the utilities or education or whatever those sectors if they find that organization is not able to uh, uh, provide the facilities and mechanisms to counteract the attacks so that is the controversial part of the critical infrastructure bill that was passed and there's the other I mean the first part there is multiple parts and the other there was another element which is slightly controversial which is probably relevant to uh, our, our conversation today is 
um, universities are being regarded as a critical infrastructure. Uh, which was not the case until the previous definition. In fact, it is still not, I don't believe it is the case even in the US at the moment. This is, uh, that is a change. And the university executives are quite, uh, had uh, different views on that, but those are the issues. So answering your question in terms of um, uh, priorities from the government point of view, of course, is the critical infrastructure, supply chain securities, and generally because the growth of the economy wise, it is uh, uh, enhancing the cyber capabilities and uh, and uh, those are the three three main areas I would say. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Professor Vajrajan. I mean, I'm glad you brought out the CIA. Of course, has always had you know attention of any national government across the world, and of course in India and Australia and other countries. And you also talked about supply chain security, particularly in advanced manufacturing and all that is happening in manufacturing, whether it is the automation, the IoT, right? And this entire manufacturing 4.0 and the way emerging technologies, 3D printing. I'm glad you brought that, but I particularly want to little spend a little time on the MSME and SMB. I think several countries have started putting that effort. We see this program even in the UK where they're putting a lot of attention. Uh, we have, uh, like for example, given a lot of attention for SMB where we work with several industry verticals which have. SMB members in manufacturing, auto sector, retail, healthcare. And we did the cyber adoption framework where SMBs can, you know, do a self-assessment and look at what is their digital risk. But still, I think uh, building the capacity in SMBs and the provider ecosystem to engage with SMBs, we do have a lot of challenge uh, in supporting them because they don't have the in-house manpower to head information security or deal with all those security controls, I think we still need to put a lot of attention to SMBs. Uh, yeah. A couple of questions to both the professors. Like we keep now, there are two areas in which I think cybersecurity education and capability building. One is on the horizontal technology stack side, whether it is cloud security, IoT. There's a lot around industrial com control systems and operation technologies, which are now facing the heat of new cyber threats, right? So those are the horizontal technology side where we need to build capability in formal education, right? From BTEC, MTEC and some PhD research. Then there is this vertical domains, which are now becoming the new targets. I think power of financial services, they've always been the targets of attack right, and telecom and others. But now we are beginning to see pharma and life sciences, right? Edutech, because education is now becoming so virtual and online. Education and hospitals were not so much targets of cyber attacks, whereas now worldwide we are seeing hospitals and targets. So I would like to hear from both the professors. What is it we need to do in these emerging horizontal technology stack in building the capability and on the enterprise verticals, the new verticals, whether it is life sciences and pharma, whether it is, you know, education, overall broadly healthcare. There's a lot around public service delivery because almost everything is becoming online service delivery across everywhere and particularly in India. So any thoughts from both the professors, what should we do on the technology horizontals and the user verticals? So I'll we'll start. Okay. Uh, so yes. So uh, the main issue today is the connectivity, and we have to address connectivity in a very pointed, organized fashion. Uh, if you from that point of view, the government of India had recently come out with a national telecom security directive. Uh, the objective of this is every over a period of time. Every equipment that goes into the uh, telecom network of our country has to go through a sort of a trusted uh, evaluation, right? And that is very, very important. So, so that uh, that will give us a sort of a confidence in the network when it is deployed, and it also gives us an opportunity to understand. Uh, the relationship between multiple components that are put. It is, uh, so the attack need not be from a single vector. It can be from multiple vectors. For example, it can be, uh, if you take the compute stack, right, it can be 
uh, a combination of an operating system vulnerability uh, exploited to the application. So, and it can be, uh, uh, for example, some of the recent hardware-based attacks were, uh, were based on uh, Meltdown and Spectre. So it can be a combination of uh, hardware, middleware, and the application. So, so this is the first starting point. Of course, it's going to be a massive exercise. And that is something that uh, we need to also build capacity and capability for people to understand this full stack. So even if you look at the education uh, across, uh, we do a lot of things in silos. For example, the way system compute stack is built itself is silos, right? Uh, when I write a C code, I never know which compiler is compiling, which operating system is it's going to execute. I write hello world and uh, and which screen a print of uh, is going to work. So all these are by nature the way system stack is built is a series of virtual machines, and uh, and uh, so a complete progressive knowledge of all these uh, verticals is something that is lacking. So one of the things that uh, we had started in many academic institutions in uh, the country and personally at IIT Madras, I've been teaching what you call as this NAND to Tetris course, where we take start with a NAND gate, then uh, make them uh, make a small architecture, then an assembly language, then an assembler, then a, a LLVM, then a compiler. Uh, and uh, so all, so they finally take the Tetris game which is in a language, they compile using their own compiler, they tra translate it using their own, uh, uh, you know, LLVM, then uh, assemble using their own assembler and execute it on the hardware. This type of a holistic knowledge of the entire system stack must be given. This is on the horizontal side. And uh, that is very, very important today. And uh, because of this, what you call as cross-layer attacks that we are seeing. And on the sectors, each of these sectors, uh, uh, typically, our uh, uh, government has recognized six sectors as, uh, you know, critical information uh, sectors. Uh, NCIAPC has come out with this classification. And each of these sectors has its own DNA. For example, if I'm going to a bank and I'm trying to hack it, I'm trying to steal money. But if I'm going to a stock exchange and trying to hack it, I want to do a denial of service. Okay, so, so there are different uh, intentions also for, uh, uh, for, for an attack. And uh, so that is something which we need to address. And it's a sector-wise education. So that is something that is coming up. So the sector, power sector, manufacturing sector, financial sector, government, public utilities, uh, uh, transportation sector, each have its own challenges. And that is where uh, we need to have formal education in each uh, of these sectors. So, Many of the IITs today in their interdisciplinary program, uh, like how they have data science for everything, data science for bio, data science for chemical, data science for mechanical, is also have a cyber security for each one of them. And that would be our phase three uh, attempt also. So this is my overall view from a purely academic and slightly industry point of view. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Kamkoti. I mean, I think the point that you brought out, you know, that I think it's both students and faculty who are teaching in engineering colleges, particularly all the tier two, tier three engineering colleges, have a full stack view of the technology. And make sure this full stack is refreshed on a quarterly basis. The pace at which the full stack is changing, the contours of the full stack of technology is changing. What are end user devices? What is the back end in terms of the cloud infrastructure? And whether it is you know the virtualization layers, I think that needs to get refreshed almost on a quarterly or at least minimum on a yearly basis. And doing the deep dive, I think now we need cybersecurity and privacy in X, X being the various verticals, because just having a broad cybersecurity is not going to help because what is important in automotive manufacturing versus chemical or versus mines and metals or in healthcare is very different. I'm glad you brought this up. Professor, particularly, I think Australia is taking the lead around a lot of discussions in Quad around supply chain security. You talked about advanced manufacturing. Then when you look at, you know, the way in which 3D printing is getting mainstream, not just by the big global players, but a lot of SMBs are also beginning to use 3D printing. So any thoughts from your end to add to what Professor Kamkoti said? 
Yes, uh, look, uh, I agree exactly with what uh, Professor Kamakarti said. Uh, can I just add a couple of points, though? I think um, from the point of uh, you know education, I want to make a couple of points, one with respect to education and research, and then one with respect to government and industry. So, you know, with respect to education research, the fundamental thing, you know, we talk about this uh, vertical sectors and horizontal sectors. So we need to, uh, you know, although we've had it in computer science for many times, it's the systems of systems approach. That is fun, and it, this is so important in cybersecurity because, you know, nowadays they, we, we don't have self-contained problems. Everything is connected. So, uh, you know, when I'm born, I'm in the healthcare system. When I go to school, I'm in the education system. When I cross borders, I'm in the immigration systems. All these systems are interconnected. So when Professor Kamakurti said connectivity, you know, we, on one hand, this connectivity of systems is critical to make this type of reasoning what we are doing with data reasoning on days because it helps us to make more quality decisions and has the quality of our decisions. On the other hand, because, you know, this butterfly flies in uh, Brazil and the bridge falls down in Sydney, because of this connectivity and the flaws and the propagation of failures, right, this is a fundamental issue that we got to have the education people understand. Also, academic faculty should understand. You know, as you pointed out, right, um, you, know, there, you know, even a simple PC or laptop, what we got here, it has a hardware, it has an operating system, probably got a little bit of a middleware, and a lot of bunch of applications. And I can tell you one thing, even the simple PC, if you ask somebody, you know, is this PC that I've got here, is this secure? And answer it, by the way, we started this work 1980s, right? I used to work part of the DOD, the uh, Orange Book Criteria, and what we had at those times was Trusted Network Connect, uh, Interpretation Red Book. We, we needed to say this integrated component is secure. We still cannot, I cannot say the PC I've got here, in order for it to be secure, I need to say something about my trust and our hardware. Our operating system has got to be secure, but on the, on, you know, but here's the, the beauty of, uh, beauty of the challenge in the case of security is, you know, take a system A, which is by definition, let's imagine, I, I say it is secure because, I, you know, it's a small system, I can write the rules, I can actually do the formal verification, I can actually prove the security properties. And let's imagine I have a B and I am able to to prove the same security properties. I, I'm not changing the properties, even a simple one security property. If I connect these two systems, by it's only in the exceptional cases, the composed system is secure. It is only exception. By normal cases, they are not secure. So when we have that fundamental theory, now we say I have connecting operating systems to our middleware to applications, and each of them have different security properties, different attack models. You know, talking about secure systems of systems is still far away in my view. That is number one. Number two, most of these large-scale systems, I'll come to what we need to do, but some of the things we can do, but what large-scale systems, I mean, take, I don't know, I don't know, Microsoft, uh, uh, Windows, well, Windows 10, we are talking about 70 million lines of code. You know, SAP, uh, ERP system, 300 million lines of code. We, you know, your top software engineer, right, uh, writing 1 million lines of code will probably Probably make between five to ten logical errors, right? Logical errors. So if you're writing 300 million lines of code, right? When I say correct software is difficult, let alone secure and trusted software. So there are some fundamental challenges in education and research. Now, I just want to, you know, with respect to what one of the things we can do, we need to do, is to not only really enhance the capability of the skills in these areas, but also what we need to do is we need to provide an ecosystem which gives an incentive for product manufacturers to include security. This is an old problem. You know, it's a chicken and egg. Customers prefer features, and therefore we give features. That's the, that's the usual mantra of corporations. But one thing government can do and is doing and beginning to do, understand, we do it very well in the defense arena, but we got to start doing it before in the commercial arena, is to include at least commercial arena in which government is the procurer, is the purchaser. We need to include security requirements for products as in the procurement process so that that gives the manufacturers not only some incentives for 
profit margins. So we create an ecosystem of secure products. And, and let me say just last line, you know, this is critically important in technology in systems like uh, IOTs and industrial control systems because they are being populated throughout in every sector, uh, you know, whether it is healthcare to finance to transportation to utilities. So this is an opportunity. So I recently gave, um, uh, you know, uh, I was in the parliamentary inquiry here which in the cybersecurity in the Australian parliament here. And one of the things I believe in the IOT sector, we, you know, every country is beginning having guidelines and de facto, you know, standards. So, you know, but what, what we need is to add some, uh, make sure that the procurement of products uh, for civilian oh, use has got this uh, security and therefore it enables to create this ecosystem of security products, which is we need if we go to the fourth generation industrial IoT and so on and so forth. I think that is the government can do, should do, and, um, and with respect to education, I think um, there is an onus on us uh, as a candidate as well as for our students to ensure that they understand the systems of systems of systems of systems. Yep. So full technology stack and have a systems of systems approach. I think two key points. Yes, Professor. Yeah, um, so I have a uh, thanks. Uh, I think uh, both of us reflect that systems. This uh, I, I know the way the passionate answer that uh, Professor Vijay said. Yes, system engineering is becoming very important. And this contest, I have a question for Ranjit, right? So, Ranjit, uh, from the Microsoft, right? Uh, uh, so, always we see these job descriptions that we see for our campus placement, etc. Right? We see, oh, VLSA design engineer like that. But yet we are seeing information security engineer. Is there some portfolio that you are all creating, you have? And uh, what sort of uh, career, yeah. uh, you know? So if that would be very good for the people who are watching this, uh, especially young people, um, what is the career prospect in, say, Microsoft research that you'll have? And how is this job of an information security engineer comparable to a developer? Right. So you can, yeah. Yeah, I, I think great, uh, great question. And specifically, you know, the group which I had uh, in Microsoft is, uh, the group is called the Defender Experts. So Microsoft has this portfolio of uh, Defender product suits. Uh, now, that portfolio requires uh, basically threat researchers, uh, people who are uh, well versed in the industry, as well as people who are fresh minds, you know, fresh thinkers coming out of colleges to be come here, solve complex problems or look at different ways of exploiting or kind of understanding how different exploits are run in the environment. So that is that group, you know, that creates those uh, softwares. So. Coming to the information security engineers, yes, we hire from the colleges. Uh, the uh, particular job description related to that is mostly under threat researcher. You know, we call them as threat researchers because this is this field is uh, is requires research every day. Like I I heard Prof Professor uh, v uh, Vijay talk about, uh, you know, around creating systems of systems. So you know, there is a concept of, of zero trust. You know, which has been fairly uh, prevalent. Uh, now, actually, researchers are moving a little bit away from zero trust, mm -hmm. and the new concept is gaining trust, basically. Mm -hmm. So we no, no longer kind of want to believe or even create a zero trust model. We want to create a model where you have to gain trust, you know. So different types of concepts, frameworks are being thought about, and these are essentially, I mean, we have seen that people even like five years in the industry or coming out of colleges, they have this great thinking and great ability to innovate, you know, because they don't come with a very secure, you know, set pattern. And as a result of which we are targeting uh, quite a few sectors, you know, specifically colleges uh, which have, you know, the IITs, which have programs running. There are colleges coming under the Government of India initiative of, uh, uh, I think, uh, universities of national eminence. Like like the Gujarat Forensic College that has come uh, recently under the, uh, you know, yeah, NFSU, you know, University of uh, uh, Forensic Tech, National Forensic University. So these are the type of colleges that we target or uh, the IITs, of course, we target where we see or where we look at these type of, uh, you know, specifically in the assessments, we look at people who can who think you know in this information security space uh, information security engineer is a very big genre uh, especially we are looking more into the threat research type of things you know where we are uh, seeing original research being done 
No, but I think I want to add to the question uh, Professor Kamkoti said. I think his question leads me to believe that we in the industry need to do a better job of uh, communicating what are the new job roles for which we are hiring. Because I think each industry is hiring. It's not just they're looking at a fresher level, broadly saying computer science mm -hmm. or software engineer. I think that is the perception that as we as an industry, whether it's the large services companies or tech companies or startups, that we are hiring only software engineers and application developers. That seems to be the perception, whereas actually the job roles, even at an entry level, are becoming very nuanced. Uh, when we did uh, a survey six months back, uh, Professor Kam Koti, on just all the published openings of industry members, we came up with almost 30 different job roles, even at a fresh level. I'm not looking lateral. Lateral hiring anyway are very specialized hiring. And the kind of job roles that are uh, being opened up in the product engineering uh, community, uh, product, you know, R&D divisions versus services companies. Services companies are also looking at very niche job roles. I think we need to do a better job of mapping what is the new hiring patterns with standardized job roles and descriptions so that academia can do a, a better job of it. So yeah, I, I think, think there is. Rama, I think I want to add one thing that this gives us another idea. In the ASCA phase three, we should have a, a placement center also. Where yes, people sir. with these, uh, competi uh, with, uh, these uh, competence can enroll themselves and companies can look at the database and probably uh, Rangit will hire some uh, that's a people. that's a great <laughs> idea and i think in icia phase three industry bodies like dsci icia program coordinators like you government we should do a better job of attracting more talent pool whereas i think still the talent pool is probably going towards data sciences ai or getting into other streams how do we get them to the cyber security i think we still have a lot of jobs uh, perce 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 yeah. perception is very the one that we need to create so we have one can question. A, yes, Professor, if you can wrap yeah, up. Yeah, just a couple of points, the quick ones. Uh, on the one thing about, you know, the, so the perception that you said it is going to data science and AI. I think the fundamental, even, you know, here's the thing which we should really make it, pop, you know, a bit more explicit. With AI, data science, do we actually trust those algorithms? How do we know that we cannot cheat? A, that AI algorithm is not being cheated. That is, I think the intersection of cyber and AI is probably the hottest area in town this, uh, people should get into. That's number one. Second thing, can I just say, for the last two years, you're right, absolutely, I agree with um, uh, Mr. Rangit. You know, I've been sat on several panels on the zero trust. I do not believe in trust, zero trust. Yeah. You cannot, here is the challenge, you cannot design a secure system or even systems, of, say, not even a system, but secure systems and systems without resorting to some form of trust. If you have no trust at all, I know what they mean by zero trust in the, in the context of industry, but I have challenged so many people. You cannot design a secure system if you do not have trust. Believe you me, there will always be a God somewhere there if you go yeah. back, back, back recursively. Um, the third thing, I think there is a one thing I want to say, you know, with respect to job roles, um, we use this, there is this thing called, uh, I forgot the actual acronym, it's called SFIA, uh, something like that is a framework. I think it is based, but it comes from the UK, but they define, this is the thing we use for academia. There are about 20, 30 job roles in the case of security itself. I think it's uh, for different, uh, it has multiple levels up to level seven or something like that. That is one of the framework, quality framework, which we are beginning to use now. Um, yeah, that may be of interest. So, Professor Vijay, we have done that. NASCOM uh, Future Skills Team and DSCI have taken a shot at the career roadmap where we've identified 30 job roles and seven levels, and we are continuously refreshing that. So I think in closing, we are running out of time. There's one question that is there. Maybe it's just a pointer to Professor Kamakoti. Is there any opportunity doing collaborative research between academia, industry, and ICF phase three for faculty of government engineering colleges? So they want to be able to collaborate. I'm sure plenty, that is plenty, baked into the roadmap. Plenty, so plenty. So I will also uh, point out to the ISCA PMU site, uh, right? So now uh, just uh, Google on ISCA PMU, iPhone PMU. So you'll get a site. So that is the starting point. And um, there all the informations are there. And uh, we will be running a uh, FDP, specifically faculty development program. That will be the starting point. 
start attending those and certainly uh, uh, there is a very large chance of us jointly doing some research work. Yeah. Yes. So just to wrap up for international collaboration as well, uh, Kamakoti. Yes, yes, of course, <laughs> of course there is, and uh, and we also have the Institute of Eminence that has been announced for multiple IITs and uh, NITs. So in that context, uh, internationalization is a very important concept, and certainly yes. there's a lot of international collaboration, and. Uh, we will we will see you <laughs> so if i may wrap up i think it was an excellent discussion just to wrap up i would say we definitely need to step up our cyber security education programs at a country level we cannot work in isolation as academia industry and government we cannot work in isolation in silos as india we need to collaborate with other partner countries which are stepping up on their cyber education and if there is some learning so that we don't reinvent the wheel I would personally say some emerging technologies, whether it is IoT, 5G, SCADA security, and some of the AI and, you know, how do we address the weaponization of AI and so that AI can get leveraged better in other verticals and including cybersecurity. And I would say given the hybrid and multi-cloud adoption across the world, how do we put a little more focus on cloud and this entire thing on quantum and post-quantum and cryptography. I think these are some areas. And uh, we would look forward to Professor Kamakoti to uh, take a lot of feedback from industry when he's driving the phase three of ICI. Thank you. Thank you, Rama. Sure. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have a wonderful discussion. Right. Thank you. Uh, with that, we come to an end of uh, another very interesting panel discussion on national interventions and program for security education. Once again, we'd like to extend our heartiest gratitude to Ms. Rama Vedashri for uh, moderating the session and all of our panelists, Professor Vijay uh, Vardarajan, uh, Mr. Sangeet, uh, uh, sorry, Mr. Rangeet uh, Chaudhary, Professor V. Kamakoti for sharing with us your valuable expertise. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is time for us to now break for 15 minutes and uh, we will resume with our uh, conference in 15 minutes from now so two o'clock uh, five minutes past two o'clock is when we are going to come back and start our next session which is also a panel discussion on the decade of security discipline 21 uh, 2021 30 agenda for cyber education to be moderated by dr sri ram uh, birudavalu so uh, let's break for uh, 15 minutes now thank you
Welcome back, uh, everyone, to the second edition of the SERI conference. And uh, welcome back after uh, that short break. We are now going to resume with our uh, program and start our next session. Before we do, uh, a quick reminder uh, to all of our viewers that we have a paper presentation session between 5 to 6 p.m where selected papers uh, would be published in SERI paper proceedings and also on Taylor and Francis' website. So do stay tuned in for this particular session. In between 5 to 6 p.m., the paper presentation session is going to uh, be held. And uh, we also have two business lounges for our partner, uh, Microsoft. The attendees can click uh, on um, these rooms. Uh, on the top of the navigation bar to access the lounges for interacting with Microsoft. Now, uh, we're going to move on and start uh, with our next session, which is a panel discussion once again on the decade of security discipline 2021 to 2030. Agenda for cyber education is what we're going to be elaborating on. And to moderate the session, we have with us Dr. Sriram uh, uh, Birudavalu, who is the CEO of Cybersecurity Center of Excellence at DSCI Hyderabad. And to share with us their views, we have with us Professor Ryan, who is a professor of cloud security and pioneer at the University of Queensland, Australia. Dr. Deepak Garg, Dean International Relations and Corporate Outreach, HOD Computer Science and Engineering at uh, Bennett University, and uh, Professor Sugata Sanyal, a Professor, School of Technology and Computer Science at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. So, uh, once again, an esteemed panel to discuss uh, uh, with our viewers uh, their views on the decade of security discipline and the agenda further for cyber education. So, over to you. Uh, uh, Dr. Sriram, and uh, since you're the moderator, I will hand it over to you to take the session forward from here. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of SERI, <clears throat> which is Security, Education, Research, and Innovation, brought to you from DSCI NCOE. I am from the Cybersecurity Center of Excellence of DSCI at Hyderabad, and I'm very happy to see such a excellent stellar panel here uh probably i felt that we cannot get a better panel than this one where we have i'll introduce quickly professor rayan professor in cloud security pioneer and <clears throat> from the university of queensland dr deepak Gurk, dean international relations and corporate outreach and head of computer science and engineering at bennett university and professor sugata sanyal professor school of technology and computer science Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, where he has spent many decades. Uh, and myself, Sriram Birudavolu, uh, Cyber Security Center of Excellence, DSA Hyderabad. And so we have this very interesting topic called Decade of the Discipline. What is the agenda for cyber education? So as we know, just to settle into text, <clears throat> why is this important? Because cyber security is growing in many dimensions. On one front, technology is racing ahead and as is very closely tied to digitization, uh, in which at an individual level, we are moving towards digitization at an organization level, at a nation level, economy level, right? So almost all the value has moved upstream. So if you go to the bank, there is no fiscal currency there, almost not. There is practically everything is virtual. And we are even talking about currency centers. And similarly, whether it is work, entertainment, or education, or even ordering groceries, everything has moved online. So security is a generation that is born digital. Okay, the digital born generation who can't even imagine that there was a time when this was they were without mobile phones, or without smart TVs and so on, or without uh, tablets and mobile, and all, all these smartphones and uh, all the different things like Google Maps and all that come with it. So, how do we try it? And yet, we see that there is a huge shortage of talent in every area, whether it is research, whether it is the industry, the government, and all, there is a severe shortage because we are rapidly moving towards components, whether it's a cyber physical system or of, uh, of our daily life, there is smart, smart, smart everywhere, and there is a cyber company. So, how do we take this? in this rapidly racing world, and there are different angles, regulatory angle, there is technology angle, and of course, there is a business angle, and there is the theoretical research that is going on. 
and we need to bolster everything with security. How do we bring in that security by design, privacy by design, and evolve this field? Uh, and this needs a solid basis, solid basis of manpower, talent coming, new fresh talent coming into the field. And how do we enable that? We attract people to learn about security, maths, advanced application, AI, machine learning, and such. Okay. And in an increasingly distracted world, of course, it's offering many distractions. How to enable people to come into that because this domain offers a lot across all, all horizontal security. And so I'll first start with Professor Ryan Ko and uh, ask him to share his valuable insights with us on how he feels with the tech. Yeah, hi. Um, it's a pleasure to speak to everyone. I think this is a very interesting question about you know the next 10 years and i guess uh, the challenge is how do we attract people to learn more about these subjects right and and how do we um i think the, the key thing is to develop the interest young to make the um you know there's research that shows that um in australia uh that the young people um they decide on their on their careers at around year nine in high school uh, uh, so so that is about 14 to 15 years old and uh, they already decided on whether they want to take a technical career or you know other uh, careers in commerce or business so we need to make sure that you know we we actually start prior to that 14 or 15 year old age and just build that that imagination there I think the second thing is to create the environment. And the environment is not just the universities or the schools. The environment has to be the industry working together with the university to tell the universities what, uh, what are the jobs that are coming in the next few years. So by the time the people graduate, they are ready for a, a relevant job and not an outdated job. So that's also the, the second thing. And the third thing is uh, to do with the, the you know like um, uh, Dr. Sriram has mentioned you know the we get bombarded by a lot of messages, so I think we need to make sure that the messages are tuned towards uh, conveying the message of the possibility. For example, we could have you know we have TV shows about you know doctors saving lives. We have TV shows about you know vets saving animals and so on. But we don't have TV shows where there are cybersecurity professionals saving the world, you know, in the in in a computer systems and computer environment. We have TV shows about the bad side of hacking and all those things, which is not not a good image, right? I mean, if if the whole image is created such that people think that this is linked to crime, nobody wants to go and do it. But if we can say, look, these are the guys, you know, these are the people who who are the who are the engineers to send you know send the the rocket to space uh these are the people who have done these startups who have actually started you know they are they are learning from these schools and then going into becoming successful entrepreneurs or engineers or cyber security professionals you know, then that will that will illuminate the imagination and uh, hopefully those <laughs> well, these three points uh i hope uh, has set the scene and i uh, hand it over to the moderator thank you Certainly, certainly very good points. In fact, uh, uh, Professor Ria, and I would now request uh, Deepak Gurl. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Professor, for giving time. So, very nicely said by Professor Ryan that uh, means when we uh, try to orient our students for cybersecurity courses, the first thing we have to differentiate that this is not about becoming hackers. So, we have to tell them that uh, there is uh, means uh, this is just kind of 5% of the whole cyber security that we talk about. So otherwise means there are uh, jobs where they only need to maintain the standards and implement the guidelines as well as the protocols for keeping their systems, their organization, as well as their network secure from outside uh, agencies as well as threats. And I think the second uh, thing that I want to bring about is 
that now it is not only a security of individuals or organizations now it is much more important from a national security perspective so those nations who are going to be uh, well uh, skilled in uh, creating cyber security professionals as well as researchers so they are also going to uh, rise high in terms of overall position in the global power scenario so that also we need to bring along because otherwise uh, as far uh, now our situation is concerned so i sometimes talk to people at nic who are looking at the overall network so they are getting kind of uh, thousands of attacks uh, every hour and people are not aware of that means whatever uh, thing they are doing so they have that uh, dashboard where you can see what is happening all across the country in different networks so and third thing is that uh, we are still looking at a cyber security from a classical viewpoint where we think that cyber security is related to the traditional computer science cryptography and all those courses but now more important is that all those new specializations the technology upgrades and the futuristic technology whether it is blockchain or ai or ar vr so there are new perspectives that how the security uh, has its implications in those areas so my own work is specifically in artificial intelligence how we can stop adversaries from making your data set even more biased or even means uh, intruding into your uh, basic ai models and then trying to uh, interpret the model differently and then also working on some of the computer vision things that how they can uh, make the life help for you if there is some adversary who comes into your artificial intelligence model so i think these three points i will like to uh, stop here so thank you thank you so much thank you so much for your uh, insights indeed uh, cyber security has many connotations and uh, right from it cuts across all verticals horizontals and there is scope for a lot of people to join in even the legal profession if you take privacy for it okay so it's becoming a, a techno commercial area techno legal area uh, so many things are there there are products being developed in all of this so even if you take over to take uh, psychology and behavioral sciences user entity behavioral analytics what are how are you training the model is normal behavior what is abnormal behavior the psychology of a hacker right all of these things play a big role and what what do people typically do so for example on 5g networks what was normal what is not normal and in in this manner technology human behavior human behavior shape technology also and that leads to uh, what you call what to the system or how to secure everything the entire ecosystem so we need to build a more strong and resilient cyber so there are people with multiple talent required and people can learn that look, look even if you are uh, into tech you could be securing those system you could be secure there are industry specific certains that need to be okay so that's the search and also the technologies that are being developed let's say for banking fraud and uh, to protect those cyber security systems protect those systems in banking will be vastly different from another one in let's say in manufacturing where there are more iot based okay so in that manner so i would like to take the input of professor subhata sanyal <clears throat> good afternoon to everybody uh, our co coordinator professor god and dr sarko uh and good afternoon to the listeners uh, uh i would like to share a little bit of my background and how i have been connected with security issues and how we can enhance the projection made by our moderator to the next one decade to start with uh, i i mean i am talking about i part because it is necessary to have the background i have been working on defense projects no details but for air force and army for the out of my 50 years of experience past 20 years i was connected with army and air force and those projects 
needed security, but physical security was more important because these were not connected to the outside world. Afterwards, uh, I touched upon the real security in the network sense, and we went into the internet area. I think around 85 onwards, and India started the NIC and other organizations. Tata Institute of Fundamental Research also jumped in. And what we found out is that the security per se was in a very nascent state at that time. But we needed experts at every stage. And uh, I had been interacting with uh, students from VTEC to MTEC to the PhD level and our academic colleagues on security issues of various kinds. Internet of Things is one of the main area which is now very prevalent as Professor Ko and Dr. Gorg has talked about. And uh, <clears throat> nowadays all systems which are uh, take it automated cars or take it a plane or take it a medical systems. Everything is connected and uh, fraud anywhere affects everybody. If your medical data is out, a lot of uh, chaos starts happening. If your bank is getting hacked, your account, you lose money. Uh, if government data faces uh, uh, get hacked, you lose important data of the national security. So how do we block these? We need, as uh, Sriram rightly connected, rightly pointed out that we need a solid force. And the force should be such that they should be taught at the university level of how to secure all the systems which are interconnected. And for that reason, we need specified courses, specific in industry academic interaction, and projects and internships to give them the flavor of what is actually happening outside. If you learn just the theory of coding in the chalk, chalk and board, that is not enough. So you need to have people who have the actual experience. And what uh, Shram told about the NIC dashboard, I am aware of it. I mean, one goat gets mad that how one can survive in this world. Mm -hmm. But we are there and we are connected and we are seeing each other. And it is a uh, welcome initiative to have this decades of security discipline for the next decade to get prepared for what is to come, uh, be it global warming control, be it energy consumption reduction, communication security, medical security, database security, we need forces, no doubt about it. How do we attract them? That is another question. Uh, from Paras, Professor Ko and Dr. Kukar can say about how they are training their students because I am no longer active. I am uh, across 70. I help people, but I am no longer uh, uh, teaching students every day. So you will be able to throw more light. And of course, Dr. Sriram is also heading an institute which is solely de uh, dedicated their life to security issues. So yes. I, I stop here, but with the emphasis that this next one decade is extremely important for industry, for academics. And academics will have to provide student forces to Certainly. Uh, yeah. get them going towards active usage. So thank you, Professor, uh, and uh, thank you to you all. I leave the point here and uh, our moderator's guidance. So uh, what I will do is I will combine the next question in the interest of time in the sense of the current practices and what are the future 
uh, how can the present practices be used in future to st help strengthen cyber security so in this context uh, one of the good things that the government and all are doing is AICTE, the Technical Council, Educate, All India Technical Education, approved complete VTEC in cyber. That means institutes can give complete VTEC, which is a welcome news, and they are rolling it out. Many institutes are in the process of rolling it out. People need to see that uh, it is very natural, like we, there are law enforcement agencies, police people have their way of attracting their forwards. Uh, talent into their force. There are defense people have their way of doing it. Similarly, cyber workforce, it needs to go mainstream. And absolutely, whether it's an area in forensic or it's an area in privacy, this really needs to be uh, taught and uh, it needs to be made very attractive to talent. So it needs to be seen as something which is natural also rather than something which is artificially imposed. For example, the human body. The human body is natural in which you have white blood cell which provides and it is part and parcel of this it is not something that is attached separately so as every in all in entire nature it is there so with this what i would like to do is uh, give to professor ryan uh, for his comments on what are the current practices and what should we, we be adopting and how do we use the current practice the uh, future for addressing yeah. the future uh, I mean, state of affairs in cybersecurity. We have a big deficit there. We have a $250 billion market, which is going to be there. And uh, with privacy laws and all coming in 52 countries, including India, there'll be a practically a million privacy protection overnight. And where are we going to get the talent to all of these? Rather than having organizations simply take talent from one another, we are building up. Yeah, Professor Ryan. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sriram. So I, I would like to first address that, um, you know, just give a bit of background and also thanks to Professor Sugata for asking about my my uh, my work. Um, yeah, this is I'm I'm currently leading um, the uh, Master of Cybersecurity at University of Queensland. And that's this is the third cybersecurity uh, degree that I have designed and implemented over the years. Oh. So uh, over the over the past uh, 10 years I've worked across, work across uh, New Zealand and also uh, in Australia. And I had the privilege to be writing the national curriculum for New Zealand before I moved to Australia. So, so this is uh, an area that is really right deep into my passion. And um, in writing the, so I'm just going to go to the, before I left for Australia and New Zealand, when I wrote the national curriculum, one thing that was missing was the connection between the theory and the practical side of things, G giving people experience before they hit the workforce. So in that um, yeah. national curriculum, we introduced uh, a, pra a practical internship type of component towards the end. And also, uh, we also worked on the communication side of things. So, you know, you need to be able to speak about the project management. You need to be able to uh, communicate your budget requirements and all these things on top of the ethics, of course. And, and so it's not just a technical degree, but the turning point when is when I when I had a chance to work on it on the third time, uh, I was able to think about it in a much wider sense, is that in the cybersecurity problem space, a lot of us are currently treating and viewing the cybersecurity problem in a narrow narrower uh, view than the actual problem is. Now the actual problem is, uh, is that you know we we seldom view cybersecurity as crime, for example, number one, right? We never view it as a crime problem when we teach. Uh, so uh, we view it as a systems problem. You know, we we design the systems and then the systems can overcome. So this is one one problem. The second problem that I I face in my um, advice to you know to doing the national curriculum and. In, in advising the department of prime minister and cabinet is the we never we never view it as a leadership problem right so there's no leader uh, leadership focus on you know how do we you know train the leaders to make good cyber security decisions that can become a good policy that can be implemented technically as well and, and not just technically but also non-technically right and then the third thing is we never view it as uh you know the the fundamental uh 
design of things. So, so this is like crypto schemes, cryptographic uh, schemes designed to be uh, future proof or the software engineering aspects. Uh, so hence my third uh, degree that I designed with UQ was I, we intentionally do a key model where we start with an interdisciplinary uh, core and then we branch into four specializations. So the interdisciplinary core covers the geopolitical, criminal, uh, social science, uh, computer science, mathematics aspects, but in, in, in the first half a year, and then we go into the specializations of cyber defense, leadership, criminology, and cryptography. And we're now working on secure software engineering as well. And then all these specializations then end with, a, with a, uh, an internship, a placement with our industry partners. So hopefully we, we are able to, to do that. And on the side, we are also working with certification bodies to ensure that the you know the students are able to get certified, just like a, the medical profession, because you know, Dr. Sriram talked about the white blood cells. You know, we, we want to make it a, a real profession where people can aspire to. There was a quote to me from one of the um, CEOs that I met recently. They said, you know, in the future, you know, we're gonna have all the all the companies will have just like the the accountants and the lawyers, we're gonna have cybersecurity professionals in every company, right? So so that's that's a that's a good vision that, that he has. And at the same time, um, I'm going to talk about, so this is the skills problem. The interdisciplinary approach is much needed. <coughs> the second, the second uh, focus of my, uh, my thoughts is the scale problem, the scale problem. So there is the, um, the number of, so to give a, a statistic, every second we are seeing four unique malware being created around the world, right? So every second, so since the time we, we speak until now, I think there are hundreds of thousands of uh, malware being created, right? So, so this gives a perspective, like, are we able to train enough to match the scale of the problem? So we need to train people who not just know how to operate the devices or the software, but they need, they need to have the research mindset of creating tools which can match the scale. This is where the, you know, the, the likes of uh, Dr. Gart, for example, he talks about the uh, the AI models applied to soft cyber security and you know all the different automation aspects. So I think we need to focus on that. And also number three, which is my last point, we need to revisit how we teach. <laughs> so as a as an academic, um, I am also you know embarrassed sometimes when when people say why are there still buffer overflows in in software. When this is a buffer workflows are a thirty something year old problem, you know, and we have been teaching computer science for so long, but we never really cover you know steps on re preventing buffer overflow in our coding, or you know. So the way we teach also has to be refreshed to make sure that we don't introduce new problems again and again. So that's that's all from me. Thank you. Excellent, excellent. So very good insight, Professor Ryanko. I don't know which phone is ringing. So I don't know why the phone is ringing. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Uh, so very good insights. Thank you very much, Professor Ryanko. I would like uh, deeper good operation views. Yeah. So very good inputs from uh, uh, Professor Daniel and Professor Ryanko. So I am also uh, leading the here a specialization program on cyber security at Bennett University. Uh, one minute, I do not know whose phone is ringing. Probably for all the others could go on. Yeah, fine, no problem. Uh, okay. Please so, go on, Professor. Uh, yeah. yeah. So what we are doing uh, there is that uh, in our uh, means we don't have a separate program on cyber security itself for whole four years, but it is part of a specialization in computer science engineering. Uh, because uh, we don't want to lose on the core uh, concepts and the foundations of computer science for any cybersecurity professional. So generally they uh, go for around 40 credits in total in all four years where they learn about the cybersecurity. So where we cover from the foundations of cybersecurity, then going ahead with the uh, cryptography concepts and then uh, also uh, looking at the penetration testing as well as the other kind of testing techniques 
and then like also professor talked about then we cover some of the uh, leadership aspects and the uh, uh, broader aspects where they need to look at the ethical and the moral concepts of it and also understand the uh, criminology part as well as the cyber defense part so when i talk to my students who are working in different countries in cyber security related companies so what they tell is that uh, the uh, students are in their curriculum are never taught about the basic things that the basic buildings block of a cyber security infrastructure or the standards that are the minimum required constituents for any system so they are never taught so let us say if you are building a it company which houses 250 uh, people and it is building a product then what are those things that you must have as part of your cyber security toolkit so means those are the people uh, means who will know that and companies are looking for those people that who can do this for us that we have a basic cyber security infrastructure as well as framework in place so that out of the these uh, the malwares that professor ko has talked about that at least 95% of them don't penetrate in our system and then we will have some strategy to deal with the remaining 5% which are kind of ever evolving and coming new so that is one thing and another thing is very important like uh, uh, another speaker has also talked about is the certification so when we were building our curriculum we saw that means there was a lot of gap between what the certification agencies are doing and what we are teaching and uh, essentially that gap should not be there means the student should be able to get certified with what you are teaching because that is what the industry requirement is so we try to cover that gap otherwise what is happening is that many time the students are supposed to spend double the amount because they are also spending on their education and then they are spending a lot on certifications also and same thing happens for the institutions in enabling those certifications and many time the budget constraints come <clears throat> so that's why we try to bridge that gap that what those certification agencies are doing and uh, if the students is not able to clear those certification with what you are teaching then i mean that whole teaching learning uh, has gone useless for those students so why we are teaching that if it is not able to get you clear the exam required for entering an industry so we have done a lot of ground work on that and uh, we are able to kind of uh, reach to an extent that now the gap is uh, as low as 10% excellent hmm so uh, thanks for those uh, excellent very valuable insight uh, i would certainly add to that uh, a few things that in this whole skilling game one of the components which is the deficiencies is that that of simulators and fiber range solution so let's say you're taking a one week course whatever area it could be on cloud security and points free network security anything then the problem is that uh, the trainer can teach certain things but then to become a real expert or a professional he needs to try out hundreds of scenarios on his own and you cannot try that out on the network you cannot for example float malware on the network and it's the need for these kinds of tools and solutions are required that is one the other thing is on the theoretical side that models are evolving for example as dr riyan ko mentioned there are various different areas now i would add to that risk risk management which typically be in the forte of say insurance industry. so you those things need to be taught the risk models need to be developed on the other side for governments and all that as more things are more online things like cyber diplomacy and all yeah. so they need to be taught those because there is a lot of that happening now at a level even how a nation state should react when it is attacked okay what are the possible responses that it has is it simply counter attack is it name and shame and, and so as internet is becoming has become a fundamental right okay as as classified by itu and un and all that the internet is a fundament right so if that is the case then at a government level i believe many many aspects of so the tools are one thing to attack and make people experts it also lead to certification and all that the other thing is the theoretical models and all those need to be followed it's a 
to turn it over to Professor Sanyal to his views. We are almost out of time, but please, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, let me share some thoughts with you about the next 10 years. What are we going to do uh, about the cyber education for making human white, uh, white cells who will be the force who will fight the uh, war to keep us under close uh, this thing, a shell. As you said rightly, that in NIC, if you go to the dashboard, you go mad, seeing that millions of attacks are happening. I am aware of that because when internet started in uh, happening in uh, one of the first attempt is was the bitnet attempt in uh, we brought bitnet uh, in 1980s and uh, some 16 of us there was a group in tiapa we used to see that what sort of possible attacks can happen and we started connecting with the world so it is extremely important that we build students and we help uh, educate students uh, like Professor Garg and Professor Ho are doing. But give them enough practical exposure so that they actually can apply and keep us safe rather than just learning the theory. But theory is also important because after some point of time, when quantum computing and issues like that will become more viable, then a lot of codes will just fall apart. Even DES and AES codes, which are still being used, I mean, those computers can crack probably in milliseconds. What do we do then? So, younger people like Professor Go and Professor Garg has the on us to learn those things, exchange views. One important thing is uh, IIT Kharagpur has a digital uh, library. Similarly, uh, uh, we should have some library where like-minded people can exchange notes on what are the things which are happening now and what are likely to happen where the research is going on. If I have some papers and white papers and details, I am willing to share it with everybody. Uh, for instance, my Google Scholar page is open. All papers are open. They are available. It is just a click away. You just go to internet and you can see my papers. You can read them. You can have your questions. And Definitely. This, this yeah. has been, this has been, I have been doing it intentionally and keeping the papers open because most of the time, particularly places like India, you can't buy a uh, 40 pounds paper for one paper. It's difficult or 40 euro, whatever. So exchanging knowledge, that is one thing I would like uh, our moderator to take up and take, make a cell which will then distribute the knowledge over the media people, the teachers all over India and all over the world. I mean, I am connected to the world on LinkedIn. So I, I welcome all of you to connect, share, and make each other stronger. Because one stick Certainly. cannot it can be easily broken, but multiple states, it is difficult to yeah. break if they are. So I sure. stop there yeah, yeah. because we are, we are thinking, I'm not sure about the timing, but human white cells, that is what we are going to make, make them strong and make them viable and make them really, uh, why should they go for the job? It should be well paying. Because you will be competing with people, uh, job from uh, industry, and and uh, what MBAs get, will the cybersecurity people get it? Our boss here will take the matter to the government and 
uh, seek government support that uh, people, students who are going to study, they should get enough ben benefit out of this cyber security. Because it is not an easy job, it is a very difficult job. Am I right, uh, Mr. and Mr. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Uh, so, Hello. Uh, there yeah, yeah. Be, there should be enough motivation and a common knowledge pool is important. Yes. I offer my whatever little bit I know, it is open. And exchanging and pooling resources is one thing. And if you are looking for future uh, thing for the like next 10 years, you so, must go for theoretical knowledge as well. So I stop here and I request so, sure. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Sugata Sanyal, on highlighting these important points. And I'm very happy to inform you that DSCR and NCOE and Cybersecurity Center of Excellence are on all these areas, all these products are collecting knowledge and uh, collating, I mean, entire uh, uh, list of resources uh, for, for cybersecurity. And we are even publishing many of our videos uh, that are done. So anyone wants to go in, they can go and see one IoT security or on cloud security or so with the library of videos, the papers that we have published and all the resources. Uh, so that all, is there. All, all my academic work is openly available. Excellent. Your information. Oh, with that, we are very happy to that. There will be a collation of research papers. So this is an exploding area and we are certainly going to see more and more of it, more at the theoretical level the fundamentals as well as the applied practical level in which different different domains are evolving. For example, there are biomedical devices which are coming up, there are tech companies which are coming up, there is automated and uh, automotive uh, manufacturing and automotive uh, related cyber security which are there. So uh, in all of these areas, it will need specialized knowledge of the domain in order to do cyber security in that domain. So that would also attract confluence of fields and it's an interdisciplinary one. People ranging from when government to economists to obviously legal professionals to hardcore technologists, there is a scope for everyone. Hence we should encourage this and then attract them through various means. One of the ways is that they can attend certainly whether they are students or whether they are professionals, they can attend DSCI and its COE's uh, seminars or, or all these lectures. So that will, they'll know that, yes, there is so much going on in the industry, one way of connecting with the industry. And we do uh, work with our IEEE professionals, IEEE bodies, with the larger NASCOM, with other industry bodies, and with other national and international organizations to do that. So are, actually are, connecting are, are, them is... Are they openly available? Are they yes, openly some of them are openly. Most of them are openly available, only a few paid workshops. Those also people can attend. And so many are for students, it's open, so anyone can join in. So with that, they can build a very rich interest in the field of cybersecurity. And then they will know about what's going on in the industry and also theoretically. For example, there are research conferences being done here on cryptography. And so I would take this as this point that the effect body for cybersecurity is DSP. You connect all your colleges and students with this. That will be the first and then you can explore all the other areas and they'll find it very, very interesting. Starting with this very conference is there, of course, but there is AISS, which is in, and which, in which you would encourage everyone. So uh, thank you very much. And I would open this for questions in any limited time. If anyone has questions, please do post in the chat box. OK. I don't see, I mean, I see one of the questions. No, no, they are from the previous session. Uh, yeah, there are excellent collaborative opportunities and there are excellent research opportunities as well as industry ones. What do people need at students level? They are looking for an excellent career, uh, an interesting job with good growth and which pays well, and also uh, they are looking for areas that are expanding or the hot emerging areas are there. All of this can be found here. We need to position, shape it well, and there's an alignment problem. On one side, people are, 
are suffering from joblessness or being laid off or something on the other side this is severe death. this is a lopsided situation and this situation is certainly going to change now because as we market the field of cyber security fully the professionals in the industry reskilling and upskilling and and to the students who are getting into this field so all these comments are very valuable thank you very much with this i guess we can wind up anyone has any last comments quickly professor riyan yes. professor sugata has something to say yes yes professor uh, sugata uh, yeah. uh, i what i wanted to say is this my background and what uh, about are all available on the internet you put sugata sanyal and on the google you will see my uh, inter, uh, linkedin connectivity and my home page of tifr which is still alive uh, though my recent research is in modern data science and associated fields but uh, i do work with students and colleagues so this will be to connect and pulling the resource which uh, dr shriram is hopefully going to collect and handle Uh, I think we should all connect and help him to make the project a success. It's a very great project. Next ten years will decide a lot of things. Uh, I wish and hope that we can add value to this idea. Thank you. Sure. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Professor Ryan. Thank you, Professor Deepak Gurg and Professor Subhash Nial. So with this, I would close this panel discussion. Excellent, enriching, uh, good insights we have. So people who are listening, have, there are many takeaways here, and then they can implement. Thank you very much. Thank you. So this I hand it back to. Well, thank you, everyone. With that, we come to an end of uh, the panel discussion on the decade of security discipline, twenty twenty one to twenty thirty. We'd like to thank uh, uh, the moderator, Dr. Shri Ram, and uh, all of our panelists, Professor Ryan, Dr. Deepak, and Professor Sugata Sanyal, for sharing with us their thoughts and uh, insights on the subject. Now. Um, for all of our audiences we'd like to tell you that now we have two sessions which are parallel sessions the first one will go on in the main auditorium uh, which is the one we are in presently and the second one will be on stage 1 so all you need to do is uh, uh, go on the top drop down menu and uh, select stage 1 when you are entering the conference so instead of uh, the main auditorium you choose 
stage one. And let me tell you that uh, the session that we have in the main auditorium is on hardware, securities frontier, research, use cases, and ideas. Whereas, in, where, whereas on stage one, we have a session on crypto, realizing possibilities, strengthen uh, the strength of modern crypto to realize digitization and innovation possibilities. And you can also refer to the program agenda uh, by clicking on the schedule icon on top of the screens, as you may be able to see. The schedule will give you uh, details of uh, the program uh, flow and you may choose to be a part of the session that you uh, want to. And uh, like I said, now we'd like to continue with our next session, which is a session on hardware, securities, frontier research, use cases and ideas in the main auditorium. And uh, this session uh, will be moderated by Professor Devdeep Mukhopadhyay, Professor at IIT Kharagpur. And uh, joining us as our panelists for this session are Dr. Shivam Basin, uh, co uh, PL and Thrust uh, lead research for advanced hardware evaluation techniques for modern systems with security and privacy features at NTU Singapore. Professor Vijay Pal Singh Rathore, Assistant Professor IIT, uh, I'm sorry, Triple IT Jabalpur is also joining us on our program this afternoon to share with us his expertise. Uh, Professor Vijay Pal Singh Rathore from Triple IT Jabalpur and Dr. S. Pisek, uh, Assistant Professor at uh, Radboud University, the Netherlands, um, is also here amongst us this afternoon. So this is uh, a session that will be moderated by Professor Devdeep Mukhopadhyay from IIT Kharagpur. And uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over uh, to the session moderator to take the session forward. Thank you. OK. So thank you uh, very much for this kind introduction. So welcome to all of you on this uh, interesting session on hardware security, trying to understand the various aspects of that. So uh, briefly to start our session, I would like to mention that as most of you know, uh, hardware security is a very promising field of research in the area of security. Whereas uh, while classically uh, uh, people were more bothered about the, the software stack, the operating system security and so forth. Uh, but, but people have understood gradually and the industry also has understood that uh, the hardware is a very important piece in the whole story of security and uh, there are different attacks that us uh, you know like uh, that that people have shown that uh, can be thwarted by a suitable usage of the hardware at the same time hardware also brings in new promise uh, in terms of performance in terms of enabling various uh, current day cryptographic solutions uh, it also brings in for example several uh, you know, like uh, interesting solutions in the cloud context of, you know, like sharing the hardware with uh, various entities, among various entities. Uh, it also uh, brings in new challenges and that essentially is something that we will also try to talk in our uh, today's, uh, today's, uh, today's panel. So we have a very, uh, I would say, like exciting uh, panel, um, which is entitled as Hardware Security is Frontier, trying to understand the research uses, use cases and ideas. And we have got an exciting panel, uh, panelist, list of panelists to discuss, as was briefly introduced. Uh, experts who have been working in this area for a pretty long time. Uh, Shivam, uh, Stephen, uh, Vijay Pal, so welcome to all of you. And uh, we would start with a quick round of, you know, like uh, position statements from all of the panelists. So maybe we can start with uh, an introductory note from, uh, from Stephen. Would you like to start? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yes, it should be now fine. Uh, yeah. So, hi, thank you, everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is Stefan. I'm associate professor at Radboud University, and yeah, what I do is mostly the intersection of cybersecurity or even cryptography and AI. So, as such, my my perspective on hardware security frontier will also be very much AI flavored. What what I mostly do is things like um, side channel attacks and fault injection, where we try to use uh, various types of artificial intelligence, so like machine learning, deep learning, evolutionary computation to, to make the attacks more efficient. But also, uh, I'm very much interested in the whole security of AI, which is very much running on various low level devices, chips, where, where also those devices actually have no security because when people talk about AI designs and I don't know running machine learning deep learning on chips they do not consider that those 
devices, those algorithms should be also secure against various types of attacks, which opens a huge domain for research because we want to have security, but also that security as in any other domain comes with a price that it becomes slower, it becomes a more um, resource hungry, which for many, many applications is, is a difficult thing to do. Uh, in my opinion, the key applications for real life uh, settings uh, in hardware security is actually all those IoT devices, ubiquitous devices that we see often, that we encounter, that we somehow use the data. And while many people will intuitively say, yeah, but I don't care, do I have a security in, in this chip or that chip? I don't care, do I have security in my IoT fridge? But and which is true mostly of the time, but there is also the bigger perspective that, yeah, but still those devices are used everywhere. So while you do not care, same type of device is also uh, used maybe in some more um, security oriented application or even going for a more serious setups like autonomous driving. Uh, there the security immediately comes as a very important part while the setup while the uh, use cases are not so much different from from those simpler uh, simpler devices so the device itself the hardware itself is often very similar and for in, in my opinion the frontier research problems in hardware security that we should focus is yeah again from the hardware and ai perspective is that we are still somewhere i would say ai assisted first generation research where we use AI a lot because it helps, but it also because it helps us uh, publish papers. So there are various reasons why to use AI, but realistically, uh, we are not very close to having automated solutions. So we are just skipping from one problem to another. Before maybe we ask question, I don't know how to break a target with side channel analysis. Now we say, well, I know how to break a target with deep learning and side channel analysis, but I don't know why the target is broken. So I think this, this is very important goal to have also that explainability because we need to full, the full circle. Only by understanding what is happening can we actually in the end design more secure products, more secure hardware. So for, for me, I think that is the biggest challenge. Thanks, uh, Stephen. Uh, maybe uh, I will request now Shivam to just give his position. Uh, thanks, Edith. Uh So, yeah, I actually uh, quite agree with, with Stephen on all the points that he mentioned. And uh, if, if I give my perspective on this problem, so hardware security is a, is a very, uh, let's say, newly known problem, uh, maybe a couple of decades ago. But I would say this will this problem will exist uh for for quite some time to come because it, it is the marriage of of algorithms and and the hardware itself that is that is causing this issue so so whenever we, we run something on a hardware it, it is bound to have some footprints and that footprint eventually uh, le uh, leads to the problem of what we call as a leakage in terms of hardware security and which every uh adversary or attacker is, is trying to exploit in one way or the other now uh, since the problem is stemming from the basic physics, this is something which is which is really hard to uh, hard to get off. And we can say see this in the example of an IoT device. So if we take an IoT device which from ten years ago, which is let's say a simple eight bit smart card, uh, there if if you try to do any of these hardware security attacks, they have a piece of cake to do. Like something with a, a hundred dollar equipment, you, uh, you you should be able to break those devices. But now as we see that the problem is becoming known and people are acknowledging this problem, the, the research and the industry community are coming together and uh, they are actually trying to fight this problem by a, by a collaborative learning and uh, what, what we can say as a security by design principle where if you take a, a latest IoT device, you, you do get some, some baseline security. And uh, that is, I think, uh basically is is one of the the direction is on, only when industry can can work closely with uh with, with the research community i think the the future generation of the product can can actually uh come 
become more more usable, more secure, and 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 therefore uh, like th this could be a like one of the main direction for for research uh, on it. Okay. Thanks, Stephen, for the thanks, Shivam, for this uh, introduction. Uh, Vijay Pal, would you like to also comment on this? Yes, uh, along with uh, uh, Dr. Shiva and Dr. Stephen, I would like to uh, just uh, tell about uh, the other problems. Like in uh, hardware security, the major problem arises uh, due to the outsourcing. As we outsource the different uh, uh, fabrication facilities or uh, tool EDA tools from the third party. So during the development of integrated circuit, the different uh, peoples or other uh, tools are uh, involved in designing the IC. So during the development, like uh, several uh, hardware security related attacks may be possible, like one um, uh, adversary or an attacker, those who want to harm our IC can uh, introduce some malicious inclusion in the IC during the development stage. And I, that malicious inclusion can affect the IC during the application execution and IC can be utilized for different uh, purposes like in uh, like recently machine learning hardware or automated hardware we are going for designing automated hardware for different applications so in these hardware if inclusion in malicious inclusion is there then that malicious inclusion is very difficult to uh, detect during the testing as it will be inserted or it will be included by the attacker very smartly so it is very difficult to detect these hard, uh, trojans or malicious inclusion during the testing so that malicious inclusion activate or uh, or uh, trigger and very rare conditions so when it will trigger it will we have uh, undesirable behavior uh, during the execution so an attacker can insert for different purpose that or attacker can utilize that malicious inclusion for different purpose like he can just activate the uh, malicious inclusion uh, for trigger some unwanted activity during the uh, execution. Like in the uh, in uh, recently, like automated hardware, we are going for designing. In these automated hardware, if there is an atrocity, then it is most most difficult. As uh, like hardware I design, we are we are designing for uh, mass deep learning models, machine learning models. So suppose we are uh, designed a models or a machine learning model for a phase detection suppose that hardware or malicious inclusion is activated for a specific entity or a specific phase and then for that time if we have uh, detecting or classifying that phase as a genuine phase or a, or a, a non-genuine phase then in that case is suppose for that input data if hardware trojan is activated and then in that case, that ungenuine or unauthorized phase will be uh, considered as an authorized phase. So it will cause a very serious problem uh, if we are using that uh, hardware uh, for uh, sensitive applications like uh, defense or surveillance systems. Like so, this is a very uh, serious problem. So we can consider it as a uh, one problem to detect a malicious inclusion so that we can design a secure hardware. Another problem like other piracy overbuilding if uh, IC industries are designing uh, electronic ICs, but uh, they are afraid from pirating their ICs. So in order to prevent these the different uh, methods we can utilize, but still there is a lot of challenge to prevent the piracy. So there are another open problems in this area that uh, we can also go for these problems from my side. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Vijaypal. So I think uh, we have uh, got a fair round of uh, comments. So if I summarize, uh, I think uh, we what we discussed was, you know, like the promise of artificial intelligence in terms of improving on security, like particularly hardware security. Uh, we discussed about the fact that uh, since we are understanding the physics better, our IoT solutions are getting more fortified by the usage of hardware security principles which is a very promising aspect because we know that IoT devices are going to be there around us and, you know, like we need to kind of ensure that they don't open up, uh, you know, like catastrophic attack surfaces. And uh, along with it, we also had a discussion about uh, piracy or in general trust in hardware security devices. 
so i would like to kind of uh, you know like um, just uh, you know like maybe uh, think aloud about a uh, about the fact that uh, while we are you know like uh, we are we are basically looking at different technology solutions like for example artificial intelligence is a i would say like uh, is a technology solution which we are trying to kind of adopt for hardware security so like this there may be you know like other technological uh, advancements that are also happening around us like for instance maybe blockchains right which is also another area of research which is very popular right so what do you think you know like uh, are you know like other uh, technological advancements which probably have a very strong cross cut with hardware security so any comments on that uh, maybe i can uh, start with a comment so so that is that's actually a, a like a, a good point uh, I, actually i would like to uh, give like the other uh, others uh, point point of view on this so we can always see new technologies helping hardware security but but we we, we can also see like how these new technologies are also uh, vulnerable to the same problems so so for example i i like uh, for for the long time hardware security has been associated for example with only uh, targeting cryptographic applications so where where the target was always to find the key but uh, like if, if we look uh, of uh, at the set of works which were done in the last 5 7 years you could see that okay that is not the case you uh, when you are running different applications on uh, on 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 a given given piece of hardware like the same techniques can be can be adapted to, to different means so there have been cases where 3d printers are vulnerable to the same side chain attack which which you would attack to a, on a on a cryptographic algorithm as you were uh, just mentioning about blockchain now blockchain uh, if, if we see majority of the blockchain uh, applications are still running in software but there is also a market of crypt cryptographic wallet which is especially designed to actually secure these uh, these blockchain transactions because of their uh, high value of money right and mm -hmm. uh, but even those wallets uh, since they are they're running on the same principles have are are, are also vulnerable in that sense mm -hmm. and uh, same applies to running machine learning models on a mm -hmm. uh, on a given piece of hardware so right. um, like Although uh, with this new technology, we see new security perspective coming in, we see new technology coming in, but we are also against um, a moving target where the where the adversary is also adapting itself, is not playing with the same problem, but also evolving and targeting something new and more meaningful that is out there in the market, for example. Right. Uh, I mean, I think Shivam, you made a very good point that I mean, when we when we like in hardware security, you know, like I think if I say you know like Paul Kocha's work was one of the starting points in academic uh, you know like endeavors on hardware security, uh, then I think we have come quite a bit and we have unearthed several attack surfaces and we have also understood how do you counter them. We should not probably make the same mistakes in other evolving technologies like blockchains or something which where where crypto is applied and also implemented, right? So I think uh, in the same context, right, I would also like to kind of ask maybe uh, Stefan would be the best person to comment on that, like because he has been working on AI and applications of AI on hardware security. So I think AI can also be a boon and a bane, right? I mean, essentially it can be both. So you mentioned about like AI, uh, you know, like being applied in the context of hardware security, but it's at the same time like AI also like fragile, right? Because of several uh, things like adversarial attacks and so on, actually. So, what do you do you, uh, you like to comment on this aspect, uh, particularly with respect to hardware security of aspect? Yeah, uh, thanks. Uh, I think it's 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 a very difficult uh, perspective. Also, even connecting to blockchain from before and everything, because there there are multiple opinions, multiple perspectives we need to consider. You know, one is academic perspective. From the academic perspective, we will not always do something that makes sense for industry, but is interesting for research. The same will happen with industry. Many times they will not do something that we consider to be a reasonable move because they are also seeing it from, from different perspectives, from marketing, from selling perspectives. And this, this is the same what we see with AI. Indeed, it is, it is great tool, but first problem is 
uh, it's not a silver bullet. It will not solve all the problems. I mean, even now we are seeing, you know, we are just transitioning from one problem to another problem. Before Inside Channel, the biggest problem was to select the points of interest to do a successful attack. Now we are saying with, oh, with deep learning, we do not, we, we have easier job with, because we do not need to select points of interest, but we have much more job, much more work to do to find a good neural network to do the attack. So it's just, uh, let's say we are, we are not completely in a circle going, but we are going in, in some convoluted way towards the goal, which would be completely automated security evaluation approaches where we as the evaluators, we should really do nothing. Here is the target, everything from the algorithm, from the hyperparameters, from the uh, points of interest should be automatically decided by, by, by the algorithm, some meta learning algorithm itself. And of course, I mean, see, from the other side, since AI was not developed to be secure, or was not developed to include the countermeasures. At the moment, when we start talking about security of AI, that that is a huge domain because it's very difficult to expect something to be inherently resilient for things that was never meant to do. Adversarial examples. It's nothing special. It's just I mean, yeah, they are showing a small number of samples. And then you you do have a set exam, uh, example from some different region of samples. Of course, neural network doesn't know what to do with that. It's, it's I would be more surprised if neural network would know what to do with that. Mm -hmm. So it, it is in a in a very normal behavior. The bigger issue is how to patch all the things. You know, we had cryptographic algorithms. Then we didn't know how to. Patch. Then we learned all the things, masking, hiding, side channel countermeasures, fault injection countermeasures. Now we are going again to step one. How do we protect machine learning uh, against such attacks? Luckily, many things can be reused for crypto, but unfortunately, there is also need to do a lot of specific things. So it is, it is a long process, in my opinion, which for us as researchers is a good thing. So I agree. I, I mean, I think this also brings us to what uh, I think Shivam was also trying to mention that like hardware security, like when you talk about AI accelerators, for example, right? I mean, uh, you know, like um, um, like trying to kind of protect it, right? Was essentially not the uh, like, uh, like the initial objective, right? Of the AI designers or the AI implementers. But gradually, I guess people are also understanding that protecting the IP and also ensuring that the AI works as required is an important aspect, right? So this actually brings me to the what Vijay uh, Pal you were commenting, right? I mean, how do you really trust the AI? Actually, I think this is a million-dollar question, right? I mean, how do you really, really, you know, like you buy a commercial device which is essentially supposed to give you, you know, like maybe work in an, for an autonomous driving or something where which is kind of critical. So, what are your thoughts? You know, like you, you think that we should try to go ahead, you know, like in really ensuring the trust in the hardware piece which is supposed to be doing the AI. So uh, in the thank you, sir. Uh, in this case, actually, AI it is uh, very difficult due to uh, due to their uh, uh, training. Uh, when we are designing an AI model, we need to train that model for a particular data set, and then we are utilizing based uh, on the training. We are utilizing that model uh, for the application, but it will not. Uh, um, According uh, to the analysis or uh, or previous history, we can see that AI model, if we are utilizing that, we cannot guarantee it, that it will provide 100% accuracy for uh, our data set. So if suppose a mo model is trained for a malicious data even, mm -hmm. not if suppose we have not inserted any Trojan or design is fabricated securely, but suppose model is trained, then still it will not guarantee that model is correctly classifying our data or correctly providing uh, output or not because uh, no ai must or no machine learning model provide 100% accuracy so we cannot guarantee it that is there any malicious inclusion inside that ai model or not this is a bun uh, a, a problem so in order to solve this problem we need to focus on data set it means we need to first check a data set that it is correct or not. 
if model is trained with malicious data in that case model is also providing malicious output so first thing is that we have to focus on data analysis we have to apply some uh, algorithm and uh, the data analysis part where we can check a data is correct or not second thing in the fabrication part we need to focus uh, on the detection if uh, we can then one end we can assume that uh, our model is trained with correct data then there is if there is a chances of uh, insertion then we need to focus on detection of malicious inclusion or trojan inside the ic that we can focus by uh, some checking or some other uh, detection techniques or we can focus because normal detection technique that we have designed for uh, other ics i think uh, that are not possible for the ai based models because okay. uh, these uh, uh, ics are not deterministic they can provide a uh, non determinism output so that's why it is very difficult so we have to focus on a special kind of methods that can focus to detect these uh, malicious inclusion in the ai based devices yes okay, so you, you bring a very good point actually like i think what you are probably trying to say is that our verification methodologies right needs to be also adapted yes. so that uh, they are you know like uh, they, they are more tuned towards these new attack vectors right essentially yes. which we call uh, so uh, i mean this actually brings me to the fact that you know like i think verification or in general like all these aspects of hardware security also enhances the cost of our solutions right well when we talk about iot right. right we typically try to at the end of the day you know like give some iot products to the market which is essentially low cost right low so cost, yeah. what do you think and this is a question that i asked to like uh, maybe all of you actually and you know like i would also like to think aloud with you is that what should be our you know like approach as hardware security designers right to amortize the cost so that the cost of our solutions are eventually less with you know like at the end of the day we all know that security comes with a price so there will be a price but how do you lessen that price right i think that is an important thing that we also probably need to ponder about from, from my perspective I, I think we are included rather late in, in the stages so we are many times you know research is done on products or on things that are published uh, that are produced massively produced and then we do evaluation and we say well this or that of course always in things like that you have a higher cost because if if you find some problem you report it to the company but the company already has the product with it yep. so the proper way to to do it is either uh, offer or have direct collaborations with companies to help them in the design stage which is, can be also problematic because then somehow you work for a company or at least to do better job to offer uh, freely available tools frameworks that also people in companies can use to to evaluate at least on a on a let's say basic level the security against latest attacks because People in companies commonly do not have time to to check our latest research. Mm -hmm. Of course, I mean, even I mean, it's even difficult for researchers to check all the latest research. So mm -hmm. people in companies can do it much less. So we should also help them a bit, uh, try to provide an easier way for them to use our tools because it's also good for us in the end. Because if they start using it, that also gives us the verification that what we did is not good only for academic purpose but it's really useful real world application yep. right. i actually uh, agree with uh, stephen on that and uh, yeah like i think the, the way forward probably is to is to go by a security by design perspective mm -hmm. and we have uh, two well established examples of that that we have seen in the past so if, uh, so if i state uh, for example post quantum cryptography yep. so this yep. has started at a time when uh, when problems of hardware security have been quite known and the designers were have actually uh, taken uh, those consideration into their design and now we know that the compared to classical public cryptography post quantum cryptography have some affinity towards hardware security problems or, or hardware security solutions and this we, we didn't even see uh, like from the start, we, we, we some algorithms were, were, were actually supporting hardware security affinity, but 
uh, even during the design when this was reported it was a very interactive and a proactive process where uh, during from one round to another the algorithms were updated and uh, actually uh, came out to be stronger with every passing round and like now some of the finalists they are uh, at, at some level they are they're pretty strong and, and pretty uh, well steady uh, but th there are still f further investigation going on just to just to find the right candidate which can be an overall uh, winner in in this sense another example for this will be the the secure hardware or, or let's say the open source hardware with security that is risk 5 and uh, although risk 5 came few years ago but with open source and, and constant uh, sharing of of research and constantly updating we now have some very strong even some some solutions that are uh, cert, that, that were uh, winning competitions by uh, by darpa and, and and other such organizations which have uh, been now commercially available so i think uh, this uh, this paradigm is is the best way to actually if, if, if you want to save costs because as an afterthought it, it will always be be very costly because yep. uh, there, there is an aspect of viability when when we are uh, applying security afterthought solutions yeah i think both of you make very good point here i mean afterthought in security can be really really costly like we have seen in i would like to mention this you know like in particular about this uh, when this finding was made on the spectre and meltdown right and people knew that uh, i mean it was very obvious that those things are around us but security wise right this was a concern that was raised probably 20 years later right and and we all know that the impact of such kind of attacks is quite humongous right when it comes to processor design or in general architecture so and i i, I also think you know like the, that post quantum right essentially brings forth a great challenge in terms of you know, like, um, like, uh, you know, like updating our uh, security solutions. In particular, this is also quite encouraging to see that, you know, like uh, automotives and other various kind of vendors, right, are actually opening up to post quantum solutions in spite of the cost, right? I mean, we all know that post quantum comes with a heavy impact in terms of performance, but still people are, you know, like opening up uh, to such security solutions because I think gradually we are understanding that. Uh, that security bites, right? I mean, if there are security lapses, then, uh, then that is that is hard. That all of us have to pay for that. So, uh, so I think uh, uh, I, I would like to kind of, uh, you know, like open the open this floor also to the audience in general. At this point, I think we have around another 15 minutes. So, uh, if there are any like questions, then uh, please let us know. Uh, maybe uh, the chat would be a when you uh, a place to kind of put your questions or I don't know like you may probably also ask us uh, and feel free to ask us actually if there are any specific questions that you would like us to address. Uh, meanwhile, you know, like I would like to kind of go ahead with our discussion, uh, particularly like uh, uh, you know we had a we had a thought initially about that IOTs are get, IOT products are getting more secure, right? Essentially that's getting more difficult to attack probably you know like few years before uh, in particular this reminds me to the paper which talks about iot goes nuclear right where people showed that how some of these home automation lights can be subjected to power analysis for example or em analysis and recover the secret key and then do interesting attacks but what do you think you know like has really gone gone in between this period right because uh, we all know that the cost is a deterrent we cannot really have heavyweight solutions in this context, but we probably have also seen several uh, improvements in the hardware security literature, right, in terms of scientific achievements, right, for example, understanding better countermeasure designs and understanding, you know, like uh, better protections against power analysis, fault analysis, along with it also, you know, like developments in uh, hardware intrinsic solutions like PUFFs, for example, right. So those things, uh, do you think have helped us to Spotify the in general the security architecture of IoT products. Uh, any comments on that? Uh, for, Vijay, would you like to comment? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, uh, for IoT based uh, devices, 
uh, nowadays what is happening uh, people are designing um, complete model for uh, iot devices as a device where they can take a data from some and uh, field like uh, using sensors or some other you know? and then uh, they are uh, applying some uh, or they are embedding some model that can take some decision uh, based on the received data and then they can uh, and they can uh, some take uh, and take action on that based on uh, de- um, that data so in that case uh, we uh, required some uh, a uh, uh, small uh, uh, hardware as a lightweight solutions for that so if we are uh, using design based approaches in that case then it is uh, increasing the size of the device or may increase the cost of the device iot device so in that case we can focus on the i think uh, uh, for the uh, like uh, lightweight solutions uh, so where we can include lightweight security lightweight security solutions that can uh, lower the cost if we are going for design based approaches then we need to uh, focus like uh, small uh, changes in the design so that it will not affect uh, uh, gr- uh, cost in, in greatly or uh, second thing we can focus on the after fabrication part where we can verify the de- uh, device if with some uh, software based approaches then it will be i think uh, uh, good for uh, reducing the cost of the device or uh, designing the uh, lightweight solutions so most of the cases uh, i thought uh, to uh, design some verification or detection based technique uh, that can be utilized after the fabrication of the design or device what uh, i see we are embedding then we can focus on some verification matter after the fabrication but in the fabrication uh, it is very difficult as we are not having internal access of the device so it is very difficult or it is a, a ch- challenge for us to design an approach that can uh, validate our ic or that can validate for security uh, uh, for uh, that ic is secure or our devices or product is secure so we are i think uh, we need to focus on post fabrication approaches that may i think uh, lower the cost for iot yeah. based device so i think you are like trying to emphasize on the debug or you know like the post uh, fabrication yeah. test so, so we are actually tra- tra- yes yeah, so, uh, so actually, actually traditional approach is not uh, not uh, ba- uh, good or ba- uh, ba- valid for recent um, I, uh, devices or defense uh, recent technology that we are going for for that so in that case we need to focus on some different area we are a uh, different direction so that we can validate it like recently iot devices complete device that can also having some model inside it so in that case we, we are normal method we are applying then it is not good for detection that normal methods are just for detecting the ic for right. normal uh, input output operations that are not um, uh, may not be applicable for it and also like i think uh, it is interesting point that you raise actually i mean we want debug but at the same time people have seen how to use the debug for attacks also right so like people have yeah. done scan chain attacks and debug attacks yeah. which probably yeah. also emphasizes you know like dft for security like we are also pressing like yes. uh, pressing design for security right i mean design for security along yes. with it it is also important to emphasize on the like design for i would say testability for security that is also important like, yeah. how do you test your security hardware right in general i mean uh, shivam uh, for example you have been working on side channel attacks right for a long time so uh, do you think that you know like that has really been transpired to our existing solutions around us like in terms of security in terms of hardware security for example uh, right now i think we are we are quite far and and and, and it's a long way to go but at least uh, these are uh let's say uh, coming into consideration so i mean if if i state an example like now now we are moving towards uh standardization of of ai secure like security and privacy of ai and and these are i mean to my knowledge are like parallel efforts which is going on mm-hmm. by the uh, by the uh, us nist uh, from the eu body the mm-hmm. general iso body as well as uh, asian body so with these attacks and uh, with this standardization actually 
they are developing guidelines on how to deploy AI. Uh, and, and, and we can't actually box AI in that sense because AI has, AI, AI is, to my knowledge, one of the fastest uh, catching technologies. So it has mm -hmm. been adopted in in every domain currently uh, that I know of. You talk about healthcare, you talk about virus, you talk about uh, defense, you talk about even uh, general uh, uh, social media, everything, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, some use cases definitely might not be sensitive and we don't want to want to protect them. But then uh, when you need to protect them, definitely the designers, they need guidelines. And that is the, the sole purpose of these uh, standards that, that we are now developing and uh, basically it, it it is to give guidelines is like what to uh, what what are the basic sanity checks or, or, or the basic good practices to be taken when when we are looking at uh, securing these uh, these algorithms in the future uh, on hardware on software or or mm -hmm. different so like yeah, yeah these are different verticals which have to be uh, be individually handled Right. And I think uh, it has also like influenced, you know, like not only the embedded system uh, industry, but also in general processor designs. Like, for example, people are going for, you know, like different cache architectures, which can you know, like uh, help us to mitigate micro architecture attacks, which I think also has been one of the key contributions from the hardware security community. So uh, I think there are some interesting questions which are coming up. So I will quickly read a few of them. So there's a question which talks about like for an AI powered security solution, are there extended challenges to its adoption? Uh, so I think this question, maybe Stefan would be a good person to respond to that. Yeah. Um, you, we missed one first question, but uh, that one I also don't know. So I will just go straight to this one. I don't. Uh, I think this is this is very so the life of a trained model before industry decides to retrain a model it is almost impossible to to answer I mean to, uh, it it depends on the setup the life of a trained model will in my opinion should be reasonably long because we can always use it as some kind of baseline because one of the big issues is that we also don't know how to establish clear baselines in comparison. So longer term models, I think it's not a bad thing to have as long as people are aware that uh, it's state of the art can be already further away. And exactly know when, first of all, depends a lot on the industry. It uh, depends a lot on the, on the setup. So, you know, if, if you talk about, I don't know, hardware Trojans, just as a top. it seems to be, you know, the changes we also see in research are much slower than the changes we see in side channel attacks. The same for fault injection. We do not see so much happening all the time as for side channels. So some domains are also very much explored in, in research. And there we also, I would say also the ability to adapt to or to retrain a model is more crucial. But how, how long, I have no idea. Yeah. And I think, uh, uh, like, the first question, right, which was uh, on how to measure the near returns and cache misses rate to detect attack in memory and caches. So I think there are, like, as a suggestion, I can probably point to the performance counters or the monitoring units, which are there, like, for performance measurements. They are extreme, like, there are good... Uh, I would say like monitors for uh, not only like from the architectural point of view, but also from the security evaluation point of view. So people can probably try to see, and there are many papers, research papers that have been developed. So finally, there is one question uh, which talks about uh, there are more dangerous exploits uh, out there that are available to the public, raising questions on the data set used to train AI powered solutions. So any, uh, so I think the question says that if you are an organization providing AI powered solutions to other industrial clients, then I think uh, the question is how do you like answer the client's concerns? That's probably the main quest idea of the question. So you need to take yeah, on I that. 
So this is uh, quite an interesting question, actually. Like uh, the the market, or, or or let's say the the reach of these uh, unknown bugs, or or also uh, zero day bugs, are uh, or or exploits are, are is quite huge, actually. And it is not only used by the by the actors, but also like it is to to an extent also used by the law, law enforcement agencies. And uh, all together, uh, they they do uh, raise a, a lot of concern. And uh, I think, like, uh, uh, like I, I would go back to the point which uh, Professor Vijapal made earlier that I think verification or or, or trust on 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 basically post uh, running of your model is, is probably like like something which can which can definitely help where where you can give proofs and and uh, an assurance of, uh, of 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 your model has passed. A certain list of sanity checks, which are let's say uh, recommended by a by a set of experts or a, or, a, or a set of certification bodies, and that can probably uh, pro probably be a way to to assure your clients that what 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 you are doing is 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 actually uh, like the like the best practice in that sense. Professor Vijayal, if you like to add something. Yeah, on the data set part, just uh, actually. Uh in the security problems that i already told that uh, data set is a very critical things in the ai based models as if data set data set having some uh, in uh, unwanted data or some um, uh, intentionally malicious uh, malicious included data so that data set can train a model uh, some for uh, some unwanted uh, operations so that unwanted operation or that operation can change the behavior of the model or that can predict the false and that can provide false prediction during the execution so it is very important to validate the data set before training a model currently nowadays what is happening people are using pretend model as if you are designing a hardware based on the pretend model, that is a very, very serious concern. As we cannot trust on that uh, pretend model as how these models are trained or on which data set they are, uh, these models are trained. If they're designing directly hardware for these models, then uh, we cannot assure or we cannot assure that models are correctly designed. Mm -hmm. So it is uh, a big challenge to, uh, to verify the data or to design a model for uh, AIV solutions. So I think we are running out of time. So just to quickly wrap up, I think we are very interesting discussion on like the opportunities and challenges at the frontier ends of hardware security. And uh, I would like to say that uh, the challenges are nice because that keeps us active, right? So it's good that, uh, and, and also like we can see that there is a definite impact of hardware security on improving the overall security for several emerging technology. So I would like to end with that note and say my warm thank you to all the panelists for their comments and also to the audience for like being along with us and asking nice questions. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, uh, Professor Mukhopadhyay. And uh, I'd also like to thank all of our panelists, Dr. Shivam Basin, Professor Vijay Pal Singh Rathor, and Dr. S. Pisek uh, from uh, the Netherlands for sharing with us uh, your insights on hardware securities frontier research use cases and ideas. That was our session, which has now come to an end. And uh, with that, we'll now move on to our next session, which is also, once again, a track session. And uh, we have a panel discussion. Um, here as well on distributed security model, why that matters now. And simultaneously, we have another session going on uh, in uh, another auditorium, which is called a stage one on security and scale, volume and velocity in cloud to be moderated by Professor Satim uh, um, Kumar. And uh, 
uh, I'm sorry, Professor Satish Kumar. And uh, you may refer to the schedule on the top. Uh, there is a top icon on your screen, uh, the schedule, and you may refer to that and uh, choose the session that you would like to be a part of. And for now, in this particular auditorium, we are going to start our uh, next session on distributed security model, why that matters now, to be moderated by uh, Floyd De Costa, founder of uh, Block Armor. And also joining us for this session are uh, Professor uh, Anvita Mandatta, Associate Professor, Distributed Security Research Interest at NTU Singapore, Dr. Surya Nepal, uh, Group Leader and Senior Principal Research Scientist, Distributed System Security, CSIRO Australia, and Dr. Pradeep KV, Assistant Professor, C.R. Rao, Advanced Institute of Mathematics, Statistics and Computer Science and University of uh, Hyderabad campus. So once again, a distinguished uh, panel here uh, to talk to us about the distributed security model. And without wasting any time, I'll hand it over to the session moderator, uh, Floyd DeCosta, to take it forward from here. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Samridhi. And uh, welcome everybody to the session. Uh, we uh, we have a very exciting topic and, 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 and the whole uh, view of, of, of the shift towards uh, distributed security models and things like that. But, not, but even more exciting than that is the panel here. Yeah. An international panel, uh, you know, we, we have uh, researchers from uh, Sydney in Australia, from Singapore, as well as from Hyderabad in India. But uh, before we get there, I wanted to take a couple of minutes, before I hand over to the esteemed panel, uh, bring in the esteemed panelists, I just wanted to, to do a quick introduction and talk a, a little bit about where we are today, right? Just to set context. Uh, for starters, my name is Floyd DeCosta, and I'm the co-founder of Block Armor. Block Armor is a Singapore and Mumbai-based uh, cybersecurity venture that was accelerated by Airbus and uh, featured as one of the top 25 innovations in cybersecurity by Accenture. Uh, we deliver zero trust cybersecurity for enterprise cloud and IoT. But moving on to what we are discussing today and distributed security and why the topic is so interesting. I guess today, if we look at a, the very broad, uh, you know, the, the 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 environment today, I guess there are three key trends that we see. Number one is the is you know is the shift to cloud computing, or the rapid adoption of cloud computing, and a lot of it accelerate, uh, you know, uh, driven by accelerated digital transformation programs, both in government and in uh, private organizations today. So that's number one. Number two is the proliferation of billions of IoT devices. Everything from simple connected uh, Bluetooth connected toothbrushes to uh, connected cars and all sorts of other devices within the space. And then of course the whole IIoT space and industry 4.0 that's exploding. And number three is now the remote work environment with numerous employees, users working from home. Uh, on the back of the COVID-19 lockdowns that have recently happened over the last year to year and a half. And what this has now resulted in is a highly distributed and hybrid uh, enterprise IT environment. If you imagine an enterprise or any organization at the center, you had a lot of the data on one side that sat within data center or sat within the enterprise. Now this is moving and is distributed in the cloud, hybrid cloud models, uh, multi-cloud models. On the other side, you had employees and users sitting within the office, and now they are sitting all, uh, you know, all over the place because of this new work uh, workforce of the future model that we have with working from all over the place. And now you have this highly distributed and hybrid environment, like I mentioned. The challenge is due to uh, a lot of uh, businesses, both enterprises, uh, private enterprises, as well as uh, public organizations, are still using traditional tools and technologies to secure this distributed work for, uh, you know, this, this work environment, this highly digital environment. And that's where the challenge kicks in. Traditional tools and approaches no longer make the cut. And that is where you're seeing the number of cyber attacks going up, the number of breaches going up. Not a single day goes by where you don't hear about at least a dozen major breaches in the news. And that's where we need to look at what are modern approaches, what are modern tools and technologies that we can leverage. How do we have distributed security models to secure this highly distributed and hybrid uh, IT environment, IT ecosystems that we operate in? And with that, let me hand over to my panelists. Uh, let's start with uh, Dr. Uh, Pradeepthi. Uh, if you could do a brief introduction about yourself, you know, 
the the wonderful work you're doing within the uh, you know within distributed security and then share a bit about you know, uh, you know just just an overview of the topic right from your point uh, good morning good afternoon everyone uh, thank you so much for the opportunity uh, i have uh, a, i'm working in crr advanced institute for mathematics statistics and computer science and uh, in our institute we take up r and d projects and we also uh, take up mtech courses for information security and i am part of those r and d projects and i also take up some mtech courses as well uh, earlier i was part of the industry where for four years i worked uh, in uh, infosys technologies and uh, right now uh, due to an inclination towards r and d i have moved towards uh, this side so that's about me and uh, current i uh, generally work in the areas of uh, intrusion detection systems and uh, i try to incorporate into security um, i am I'm working on network security a couple of projects and uh, mobile security as well as uh, cyber also like i said intrusion detection systems kind and i try to incorporate ai and uh, machine learning in those areas so this is what i'm currently working on um so uh, this uh, topic about a uh, distributed security model i found it very interesting because we are trying to uh, establish uh, trustworthiness into each and every component in this uh, distributed environment like uh, floyd was already mentioning about how we are up to work currently now in this distributed environment where we have trusted users uh, trusted servers trusted administrators but uh, untrusted clients untrusted communication media and intermediary uh, systems so um, it is a topic which uh, i'm happy that dsci has given us this opportunity to debate upon and share our views on this topic thank you thank you pradeep and then and, and again interesting to note and, and and probably most of us have this where we come from some part of enterprise and now the whole research and development and 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 on the on, on the side of innovation i guess that's also the key right because you've got a lot of commercialization of technology but now you need models that require that in that uh, study and analysis you know the research and the innovation part that needs to deliver these new models toria let me bring you on next how about you share a bit about yourself you know uh, what you working on the interesting stuff you working on these days and 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 and, and then tie that in with the whole uh, distributed security uh, system that we talking about thank you flirt uh, and thank you for the opportunity and let me first introduce myself and i am surya nepal i am a senior Re principal research scientist at csiro australia and if you are not familiar familiar with csiro csiro stands for or uh, stands for commonwealth scientific and industrial research organization so it's a federal government agency in australia and we do research in all sort of fields basically from land water and biology to mining and you name it and i, I think csro is there everywhere and and probably you may have uh, touched some of the csro technologies and one of them is wi-fi wi-fi is invented by csro and, uh, and now we are using that for our conference as well so and the total in csro data 61 is the digital arm so we do research within data 61 in different aspects which is basically data analytics machine learning and cyber security and then the robotics so they are the kind of like where we are very strong and i lead the cyber security activities within the csro so i have a group of around 90 staff around 30 researchers and around 50 phd students associated with uh, Australian universities. So I also work uh, currently seconded into the cybersecurity research center, which is like uh, I, I'm working as, as a deputy research director. The cybersecurity research center is a federal government established uh, uh, cybersecurity focus, uh, uh, a kind of uh, collaborative institutes, and it has around 100 plus million dollar funding for seven years. We have around seven research institutions and uh, like 20, 30 plus uh, government agencies and industry partners. So we do a lot of research activities. So within my focus area now, I my focus area within the group is basically looking at the AI and cybersecurity. I think like how I, I, I do say that it is AI and cybersecurity. It is basically applying AI in cybersecurity as well as looking at the security of AI systems. So it's kind of both. So, 
And the other area I look at is, is the human-centric security. So probably some of the things people are, are not paying attention is like how human intelligence can be used for cybersecurity. So probably I touch a little bit that one. And then the third area I'm uh, looking, we are looking at is the IoT and cloud security, which are kind of distributed systems. And the fourth area we are looking at is the quantum security. So emerging quantum technology and the, how, what's the implication on the security or how you can use the quantum in developing the secure systems. So that that are the main focus area. Now looking at the distributed systems, as I think uh, Fluid has very nicely outlined the problems space. I think the traditional perimeter based defense is no longer valid. And as you know that IoT and bring your own devices and we are all working remotely from home, that brings a lot of challenges into the uh, distributed systems. And they are all beyond the perimeter defense, right? And on the other side, if you look at the OT system that I, IT and OT convergence is happening now, and then now those OT people who used to go and work in a confined environment are now working remotely, right? So that brings to another distributed security challenge. And, and as, this, as Fleur said, there is a private and public cloud, and I think there's a heterogeneous environment that brings the another, uh, another challenges, but also the new concept, emerging concept, which is zero trust architecture, right? So you, wanted to, you don't want to trust anything. That brings the whole set of new challenges, like how do you build the zero trust architecture within your environment? And that probably is the sum of the challenges, but at the end, I will say that it is not all assets are equal. And if you try to protect all assets in a distributed environment, you run into the complexities. So I think probably you need to choose the which which are the things you want to protect and which are the valuable assets. That's the kind of what I say I see the major challenges coming from the distributed system security. I think that's the a bit long introduction and my view on the <laughs> distributed system security. So uh, hand over no. to you, Fred. Thank you, Surya. No, but that is really interesting. If you look at uh, the situation today, where you talk about you know the perimeter's gone and now you've got all uh, devices, and yes, zero trust is becoming the preferred uh, approach to cybersecurity. But the challenge, and I was having a very interesting uh, conversation with a large enterprise and uh, they're in the telco space, and the challenge is how do you even know? How do you even recognize what's within the uh, what's within your network or what's accessing? Earlier on, you could have, when you had the moat and castle approach, you could actually put that perimeter around and everything inside is trusted. Everything in outside has to be verified and doubly checked. With the perimeter gone, first, I guess the first step is to even identify, right? What is, uh, you know, what are these devices? What are your assets and which devices are connecting to which assets? And I think there, yes, you're right. You now have zero trust, which is becoming the preferred security paradigm. You had uh, President Joe Biden explicitly line outline uh, zero trust, which all U.S. federal and state government departments as well as agencies need to start looking at. You know, to, uh, from, from, from a cyber modern mod cyber security modernization perspective. But there's even something interesting. Exactly three weeks ago, Singapore put its uh, 2021 cyber security strategy, uh, uh, you know, out, and it clearly defines a zero trust approach which is how do you protect, especially when you go towards the smart city, the smart nation approach, connected devices, public utilities, all sorts of systems within a certain network, right? Within this open network now, how do you uh, secure this? And, and, and so it's great to see that even Singapore is starting to take that approach now. And that's where I want to bring in uh, Unwitran. Uh, you know, share a little bit. And, and again, uh, it's, you know, uh, it's wonderful that you're sharing this lovely uh, evening here in Singapore with me, so we can always talk about that. But over to you, Anand. Share a bit about yourself, okay. the Thank interesting you. stuff that you're working on, and of course, uh, from a perspective of experience models. Yeah. Um, first of all, thanks to the organizers for having me here today. It's a great pleasure to participate and be part of this illustrious panel. Um, um, of course, the problem with going last is that probably all the things I have to say are already said, um, but I already had them to say. So if the slides work, at least I will provide a proof of um, the fact that uh, this is not just me taking off what have been said, but I already thought of it as that's one of the problems 
we do not often have too many original ideas, um, but in this space for competing ideas and stuff, what do I do? I've been doing distributed systems for a long time, security for a long time. I didn't particularly think um, when, when I was asked to talk about distributed security model, why that matters now, I was like, why that matters now indeed, because I thought it always mattered um, somehow. It's not a new problem per se, uh, in my opinion. Uh, we have been uh, working on distributed security for a long time. And there has always been also a bunch of tensions that have been around going back and forth. Sometimes uh, there is too much of centralization. Sometimes there is a quite a bit of distribution. There is a back and forth between these tensions. And then there is also the aspect of decentralization no one really talked about so far. And maybe we'll leave it for the discussions later on. But finally, um, I mean, so what I want to say here is distribution goes kind of hand in hand with a lot of centralized elements. And that's the part I would like to emphasize later. But before that, I'll try to take a step back. And since I said I have been working on distributed systems forever, uh, in that forever in my academic life, that is. When I was a PhD student and I was very excited to say to somebody, I work on distributed systems and they said, but isn't that very complex? Um, why would you bother to work on distributed systems? Um, things are complex. They, it's much more prone to failures and problems. Why bother about it? And when I contemplated about it, I realized that we do not necessarily love distributed systems because they are cool. They are, and I love it for that. But also the fact that we do not have an option. Distribution is not a choice, but more an imperative. And we see that um, now in all kinds of things as have been told, uh, iterated by all the previous panelists and the moderator, we, we see this distribution manifested in the form of uh, multiple clouds being used um, where, the, where you are basically using um, offshoring the data and the processes to third parties. You see it in the proliferation of IOTs. You see it in the approach of work from home that we are seeing all across the world. Uh, I work, of course, at NQ, but I also work with a company, which is a fintech company, one day a week. And this company, well, the headquarters is in Ireland, but there are people in South Africa, Italy, Sacramento, Singapore, Ireland, UK, uh, and few other places. Now we are hiring people from wherever it's possible without even having to worry about how to relocate them to the headquarter or in one of the centralized offices. We are just saying, okay, you are in Poland, you can continue to work from Poland and um, that's it because we are so distributed. Anyway, it doesn't matter where you are working from. The only problem is uh, managing the time zones, of course. But as a consequence, what we see is that perimeter-based security is dead. Um, but at the same time, actually, the instinct for us is always to think of perimeters. And if we think about this instinctive way of looking at security, we need to see that the perimeter, basically the physical perimeters have changed. Uh, what is the new perimeter is basically identity. And when we can tie everything to identity, be it the human beings, be it the machines and so on, then we can start rethinking again in terms of perimeter-based security. Just that now we'll talk about identities, what are the you know, access rights these identities would have, what kind of roles they play in the overall system. This is the way we need to start thinking about. And therein somehow creeps in several layers of centralization through the back door. First of all, um, unlike back in the days where security was mainly something which was um, being thought of by the people who are specializing in IT, now security is one of the main topics which has crept in, crept in into the C-suit or the boardroom. The people, the chief something in the organization cannot 
just say that, well, security, IT team, deal with it. They do have to think about it because cybersecurity has become such an essential enabler, but also an Achilles heel when it comes to every business process and business mission. So cybersecurity is now in the boardroom. That means there is a whole centralized over, um, supervision uh, and the general direction has to be decided from up there. Likewise, um, back in the days, we would use a lot of ad hoc solutions for each individual business process, each individual functionality, and so on. But gradually, we see in many organizations, there is a gravitation towards the use of a couple of cloud platforms, each of which carry out many different tasks together. So as much as we are trying to support a lot of distributed processes, a lot of distribution in terms of the number of um, entities interacting and so on, there is also a consolidation in terms of the services we are using, including in terms of security tools. There used to be 50, 60 different um, tools that were being used. The tendency now is to use a few services which can do more of the things together. So there is a lot of vendor consolidation as well. Um, well, yeah, so maybe zero trust has been talked about. I already talked about identity as a parameter. So maybe I give back um, the forum to all the other panelists without taking too much more time. And we can revisit some of these ideas as and when the discussions take us there. Floyd, maybe you want to take over? Thank you, Anvitaman. And that is, you know, you, you touched on a very interesting point there, right? Now that the perimeter is gone, but there's always a perimeter, you've got assets and now you need to secure the assets. How do you identify them and how do you secure it, correct? You're right, identity is now the new perimeter. But when identity becomes the new perimeter, you can't have identity centralized, correct? And this is where now folks are starting to look at how do you have decentralized identity? You can't have uh, you know, uh, a distributed ecosystem with people and uh, devices, connected devices all over the place and the identity centralized, correct? And I think that's now where you see a lot of folks looking at modern technologies like blockchain and distributed ledgers. Uh, from a broader perspective to explore how can you have, uh, you know, distributed identity. Identity. Also with the shift to more digital based system, how can you leverage, take this one step higher and look at digital identity, right? Now, Pradipi, I know you've been focused, uh, you've been doing some work on, on, on blockchain technology and things like that. What is your, you know, you know, can you share some insights on this and how you look at, you know, what might be an opportunity to do you know, not just digital identity, but then of course extend that to, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, secure, uh, you know, uh, identity, like uh, Anvitaman said, identity as the new perimeter and cyber security around that. Distributed systems with distributed ledger technology and things like that. Yes, uh, actually uh, we have been studying a little bit about uh, the various, how the emerging technologies like uh, all the eminent other eminent speakers like Dr. Surya and Dr. Anvitaman were telling how emerging technologies are affecting uh, the uh, distributed security model. So a little bit, I, I'm definitely a novice compared to the other speakers, but just like to share my thoughts on that, that uh, uh, the blockchain technology definitely is a very good case study for distributed security model as all of us already agree. So here, uh, because of it has these unique, uh, uh, it has these unique features like it allows you to have uh, these ledger based systems and all and uh, there are these concepts in blockchain like it allows us to make it permissionless blockchains or permissioned blockchains and uh, the public private and all these other kinds of entities that are there in the blockchain it becomes the ideal case study for uh, implementing distributed uh, nature and of course like the uh, uh, the ledger based scheme that it works on the, the actual uh, science behind the blockchain is totally suited for being an ideal candidate for a distributed uh, blockchain kind of an environment. So uh, we are uh, actually trying to see in how 
uh, it can enable the participants over a distributed network to work in a decentralized way and where there is no single point of failure and the single users of course is never able to change any of these records so uh, there are different critical security aspects in blockchain technology which have to be addressed so we are looking at certain aspects like uh, in uh, how we can incorporate blockchain in cyber security in prevention of cyber attacks and fraud like by looking at uh, the uh, stolen uh, keys kind of scenarios or code exploitation uh, that can uh, that is uh, some of the famous case studies that have happened so these kind of things we have been looking at and even fraudsters we can see have been using blockchain technology for uh, performing phishing attacks routing attacks and many of these mining based attacks are also being reported so uh, we have been studying a little bit in those areas. Fantastic, and 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 no, I I, I definitely uh, uh, you know I'm gonna save my comments for the last, but we definitely think that uh, you know uh, blockchain, a digitally native uh, platform, right, can truly deliver uh, you know uh, next generation security systems, especially when you're talking about whole lot of unmanned devices and things like that that need to have digital identity, that need to have an identity beyond the person that's manning it. So these are devices which connect into the system either periodically or are connect, uh, completely connected. And then when you take that, then when you look at how 5G is uh, you know, changing the whole space with connected devices and bring, bringing billions of devices into the ecosystem, yes, when you're talking about smart cities or smart factories and the whole industry 4.0 space, I think it completely, uh, you know, it, 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 it completely throws traditional tools out of the window there. But at this point, let me ask Surya. Surya, you know, you also working on things like in addition to blockchain, but also things like artificial intelligence, right? And bringing the human centric approach, the human thinking, trying to get these systems to get, you know, to be Again, artificial intelligence right down the center there, but also, uh, you know, looking at uh, other, uh, you know, other tools, other platforms that can be used at cybersecurity. What is your view on this and how can some of these modern approaches, you know, aid this new perimeter-less uh, world we live in today, right? How do organizations, private and public, start to secure these new perimeter-less uh, uh, IT environments that have evolved, that we've evolved into? Yeah, I think uh, just to follow on with the previous speaker, like uh, yeah, blockchain is the really a technology which provides the distributed trust. And then the question is, can we use the same distributed trust model to build the identity, right? So that's the kind of things. Currently, I think uh, some of the thinking that we have been thinking about is like rather than the traditional blockchain, which is like a uh, a Bitcoin or the contract, I think the new concept is coming as is coming up is the NFT, which is non fungible tokens, right? So you know that can this non fungible token could be equivalent to your identity? Can you think of this as identity? And that's the kind of bigger question I want to I want to pose as a bigger question. And can we use that as a, your digital identity or some form of similar kind of concept to build the distributed uh, uh, security model where the identity is digital and you have local control of it and you know your identity nobody manages that identity you manage it basically right you want the, your identity you manage the identity and other people will manage the mostly the authorization right and the authentication is your hand basically right so let the other Correct. people manage the authorization. I know how to authenticate myself. So, and if we enlarge that concept to the whole IoT devices and robotics, everything, that's where I see the probably future going, but may not be the NFT, but similar kind of concept where you and me, everybody has our own identity and we carry on, carry with that. And it just the enterprise provides the, the uh, authorization. The access, uh, yeah, the authorization and access control, right? Yeah, authorization and access control and where the identity is managed by myself or yourself, right, as an individual person. That's right, I think, where things are going. Now, let me talk, uh, let me think about the AI part also a little bit, right? So, if you look at the 
identity and access control in the AI part. Now, what's happening is like the most of the times, if you look at the current enterprises, they are really good at enrolling the uh, staff, basically. When they enroll it, then it, they, they do all the check, everything, and then give you the access. But most of the times, IT people are giving access to the, the employee is like the the, whatever they ask for, right? Everybody asks for, I need the most privilege, right? That's what I think. If you go to any enterprise, you try to see that, oh, I don't, I can't work without this. I can't work without this. So you try to assess everything, right? But what is the minimum re required assess for a person to do their job is, is still not well defined, right? So it's kind of like, uh, if you go to, even, even your role is changing within a one organization and I've been in CSRO for 21 years now and I have so many role I change and all those assets I had in any role is still I have with me. <laughs> so nobody, nobody would, would run that asset, right. you know, that is like <laughs> once it is given, it is your privilege, right? Exactly. So the way I see the AI or big data analytics playing the role is what is the, if, can you look at the role, I, whether it's a, a business role or IT role. I, there is a distinction between business role and IT role. So IT may have a different role, but the business role is changing even faster, right? Every day you get a new title, right? <laughs> and the companies are changing title every time. So business role and IT role also, it's kind of growing. And how do we use the AI or big data analytics so that going through the uh, organization log, or the business role and IT role, uh, you can find out the minimum set of access control that is needed for a staff to do their job without having any hindrance. So if you can do the AI, apply the AI in that way, then the AI is beneficial, right? Correct. So the other 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 thinking like currently, if you have probably that's the MasterCard has done a very good one. That's a good example, which is people are referring to. Say in the few years back, if I move or uh, travel from Sydney to uh, Singapore, I have to call my bank saying that I'm traveling Singapore. Can you please may, may enable my MasterCard kind of credit card so that I can do purchase or I can use it in Singapore, right? That's you have to call your bank and let let them know. Otherwise, they will just uh, stop your transaction immediately in when you are doing something in Singapore. But now what's happening is like it is not about card like the now with the card there are a lot of things moving right it's not about card let's like say for example if you use your mobile phone to purchase if you use your apple pay using the card then probably card is stolen but not your phone if the phone is moving to singapore that means you are moving to singapore also so you can derive a lot of instead of finding the anomalies you can derive you can do the opposite way you can do the assertion saying that find out all the positive things you can find out rather than thinking oh this is this is an alert, so it is a, it is a, there is potentially cyber attacks. Rather than mm. establish the positive assertion, saying that look, this is the affirmation. If you can give a lot of affirmation, probably you can do the security much better without having the impact on the human, right? It's a kind of like usable security. You look at from the human point of view. I right? think secure, but still it is very much from the human centric aspect. So that's where I see the AI is a much value, value rather than just finding the kind of anomalies, right? So anomalies, in, it, it's, it's, a, it's done. I think it's, it's not that much useful, but if we use the AI in the other way around, that that has a much more valuable in terms of uh, providing the uh, access control or identity management or the access control in the, the enterprise system. So that's the kind of what I see. Very interesting, Surya. And I, 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 you know, when you talk, when you give the examples, the quoted the examples about uh, using a, a payment system like Apple Pay and then your credit card attached to that and where you're moving and all, it brings me to a very important point, which Anvitraman, it's coming your way. But uh, before that, it's interesting that you mention NFTs and things like that when you're using blockchain. So currently, uh, just a plug here, but we at Blockama, what we do is we use blockchain uh, uh, based digital signatures for all users and devices, right? So we have digital identity, which is based on the blockchain. And that's why we use the private public key pair of the blockchain. When you're talking about NFTs, these are usually smart contracts. 
might be an opportunity to use a smart contract tool, but can we still play with the public private key pair and then deliver that sense of digital identity uh, and uh, for all users and devices and then also for all uh, the, uh, the enterprise assets or the IT assets to which these connect. And then you just maintain, like you rightly said, uh, the policy engine that manages who has access to what and then use AI at some point in time to identify what the user's role is and it has it shifted to automatically shift and adjust those policies, the authorization and the access policy. And uh, that's one thing we've been working on and that's what we offer our customers today. But I'll stop there because one of the interesting topics which you said is about the authorization, for example, the credit card, right? And there are two things here. One is, of course, the digital identity and the security around that. But there's a second part which plays, which, which is quite critical. Mr. Bikasa, <laughs> coming in between here, like we have another minute and a half left, so time for all of us to wrap up this session. Sure. <laughs> I'll just go to Anvitaman to quickly touch upon one topic somebody and then he can come, which is the whole conflict between security and then the privacy aspect, right? How much data goes out there? Now, if I'm in Singapore and I'm swiping my card in Singapore, who all need to know that I'm in Singapore? If I'm an, if if I'm usually living in Sydney, right, and that's where you have that conflict. And with the man, we just have about a minute. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, all right. So yes. Um, so I'll try to um, get to the point. I think uh, one of the thing uh, is indeed that this decentralization and identity um, creates also an opportunity that we do not need to use the same identity. So there was one side which is how much access to which resources you need to yeah. get your job done. Yeah. Complementing that is how much of the identity information do you need to give access to which resources. And there is this great opportunity, particularly using a decentralized kind of a platform to not use the same identity for everything, but only bits and pieces of it as per the requirement. Now, how do we separate these bits and pieces sufficiently that you cannot do in it. you can use it for functionality and yet not gather a whole view of an individual's activity is definitely an interesting challenge and time is up Perfect. rather uh, the time starts now to go back to do those work yeah, uh, I, and, and I'm sure somebody is going to come back at some point in time. But uh, no, thanks a lot, guys. This has definitely been, uh, you know, uh, an, an exciting conversation on a very, very exciting uh, topic here. And wonderful insights. There's glad, uh, you know, I'm glad to see the research and development and the thinking that's going, be, uh, you know, into having distributed cybersecurity system to secure, you know, today's modern hybrid and distributed digital IT environments that we are faced with. Uh, special thanks to the, uh, the national COE, DSCI, and uh, the and, and METI for setting up this, uh, this forum, sorry, and the conference 20, uh, 2021 conference and the opportunity to discuss this very exciting topic. Uh, and thanks to everybody, of course, for uh, you know uh, attending and being here. It's been a privilege and an opportunity with this panel to share our insights on this very very exciting topic. Uh, Samridhi. Uh, okay, bye. Bye. Thank you. Do we have any?
Okay, so well, thank you everyone. And uh, with that, we conclude uh, this session uh, on distributed security model, why that matters now. I'd like to thank the entire team, uh, Floyd DaCosta, for being such a flawless moderator. Thank you. We had no intentions to scare you away, but definitely thank you once again for keeping uh, to the time limit provided. And Dr. Pradeepti, Dr. Surya, and Professor um, Anvita, um, um, Anvita Mandata for joining us for this particular session and sharing with us your views. Now we'll move on to our next session on uh, cyber math and mathematics behind provenance, observability, and uh, automated reasoning concepts of security. And uh, as mentioned, we have another track session going on, a parallel session in the next auditorium, which is called a stage one. And that's where uh, you have to be if you want to attend a session on privacy, which is a new field, throwing unprecedented voluminous complex and intertwining problems. You may refer to the schedule on top, an icon uh, right next to lobby is where you can find the entire program agenda and refer to it and uh, make a choice uh, for which session you'd like to attend. So that is the session on privacy, which is going on in stage one. And uh, in this, uh, the main auditorium, we now have our next session on cyber math. And uh, joining us for the session, we have uh, Dr. Vireshwar Kumar, Assistant Professor in the Department of CSE at IIT Delhi, Dr. Anandita uh, Anindita Banerjee, my apologies, uh, Adjunct Scientist Corporate R&D, CDAC, Pune, and uh, Dr. Shweta Agarwal, Associate Professor, CSE at IIT Madras, joining us as panelists. And as a moderator, Professor Somitra Sanadhya, Associate Professor at IIT Jodhpur, uh, will be leading this session and moderating it for all of us. So I'd like to welcome all of our panelists and the session moderator. And without any further ado, hand it over to you, uh, Professor Sanadhya, to take it forward from here. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, are all panelists on the stage? Because I'm not able to see them. I only see Dr. Vireshwar. Are uh, other panelists also on the stage? I can just uh, see you, Professor Samarit. Yeah, which is what? I am only able to see the two of us. Uh, so. Yeah, okay. Now Dr. Shweta is also here. Great. And uh, Dr. Arindita, maybe. Okay. So maybe I begin after uh, uh, Dr. Banerjee joins and after maybe Samriddhi introduces the uh, all of us or should I start? I don't know. I'm just waiting for Dr. Banerjee to join. Hi, uh, Professor Sanadia, can I request you to now start the session? All of thank our panelists have already joined. Yes. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, DSCI and uh, Ministry of Electronics and Information Technology for giving us this opportunity to uh, have a discussion on in this extremely important topic of cyber math uh, behind provenance, observability, and automated reasonings, and uh, how it relates to the security. So we have some wonderful colleagues with us to discuss this topic. And uh, maybe I would like to start with the uh, uh, 
uh, talking about uh, the the way confidentiality and provenance of messages is uh, ensured by using mathematical techniques uh, in in the modern uh, security industry is is today so dr vireshwar kumar from uh, iit delhi's uh, cs department uh, can i ask uh, dr vireshwar to maybe make a comment on uh, this initial topic yes yeah, sure uh, thanks uh, professor somitra so hello everyone um, yeah thanks dsci for uh, inviting me uh, so uh, this is a, a very interesting topic uh, because um, today uh, in this uh, session we will be talking about uh, the fundamental mathematics on which uh, the whole security architecture uh, relies on so if i look at uh, this security architecture i consider it uh, from uh, from a network security perspective and therefore i see it uh, at three levels so the first level the highest one would be looking at the network security and then uh, you the second level will be there you are talking about uh, security protocols and at the base of all of these uh, is the cryptographic primitives which are actually utilized to develop the security protocols and then the protocols are developed uh, uh, and elaborated further to ensure network security so now looking at this uh, the basic uh, aspect of uh, cryptographic primitives so then uh, you know that we have two different types of uh, uh, cryptography we have symmetric cryptography and we have asymmetric cryptography so basically in the symmetric cryptography we typically uh, depend on uh, uh, this idea of uh, having some sort of permutation or some sort of substitution to make sure that uh, um the whatever security goals uh, you have set are satisfied mm -hmm. now when we look into the asymmetric cryptography then uh, we have uh, a variety of uh, solutions uh, which have uh, very different uh, flavors so i think uh, when we uh, when uh, this uh, so of course symmetric cryptography has been there for a very long time but the asymmetric cryptography or public cryptography uh, came into being in uh, 70s uh, so the first uh, mathematical uh, uh, mathematical problem uh, or i would say mathematical tool that was being utilized there was that uh, people started looking into modular exponentiation so exponentiation over a modulus and uh, then uh, uh, of course uh, multiple researchers uh, came up with these different um, uh, uh, protocols which are primitives uh, which depended on some mathematical problems so for instance uh, first of all diffie hellman key exchange protocol was uh, developed and that depended on the discrete logarithm problem and uh, at, uh, around the same time uh, or slightly later rsa was uh, proposed and uh, that problem was uh, based on the problem of factoring large numbers and uh, with uh, these two uh, uh, the tools in our hand the diffie hellman key exchange uh, protocol and rsa things uh, progressed very well and uh, then uh, at some point uh, this area of uh, this whole new area of elliptic curve cryptography came up uh, where um, uh, people now started depending on this uh, algebraic structure of uh, elliptic curves uh, and basically the problem that uh, people looked at was uh, just looking into uh, this uh, uh, elliptic you can say elliptic curve discrete logarithm problem so finding the discrete logarithm of a, a random elliptic curve element with respect to a known base point so they figured that this is also a difficult uh, uh, problem to solve and therefore um, uh, the the, uh, the newest uh, cryptographic uh, protocols uh, utilize uh, these uh, elliptic curve cryptographic um, uh, tools so um, uh, yeah with that uh, brief discussion the uh, description of this whole history of uh, this development of these uh, basic tools i will uh, uh, send uh, this stage uh, uh, to yeah. rest uh, so i said my yeah. comments rest and then i will ask professor somita to sure, sure, sure. take us yeah. forward so, yeah so thanks thanks dr vireshwar for uh, this interesting uh, discussion on on the history of uh, how the public key cryptography developed and as we see this uh, today it is essentially related to a trapdoor uh, one way function so if you have a trapdoor one way function uh, we can prove that it 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 is possible to have a public key cryptography and the two great examples that you gave from history are related to the rsa problem and the the discrete log problem and uh, we know that if we do have large scale quantum computers at any point of time 
then both these problems will be broken. And that will imply that uh, our modern cryptographic infrastructure, which is being used in industry A's today, will be uh, completely uh, broken. So that brings me uh, to our next panelist, uh, Dr. Anindita Banerjee, who is uh, not only an expert on uh, quantum algorithms and quantum protocols, but is also involved in uh, uh, implementing these protocols to practice. So Dr. Banerjee, welcome. And I would like to ask you the next question about, uh, uh, can you talk about the, the, the security in the quantum world and, and what kind of mathematical problems do we use to secure messages or, or, or even to prove problems? of messages in this setting. Thank you uh, for this kind introduction. And uh, I would again like to start by thanking DSEI for inviting me. So uh, let me start this, uh, uh, this, you know, answering this question with a famous quotation by Simon Singh. He said that, you know, that Second World War was the physicist war because the atom bomb was detonated. And the Third World War would be mathematics mathematicians war because the mathematicians will have control over the next great weapon which is information so now coming back um, and if you if you just look back um, see uh, cryptography has been as ancient as civilization and every time we thought that uh, you know um, it is the best one but with the emergence of new technology uh, it had to go through a change uh, and certain cryptography, you know, in the medieval period, for example, they were, uh, they continued for 100 years. But then again, it had to be changed because of emerging technology. So today, as, uh, uh, as the speaker was talking about, uh, modern cryptography is based on mathematical problems, particularly back to uh, trapdoor problems. Now, uh, it is vulnerable to certain facts. First is human, uh, human intelligence. Um, because it is not probable that uh, it cannot be proven uh, to be, uh, you know, secure against, uh, uh, I mean, there is no proof as such that it cannot be uh, broken. Second is uh, the new technology, which is the quantum technology, which is coming, which I'll talk about now. And third is um, it allows you to have certain backdoors. Uh, and now if you're talking about particularly security of keys, um, particularly encryption keys, we say that cryptography is secure as long as the keys are secure. So now if you look at the uh, transportation or generation of keys, today the generation is mostly uh, algorithm based and uh, the transportation uh, can be subjected to active and passive uh, attacks. Uh, there is no guarantee. You cannot find out whether it has been copied or monitored. Now in quantum, when, it, when we're talking about quantum, then we are talking about crypt analysis as well as the, uh, you know, securing cryptography. So when we're talking about uh, crypt analysis, we're talking about uh, those, uh, particularly those quantum algorithms, for example, Shor's quantum algorithm, which is a polynomial time quantum algorithm for integer factorization. Because in classical, we have, uh, we, it can be broken in super polynomial time. So that is one of the major threats. Uh, now, now there will be some more questions as in what, are, what is the uh, exactly uh, uh, size of a quantum computer we are looking at to break these kind of an algorithms, which we'll come to later. Uh, and the other part is uh, secure uh, quantum keys. Now, theoretically, it is proven to be secure. Uh, so when I say theoretically, uh, I'm meaning it on paper, but when we are implementing it from paper to practice, then, of course, uh, the security is subjected to the way it is being implemented. But in quantum mechanics, there is a way where we can uh, generate secure symmetric keys uh, at two distant locations. So that is called quantum key distribution. So this is a hardware solution. Uh, I think we have experts here who will talk about the uh, software uh, part of it as well. But uh, particularly, why is quantum key distribution exciting? Because if you look at uh, encryption key, then its characteristics is it has to be random. Uh, in quantum uh, technology, there is a way to generate quantum certified random numbers, which are information theoretically secure. Again, I'm saying I'm keeping in mind that it is all implementation. It has to be uh, and uh, it has to be a very good uh, near to perfect implementation when I'm saying it is it has to be uh, probable or uh, it has to be secure. And second is the, uh, the keys has to be random and it has to be uh, any any uh, type of eavesdropping attack 
on transporting the keys or any kind of tampering with the keys, we should be able to detect it. So that provision is also there in quantum key distribution. So it is very interesting application of quantum information science. Again, quantum information science is nothing but marriage of uh, quantum mechanics and uh, classical information processing. So uh, this kind of a technology, I think, will uh, lead to a, to a future-proof uh, technology, uh, cryptographic technology, because here the adversarial model which we look at for quantum secure communication is um, is limited by physics. It is not limited by technology. So when we consider attacks, not only we are considering the information leakage attacks because of uh, because of uh, uh, non-ideal components or transportation, but we are also looking at the power of uh, uh, quantum adversary and taking that into account when we derive the secure keys. So I, I think uh, um, this is a time, and uh, this is a very exciting time. And at CDAC, CDAC being the Center for Advanced Computing, we are attacking at both these uh, uh, technologies, uh, particularly quantum computing. So very soon we are coming out with indigenous solution for a quantum computer based on multiple technologies. And uh, we are developing uh, uh, quantum algorithms. We have Atos quantum computer also with us. We're looking at uh, you know uh, developing these uh, indigenous uh, uh, cryptanalysis based algorithms, quantum algorithms. And also we are looking at uh, we are actively looking at uh, quantum secure communication, which has been done with, with in collaborations with Indian academic institutes and industry partners. So we we are uh, moving in this direction. Yeah, thanks, Dr. Banerjee, uh, for this very in uh, interesting discussion on quantum computing and its uh, uh, possibilities. Now, uh, a very interesting thing is you already mentioned in your talk is that as of today, we don't have such large scale quantum computers which can break uh, the class techniques however we all all of us believe uh, in even in the standardization bodies like nist in the usa that such computers are going to come up maybe it will take a decade maybe five years we do not know but they are going to come up and as we already know change management of cryptographic algorithms is very very hard so when md5 and uh, sha sha1 were broken they are still found in many implementations in industry today so nist has already started going in uh, uh, development and uh, uh, standardization of algorithms which can resist uh, even when quantum computers come. And we have with us uh, Dr. Shweta Agrawal from IIT Madras, one of the leading lights of post-quantum cryptography from the country. And, uh, uh, and, and some of her work has actually made a mark at international stage. And uh, we are very fortunate to have her with us to discuss about this post-quantum uh, algorithms. And I would like to now request Dr. Agrawal to uh, shed some light on, on what kind of mathematical hard problems are being used and uh, what is the, the future for post-quantum cryptographic algorithms uh, for us. Thanks, uh, Somitra, for the introduction, and uh, thanks also for the invitation. So, uh, as Anindita already mentioned, uh, so she talked about two aspects of uh, quantum computers as they intersect with cryptography. The first is in designing cryptography, and the second is in breaking cryptography, right? So uh, now, yes, even though we don't have uh, large-scale quantum computers at the moment, uh, the threat of them is real and it's going to take a while for us to move to, you know, quantum safe technology. So therefore, it is uh, well understood that uh, the effort for designing post quantum secure cryptography is uh, very, very uh, urgent at, at, as of now. Uh, now here, uh, I would say that, uh, you know, using quantum computers to build cryptography this is something that is scientifically interesting and you know a bit futuristic because uh, yes we want to also harness the power of quantum computers for constructive purposes but uh, even more important and urgent in the short term uh, in, in the short term is to protect against the adversarial power of quantum computers Right. So uh, post quantum cryptography is about, uh, you know, having an asymmetry between the designer and the attacker where the designer is assumed to be classical, which is where we are right now. And the attacker is assumed to be quantum. So the quantum attacker, 
you know, could sort of show up at any moment. I mean, maybe there's some country or some lab which develops the first quantum computer that is able to break uh, classical cryptography. And we want to protect against that. But we don't have quantum computers to protect against that, right? So basically, we are protecting against the all-powerful adversary. So this is the area of post-quantum cryptography in which I have a particular interest. And here, there are a variety of mathematical problems. In fact, I wrote a short book chapter at a very introductory level uh, about the, these uh, about this very subject. So for those who are interested, you can find it on my webpage. But uh, primarily, uh, post-quantum cryptography is going to be uh, uh, is currently dominated by problems such as uh, at, uh, lattice problems. Uh, isogenies, you know, code-based problems, multivariate polynomial equations, and there are really several, uh, several others as well. Uh, and where we are, I think, with uh, post-quantum is that, uh, uh, you, you know, in the NIST competition, uh, there is a standardization of basic uh, or a call for standardization of basic uh, cryptographic primitives such as uh, you know digital signatures public key encryption um, you know uh, basic cryptographic primitives right and uh, here i think that uh, we have made good progress so we have we've had uh, constructions in the theoretical regime for quite some time and now these constructions have been sort of studied suitably and you know the parameter ranges where uh, they are going to be secure. These have been uh, analyzed thoroughly and uh, implementations are there. So based on uh, different mathematical conjectures, of course, they are only conjectures, as Anindita also mentioned. We do have things that we conjecture to be uh, you know, quantum safe, so against a quantum attacker. And, uh, in the, in the theoretical domain, we have even a lot more. Like we have a, a lot more uh, material, so to speak, right? That, uh, you know, feasibility results where uh, we know that something can be done in theory, but uh, in practice, it is still taking, I mean, there's still a ways to go before it can become practical. So yeah, all in all, I think globally there, there is some good understanding now of basic cryptographic primitives in the post-quantum regime. And uh, advanced cryptographic primitives, uh, there is a theoretical understanding, but we're still working on uh, getting more practical candidates. So that's where we are, I think, with this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Shweta. And uh, now I want to talk about, uh, uh, now that we just discussed uh, about, about the foundational principles of security uh, using purely math and, and using the quantum math, uh, the quantum physics, uh, how is it possible to keep us uh, secure on, on the internet? But I want to come back to now uh, one topic that Dr. Griffer mentioned in the initial uh, points made, and that is that he uh, also has a lot of interest in network security and network protocols. Now, some of these protocols, if you see, uh, of course, at the underlying stage, they are using cryptography. But, uh, many of these systems are rule based. So you have a rule, uh, for example, in firewalls. And we know that uh, some of these rules can be conflicting. It's not very easy to even identify uh, if any rule is conflicting with another rule uh, because uh, uh, there could be cyclic dependencies between them and, and these problems are exponential time or, or uh, I mean, certainly not polynomial time to solve. And uh, in this setting, uh, do we have any, any way of using mathematics to automate this reasoning and find out if uh, the rules of firewall uh, are indeed uh, 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 the valid? So, Dr. Viroshar, any, any comments uh, by you on this? Yes. Um, so, um, as uh, has been highlighted by other speakers, that uh, so we have some uh, uh, algorithms or, uh, which are uh, on the table. So, we have some algorithms which have been proved on paper. And then we have uh, some algorithms which have uh, sufficiently robust implementations, even the existing ones. So, now um, uh, when we want to uh, verify whether uh, they are actually secure or not. Uh, so then there are certain methods in which we could do it. Uh, we could look into the area of uh, formal verification. We could look into the area of program verification in order to 
see if uh, that, that is possible or not. So now uh, for the conventional uh, crypto algorithms like uh, RSA, BPLMAN uh, and the others, so we uh, have, uh, so we definitely have, uh, if we assume that the basic cryptography remains secure, then people have uh, actually come up with um, tools which would be able to analyze uh, a crypto protocol that you build uh, using them and uh, uh, using this uh, idea of formal verification to show that uh, yes, uh, the, uh, uh, the protocol that you have built, the code that you have written, that is definitely secure. So there are some existing uh, tools to do that. Now, uh, as I said that this is a three level process. So we have the crypto primitives. So let, let's assume that the crypto primitives are secure. Then we can say that protocols could be secure. So even uh, um, some protocols like uh, TLS uh, 1.2 have been shown uh, to be uh, secure by doing this uh, analysis. Then, but there is a third level where we are looking into the network security. So that is something which is very difficult to um, actually uh, build any mathematics uh, uh, to prove that uh, your network is completely secure. Now, um, uh, I would like to also add here that uh, when we are doing these uh, kind of uh, verification uh, uh, techniques, it takes significant amount of effort. So it is not uh, very easy. So of course, uh, developing a secure crypto is very, very difficult. I'm sure uh, Shweta can tell us uh, about that. Um, um, and then, uh, but uh, then, uh, Converting a crypto protocol and uh, into um, a language in which uh, the formal verification can be conducted, that itself uh, is a very difficult task. So if you look into one of uh, examples like TLS 1.2, it might uh, have taken the researchers around a year or a year and a half to first uh, bring it in that format where that tool could run its analysis to check whether TLS 1.2 is uh, formally secure or not. So therefore, uh, there is, that is another angle that it is currently, although there are some existing tools to uh, verify if they are secure or not, but then the effort is still large. So there is uh, still uh, a lot of effort required in order to uh, make this whole uh, process uh, so that um, fast, so that we could actually have a, a quick feedback about the security of these uh, scenarios. Okay. Thanks, thanks, uh, Dr. Virushwar. So I want to come back to doc you, Dr. Anindita. Uh, so is it possible to have some quantum algorithms for imp uh, for speeding up this uh, uh, this verification protocols? And second thing I want to ask you is about: Is there anything happening on standardization process of uh, this uh, quantum implementations? Uh, the reason I ask you is because when industry uh, uh, tries to implement things, they are not going to look at research papers where algorithms are described for the reasons that they need to be interoperable with the other industry uh, implementations. And this is the reason that Dr. Shweta already mentioned about NIST uh, spending a lot of energy in the last two years about uh, post-quantum crypto algorithm. So not only the algorithms uh, per se, but even their specific parameters are being discussed and being standardized. So do we have something like this in quantum world also? So um, so when we say talk about standardization, or let me talk about quantum safe cryptography. So one aspect we cover it is using um, post-quantum cryptography, which Dr. Shweta was very nicely, she brought it out. Another aspect is quantum key distribution. And third would be, uh, since there is no per se standardized um, uh, you know, uh, protocol as of now, but there is a need to go for quantum safe transition. So many organizations uh, are going for hybrid model also where they have uh, post quantum cryptography, quantum key distribution and classical because it, whatever we say, you know, but still our stronghold is still in classical. Uh, we, we, we have been working on this for 70 years. Uh, quantum is new. We have to understand. And as uh, Dr. Shweta may agree that, you know, quantum safe cryptography also, we will have to explore from many angles, uh, you know, uh, look from the quantum adversary uh, point of view. So, uh, uh, and then there are standardizations happening in quantum world. Uh, for example, European Telecommunication Standard Institute, Cloud Security Alliance, NIST, they are coming out with um, uh, so particularly quantum, let me say, uh, quantum entropies, specifying what are quantum entropies in case of quantum random number generator, defining the quantum random number architecture, 
so I T U has been very active in that. Then uh, what are the different uh, uh, ways or different? So there are different modules. You can break the quantum key distribution into many modules, and uh, there have been uh, white papers on how to select the protocol. Uh, sources, how to characterize the components used in this in, in the QKD. So uh, yes, there, there is happening, and uh, and it will take maybe uh, uh, maybe few years more, maybe less than a decade to come out with a complete uh, standardization. Net, uh, QKD network standardization is happening. Then there are uh, the interface interface between the QK between the classical and the quantum. So in those areas, standardizations are happening. But for quantum per se, it needs a lot of research and it is still evolving. So uh, we need to be proactive. We need to understand to bring those clarity. There are certain white, white papers which we can follow. Um, and it also helps me to follow those papers because then the transition to standardization becomes easier in future. So, so yeah, one can, one can look into these, uh, these uh, papers and, and understand what kind of uh, standardization is going to come in. Yeah, but there is no standard body like uh, NIST in uh, in uh, this uh, is area which is trying to standardize these algorithms implementations right now. NIST is doing it uh, very actively for post quantum cryptography. Yes, indeed. Uh, and uh, it is also implementing uh, quantum uh, key distribution or quantum communication, quantum internet. It has been active uh, uh, in these areas as well. But uh, per se, quantum key distribution, FC is taking it. FC and uh, ITU is taking it very uh, actively. Okay. Okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. So uh, I also want to bring the discussion to a slightly different area now. So uh, uh, maybe about uh, 20, 30 years ago, when these papers were published first time, things like zero knowledge proof, they were considered just theoretical constructions. And, and the first time uh, as a student, when I read this paper, it blew my mind. What a wonderful concept it is that we can prove something without telling the thing. And the other party is convinced. But today we see uh, the era has come where these techniques are not remaining any theoretical. These problems, which are again based on some some beautiful mathematics, are now being utilized in practical protocols like Zcash. Uh, the cryptocurrency uses this zero knowledge proof in in a beautiful manner. So I want to come back to Dr. Shweta now and uh, ask, uh, maybe request her to comment about. Um, these kind of supposedly futuristic technologies just a decade or two decades ago and how they are slowly coming into practice and and uh, uh, what is the mathematics behind this and and how do we see this space growing up in maybe in future industries yeah uh, so so mitra the space of zero knowledge is uh, also i think it's the favorite space of every cryptographer everyone who has studied cryptography and uh, it's also a great example of something that uh, you know is dismissed initially as a theor theoretician's mind game and uh, you know later you find that uh, no in fact it is uh, very useful even in practice i want to point out that uh, fully homomorphic encryption is another such example where uh, you know when it first came out uh, well the very first construction in 2009 was of course very messy based on uh, non standard assumptions extremely uh, impractical and uh, i was doing my phd at the time and i remember that you know there was a lot of discussion that you know even later on after i moved back to india i remember at iit delhi we had some event and uh, people were saying that you know oh this is it's just a, a theoretician's something. It's not uh, something that will ever be practical. But you know, you can never really predict the advances of science. And uh, now, in fact, both zero knowledge and FHE, especially zero knowledge, I guess, ha have been uh, implemented in many important and interesting applications. So I think this is a great win just for theoretical cryptography, right? And uh, yeah, as a the theoretical cryptographer, I, I want to emphasize this point because uh, we, we are often critiqued for uh, developing things that we like to think about. But, you know, you never know which thing is going to uh, be very important in the coming years. So now coming back, <coughs> excuse me, coming back to the uh, question of zero knowledge. Um, it's a zero knowledge, as you pointed out, is this idea that uh, I can prove to you something without uh, telling you what I know. 
right and when i introduce the subject to my students for instance i always give the example of a sudoku puzzle that you know let's say that i i all of us are trying to solve this puzzle and i claim that i have a solution now the traditional notion of a proof is that i show you the solution and you verify but in doing so i also leak the solution and spoil your fun so is there a way for me to prove to you that i know the solution without leaking the solution and indeed actually using playing cards there's a very cute way in which you can do it so it's a nice way to uh, you know get the flavor of zero knowledge and uh, zk has been used a lot especially recently in the context of blockchain as you mentioned uh, you know the you mentioned uh, zcash for instance so there uh, you can you know in a cryptocurrency for instance you have this tension between uh, privacy and verifiability right so for instance you would like your transactions to be private but you want to make sure that uh, these transactions are valid under whatever consensus rules the network has so something like zero knowledge lets you do that because it lets you encrypt the transactions and prove in zero knowledge that whatever has been encrypted is valid under whatever rules you specified and uh, zero knowledge uh, uh, can be based on multiple assumptions both uh, you know both uh, classical and uh, sort of traditional classical and post quantum and uh, especially lately for succinct uh, zero knowledge like snags and and so on doesn't matter if uh, we don't expand that out but basically you know very efficient zero knowledge proofs there has been a lot of progress that makes use only of uh, simple symmetric key cryptographic primitives so uh, these are efficient as well as uh, post quantum and also in the lattice regime there has been a lot of progress uh, in developing zero knowledge for restricted algebraic statements so basically in terms of again in terms of a feasibility result we have uh, you know zero knowledge for uh, sort of uh, general statements but uh, in terms of efficient zero knowledge based on what mathematical assumption you want to make we have uh, constructions from different assumptions some of which are also post quantum so there has been a lot of progress uh, in this space going from uh, feasible to practical and uh, it's already being implemented in several applications like cryptocurrencies and so on there's also a very uh, interesting application that was developed in the context of nuclear disarmament that you know you want to uh, prove that something is not a nuclear weapon but without leaking sensitive information about how it is constructed and so on so there are applications of this idea you know in uh, far reaching uh, spaces and uh, it's uh, it's something that uh, we expect to you know we expect it to become more and more widespread its use yeah thanks you you made a wonderful comment about uh, uh, us not being able to predict uh, future and which is why yeah. it's very hard to make a, a decision about what is practical uh, uh, what is going to be practical in future in fact i saw a wonderful discussion about this somewhere where uh, some papers were being rejected even the uh, the the classic paper on zero knowledge proof as you mentioned was rejected a couple of years and um, and and today it it stands the test of time and in fact if you look at many of the test of the time awards in uh, our own domain of cryptography we realize many of these papers never received best paper award okay. so but but they stood the test of the time so we are not very good at predicting uh, future as technologists we may be good scientists but um, uh, the way the world goes is very hard for us to uh, decide i yeah i was actually not uh, necessarily uh, pointing to scientists here yeah. but you know just humanity at large as for yeah. paper rejections i think that you know there are so many factors which yeah. should not be taken very seriously yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah indeed uh, <laughs> yeah it's indeed it's... Uh, even even among uh, the uh, the results which were considered exciting by the community uh, some became i mean not so exciting and some which were not considered exciting became very exciting for for the humanity overall so so this is something that very yeah, hard although for... i do i mean maybe because i serve on so many program committees i do want yeah. to <laughs> say from the program committee point of view that yeah. uh, 
rejections don't always mean that the paper or the idea is not exciting yeah, right correct, it correct. could just mean that maybe it is not presented so clearly or maybe yeah. you know uh, it is not very clear how it compares yeah, to other indeed. works and yeah, so indeed. on is, so is, is, rejection uh, yeah goldreich 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 mentions in one of his books or uh, or essays that uh, a rejection essentially means that uh, that particular work was not suited for that particular conference or a particular session so so maybe that is the way to go about um, so we had a very interesting and exciting discussion uh, on various aspects of uh, cryptography security automated reasoning and so on i think our time is up as i see from uh, the 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 watch the, the clock here so thank you very much it was wonderful discussing with you um, and uh, hope to have uh, more such sessions uh, organized by dsci uh, i also want to thank the ministry of electronics and information technology for giving us this uh, opportunity uh, thanks thanks all of you thanks dr vireshwar thanks dr shweta thanks dr anindita for making this uh, exciting conversation today thank you very much and, and thanks to you somitra for uh, yeah. organizing it so well thank you yeah, thanks somitra Yeah, thanks thanks so much thanks thanks bye 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 bye, bye. bye. Well, thank you, everyone, and with that, we come to an end of uh, another very interesting session on cyber math, mathematics behind uh, provenance, observability, and uh, automated reasoning concepts of security. And we were joined by Dr. Vireshwar Kumar, Dr. Anandita Banerjee, Dr. Shweta Agarwal, and the session was moderated by Professor Somitra. We thank you all for joining us this evening and sharing with us. your insights and uh, before i move on to our next session i'd like to tell our viewers that this is going to be the final and last session of the day and alongside um, the session uh, that we have in the main auditorium now which is going to be on cyber first this and the next generation we have the paper presentation session which will now start um in stage 1 auditorium and uh, like uh, i mentioned during the day uh, the paper presentation session uh, Uh, will have uh, selected papers and uh, those would be published in seri paper proceedings and in fact uh, they'll also be published on taylor and francis uh, website um and uh, you may uh, stay tuned in and uh, join us for the paper presentation session uh, in stage 1 and for those of you who are interested in joining us for the panel discussion on cyber first can stay with us in the main auditorium and uh, we hope that uh, you're all tweeting about the event using the hashtag seri2021 you can tag us on uh, the national coe handle and uh, we'd like to once again extend our gratitude to our partners our publication partner taylor and francis and partner tier 1 microsoft and uh, along with that once again a quick uh, reminder that we have two business lounges for our partner microsoft and the attendees can click on the rooms on top navigation bar to access the lounges for interacting with the microsoft team so uh, to begin uh, this uh, final session on cyber first uh, i'd like to invite on stage uh, professor farooq kazi uh, dean research development and consultancy at veer mata jeejar biotechnological uh, institute or vjti professor tal pavel uh, founder and director of the institute for cyber policy studies israel will also be sharing with us um, insights and uh, professor muthu krishnan raja rajan director and professor security engineering and institute of cyber security from the university of london is also joining us this evening and to moderate the session we have amongst us ms kirti seth ceo of the sector skill council for it ites at nascom so once again an esteemed panel to talk to us on uh, cyber first this and the next generation forward to elaborate on it um let me hand it over to the session moderator ms seth to take it forward from here thank you so hi everyone uh, this is a, a really interesting panel to be part of because i was just backstage and listening to all three of them talk to each other and the words that were being bandied about were rather interesting i heard taliban i heard uh, saib ransomware i heard some radicalization i heard all these interesting topics which is what tells us that this is a really important topic to talk about because 
when before the pandemic hit us uh, digital was something that maybe companies talked about governments talked about cyber security was also something that they talked about um and things like ai ml cloud were not something that were in the normal parlance post the pandemic we have entered a digital interconnected world and that's where suddenly everyone is talking about these words again but if we really want to reap the benefits of digitization it's security that is going to be the fundamental enabler how people interact with technology how decisions are made regarding information security this is a really complicated issue changing day by day i don't know how many of you are following the news in india where we have data privacy bills going on where we have cyber security which is in every government conversation today so it's truly a topic that's really important investments into making cyber security education and awareness mainstream are really needed to to help improve the overall security posture security awareness in our country this is not just why well, in our country across the globe actually so this is not just something that we need to do as developers or as a business opportunity but it's a really important societal group goal and as we as as I, as i was eavesdropping on this conversation you realize that there are things we are not even aware of as average citizens that are being looked at controlled uh, we are being protected by exactly the kind of people that are being educated by all the academicians on this uh, panel with me today so just to kick this off uh, i will start with a question i will direct it to someone but given that the three of you really know each other and are so well aware of each other's uh, work please feel free to raise your hand to say i want to comment on this question and come in because while i have a set of questions that i have prepared for you but i i i you know in the pre session when we talked about it i realized that there are so many aspects to this and we should try and cover them all but let's see how that goes so the first question is really what the fundamental reason this panel was set up was to talk about educating people and this is not just for developers but to users as well so my question is where does this responsibility of education lie does it lie with academia uh somewhere else how is it going to even happen and i'm going to start by asking the question to professor pavel and then maybe uh the others can step in and if we can keep the answers crisp and short we will have time to get everyone's views in um so first of all thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to be here part of this uh, distinguished uh panel and most interesting uh, uh and important and enriching conference uh thank you very much for this uh, question you know since when i been asked what is cyberspace i often say that for me it's kind of a huge umbrella that beneath we can find almost every topic and if we are um let's take a, a university or an academic institution for example i think that nowadays let's say almost if not every department or faculty may relate to cyberspace and of course not only uh, computer science and information technology and engineering but we have topics and issues that relate to cyberspace in governments and politics law enforcement um a business development this administration um even geography so for me cyber and cyberspace and cyber issues and cyber topics are very wide therefore cyber education is wide as well which mean as far as i see it, the responsibility to give cyber education should be once again kind of umbrella that should include governmental initiatives academic um the the schools and high schools and even to start in you know kindergarten with several uh, uh basic initiatives 
because we know that um, um, nowadays uh, even our children in the kindergarten use uh, tablets and, and, and very, very basic smartphones. So let's call it sad hygiene. But um, at the end of the day, the responsibility to give such a sad education should be a very broad one, not necessarily the Ministry of Education or, or academic institutions. So if I were to take that idea and go to Professor Kazi and say that if we talk about the broad baseness, which uh, Professor Pavel talked about, where do you think, I mean, does, is this cyber education, I mean, we, I'm talking about who's going to teach it, but I also probably want to look at who's going to learn it. So is it only for engineering students? Is it, uh, where, where is, how do we do this broad basing? Yeah, sure. So first of all, thank you, organizer, for giving me opportunity. I'd like to just uh, stretch the answer of Professor Tal a bit more uh, with respect to whose responsibility is this as far as cyber education is concerned. So, of course, the uh, rallying point can be academic institutes, no doubt about this. But if you can see who are those who are getting affected. So uh, I would like to draw the attention of the title of our panel discussion itself. We are talking about cyber first, this and next generation. Actually, if you see the most vulnerable sector is our children and the elderly people. So it, it should not be this and next generation, but previous this and the next generation probably. Because when you want to talk about cyber education, you also need to take into account the elderly people, the generation before us, and those who are not having much of the exposure to the technical know-how. And there comes the biggest problem with respect to cyber hygiene. So if you see the phishing attacks and the social engineering attacks which are happening recently, that innocent grandparents, they would like to talk to their grandchildren and they would like to use the social media as uh, tools which are available, WhatsApp or any other kind of thing. And suddenly they find a link which is saying that click so and so and then you will be getting these things. And this generation before us was not having such kind of uh, fishing type of exposure earlier. So I think along with the educational institutes, there are a lot of uh, NGOs which are coming up in now, uh, making aware uh, these elderly group of people, uh, children basically who are exposed to the cyber bullying because of their so much of time that they spend on the digital space. So along with the educational institute, I think there is a lot of uh, work which is currently happening and need to be done from the civil societies and the NGOs. The third thing that I'm noticing very recently with at least in India particularly is with the last year's so many news reporting coming up that energy sector is under cyber attack. So along with the educational institute, uh, at least in India, I'm seeing a lot of traction coming up for the training or cyber education through Ministry of Power or Central uh, Electricity Authority. So those utilities as well are actually conducting certain awareness program. Some of them are conducting it through educational institutes. Some of them are creating their in-house capacity building measures as well. So I think along with the educational institutes, this NGO civil societies, the groups which are getting affected, they themselves are coming forward. And what I feel is the cyber hygiene, basic cyber hygiene is now becoming part of our curriculum as well. So many uh, school curriculum and syllabi are now having at least one or two modules which talks about the uh, cyber hygiene and how they can uh, protect their digital identity within the cyberspace and how can they safely navigate uh, their way through the digital space. So I think nowadays a complete ecosystem is getting created so as to create this cyber awareness and the cyber education. So thanks, uh, Professor Kazi. I hear you mention the government multiple times. So is there a role for government in creating uh, cyber awareness? Professor Muthuprishnan, would you like to comment? Yeah, I think the wrong person to ask this question because I was involved 10 years ago with the Indian government on cyber education with Farooqi's boss, Professor Diran Patel, as part of the, at that time it was Meiti, and I think, or Deity, now it's Meiti. He spent a lot of time, and as these guys are mentioning here, one of the challenges I find through this educational awareness program was there was a lot of money allocated, but when you give it to the professors, 
you know, they don't really get into the real world problems and start sorting the challenges that you face on a day to day life. Uh, and what I see it as colleagues have mentioned here, uh, both my panelists, that the best way to do is I do, for example, a hacking exercise at the kids school between the age of 10 to 12, 15. Uh, initially, when I started doing a robotic car hacking, I was told that the kids went home and told the parents, uh, this professor came and told us how to hack into autonomous cars. And the head teacher wrote an email to me saying, Professor, you shouldn't be teaching about hacking. I said, the problem is, you know, being an academic for 25 years, there is no passion in kids. You start telling my daughter, who is in university now, cyber, she says, what is this about, you know? So there is a very selective group of us who understand what it means. And I think the only way is to start pumping this into from a younger generation. And this is where I started off. And I see a big skills gap that we see. And I think this is what it's about, how to kind of transform the next generation with more knowledge and understanding of what these threats are. So some of the things we have been trying to do as part of the interdisciplinary center is to create cyber games so that the kids are more educated from early on. What are the threats they see? So try to bring interesting games for them so they engage more to understand the real threats. Uh, and I think it is a process we need to start very early on, as colleagues mentioned here, rather than just building it into the curriculum, as Faruqi mentioned, I think all undergraduate programs now have some kind of uh, cyber being built in. So I think from the government agenda, every government has an agenda and politicians are useless and they don't do many things in the right format. I think it has to start from home and people have to start, you know, educating the kids and a lot of parents don't have time to educate the kids. So I find the best way is to educate the kids through these fun activities at school. And like, for example, I'm a STEM ambassador uh, in my co local county where I cover around 20 schools where I go and talk about all fun activities through which you try to tell them what are the dangers you might encounter by interacting with this web page or do this way or design something this way. So I think it is a process we need to start early on rather than just incorporating into a, a university curriculum or trying to get the governments. There are so many policies. UK has multiple policies. We defined kind of recently something called cyber, cyber body of knowledge. Uh, and that is a document of 180 pages. No one wants to read it. So I think the problem is it has to become part of our daily life. And as Faruqi mentioned about phishing attacks, because now most of the UK companies put on the emails, this email originated from outside the organization. Schools do that. This email is from another outside entity. So I think bringing awareness by integrating this into the existing environment is the best way rather than having policies defined. And my personal experience with many governments is there are very good policies, but no one reads these policies and no one implements these policies. Take for example, IT Act of India, how long it took to change the privacy into Indian. And when I presented privacy in India, I was told, according to the culture in India, a, kid, a parent can open a child's post. So Professor, you're talking about privacy in India. And this is the problem. The mindset has to start early on and people have to then change their behavior. Uh, so that's my take on this. Uh, it is, we have started on, but I think the best way is through games and interesting interactive activities where we should educate the children. Um, Professor, we've lost. Okay, he stopped. So, well, that's that's a nice radical take on things. Um, very clear point of view on what role government has to play. I think all three of you have talked about you know cyber hygiene and what we need to do to educate the user. You talked about games and you talked about making it interesting, involving the parents. Very practical points of view. But when we look at curriculum, the other side of it, the people who are building all these solutions or applications or things that we use, you know, Professor Kazi talked about what, what grandmothers are using and what, you know, people in daily lives, they're using these things where they're open to, uh, to, to making, to, to vulnerable, they become vulnerable. So people who are developing these solutions, is the curriculum up to scratch? Sorry. Is the, is the curriculum, are they prepared for it? Uh, you mentioned that all uh, computer science curriculum actually has elements of cybersecurity, but that's not what one is experiencing. And I think Professor Pavel, you had a point of view on that. We, we need to do something about that piece as well. 
Indeed, thank you. Um, I want to emphasize um, my conclusion that the same as education is general education is kind of social responsibility to minimize social gaps. I think cyber education and digital life education should be our social responsibility. And when I say our, it starts with everyone, with the, with the, the fa uh, family cell, uh, our businesses and corporates and society and the countries. It should be our responsibility to provide this basic nowadays uh, 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 current knowledge for everyone, as both professors mentioned. And in order not only to minimize the digital gap, but also to provide everyone with those needed skills that they will be manage, be able to manage themselves and on one hand to find relevant jobs, um, but on the other hand to protect themselves, their digital existence, their privacy, privacy and anonymity, what's left from it. So <clears throat> I think that it's our obligation to provide such education in order to uh, um, um, give everyone the um, basic uh, opportunities and to minimize this gap. Regarding <clears throat> the um, academic um, teaching, um, you know, from my experience, I can um, give you the example that uh, I have a course of uh, um, such an introduction uh, course of uh, um, cyber security essentials. Um, and in one of the academic institutions, the target is the third and fourth year in computer science. And when I spoke with them <clears throat> about DDoS, ransomware, malware, SQL injection, nothing technical, you know, just the concept, just what it's mean, what is malware, what is SQL injection? Suddenly I heard from those students, once again, computer science, third and fourth year, that they do not know what it is. And I was amazed because you expect from computer science to know what is DDoS attack or SQL injection. But I understood that they thought how to program or how to think like programmer, but they never, no one gave them, you know, a bit of a broader uh, perspective. Okay, you wrote your code, but what may be um, the consequence? What may be vulnerabilities in your code? How can your code be manipulated? What should be secure code? So I think that we need in this, you know, just case, just an example, not only to provide the basic knowledge here in this case in uh, a computer science department of how to write a code or how to uh, improve your code and to provide the best code that you can, but also to think perhaps like an attacker or how can my code be uh, manipulated and that's to give, you know, a broader uh, perspective that in this case, it will be not only for the benefit of the students and the knowledge, but it will be also for the benefit of the organization. Probably you will understand much more what are the threats. How can my code be uh, manipulated? And in this case, perhaps in the future, if there will be more synergy, or in this example, 
between the programmers and the uh, uh, security officers. Perhaps in the future, those programmers will think a bit about a bit more about security when they're writing the code. And, I, and and if they do that, I think the applications that they are building or the solutions they are proposing will have security in inbuilt rather than relying on other you know the user to take certain actions. Hopefully, security will be inbuilt into the design. Um, that's a great point, and I think that's some something that all uh, academicians who are who have these programs should think about to say how much of this is actually inbuilt into the computer science and IT curricula. But Professor Kazi, is this is cybersecurity um, something that just needs to be with the computer science and IT uh, streams or um, engineering st streams? Is is that how we're going to be looking at building out this, you know, the skill gap that Professor Muthukrishan talked about, which is huge. The opportunities are huge and the requirement is huge. But uh, with, who's the target audience for this, uh, for, for educating them on what cybersecurity is? Yeah, I think this is a very nice question. And uh, believe me, uh, you might get something interesting answer out of this because we used to feel that cybersecurity is some domain which belongs to computer and IT guys, basically, the engineering. Or to some extent, we still restrict cybersecurity to uh, science and technology people. But my personal experience of interacting with various people who work on uh, specifically on the penetration testing, VAPT domain, uh, to my surprise as well, I realized that many of them are actually commerce graduates. And to some extent, some of those were uh, MCA graduate, but believe me, majority of them are non-computer science background. This is surprising. The reason is for this kind of VAPT sector, because there's one more thing I would like to bring to your notice when we talk about cybersecurity, we talk this as a monolithic term, and that's a misnomer basically. And very much guiding our policymakers in wrong direction of focusing only on computer and IT engineering students when they talk about the cyber education or cyber security. We need to basically look into a wider horizon, getting into the people who have more luxury of free time. Uh, the reason I'm using this particular term is a lot of cyber security depends upon the tools. And the people who explore the tools are those people who have luxury of time. And that is the reason you will find that many of non-engineering students or graduates are actually well-performing when you talk about cybersecurity. You look into the certain impaneled uh, agencies which do VAPT testing and you'll find out majority of them are with non-engineering background. You may find non-engineering in big four who do a lot of uh, VAPTs for critical infrastructure, etc. So this is something is very interesting point actually that our policymakers, particularly those who try to spot the talent in the cybersecurity domain, they need to look into more non-obvious sources of talent. For example, if I speak about cyber uh, spear phishing or social engineering, most of the talent you can find out in uh, Jamtara or in uh, Jharkhand because they are the people who understand actually how to trigger the psychology for the people to uh, connect to the link which is having some kind of malicious intentions. So when you talk about the cyber security, you need to think about the different perspectives of this. So there's uh, vulnerability assessment, penetration testing. There is something which comes about phishing or social engineering. Of course, engineering science will come when you talk about something related to cryptography, where high-end mathematics is required. And you can then surely talk about uh, science and technology graduate, but not every time. There are many fields associated with the cyber securities, which can very well be addressed by the people belonging to non-computer science background. In fact, uh, just to, uh, on a lighter note, the biggest computer engineering company is run by IIT's metallurgy graduate, you know, Google, so we, we are actually searching talent in the obvious places. For cybersecurity, we need to start searching the talent in non-obvious places. I think that is something that we are missing right now. We are focusing too much on engineering, and that too we are focusing on 
computer and IT or computer science engineering. In fact, within engineering also, personally, I am in this teaching field for more than 25 years now. In cybersecurity, I, in my own institute, I feel that the talent is even better comparable in mechanical engineering, production engineering, vis-a-vis -vis computer science or IT engineering, when you talk about cybersecurity. Because it's actually something which is skill-based, passion-driven. The one who is having passion can excel very well in the cybersecurity, not necessarily from engineering background, and that too not specifically from computer or IT engineering background. So thanks for that. That's actually music to my ears because, as I mentioned, I lead the skilling charter for, for uh, NASCOM and for the IT industry in India. And we are constantly exhorting people to say that, you know, come and get skilled. There's all this opportunity out there. But uh, this will give me enough ammunition to go and evangelize this more powerfully. And maybe I invite you sometime to those sessions as well. Um, I'm going to go to Professor Muthukrishnan now. We, you know, we've been talking about skilling and getting a wider, uh, how people even from non-engineering backgrounds can do better. And you talked about the skill gap. So we've been here, I mean, we hear a lot about AI and cloud, and these are, you know, skills that everyone is aware of. When will cybersecurity's day in the sun come? Is it here or do we need to do something to get it to that level of popularity? I think the problem with cybersecurity is not as sexy as AI or ML. Uh, you know, I have three startups myself uh, and I look at crappy ML technologies being raised 1 million, 3 million in a year, whereas I have in the previous panel, they sp spoke about fully homomorphic. We have a practical fully homomorphic uh, encryption technique, which I spoke to some of our GCHQ, some of the most talented people you'll find in intelligence. Even for them, it wasn't sexy enough because I don't have a front end like this to show these flows, the data shows there is a cat and there is a dog. I just said, this is the crap that gets out of encrypted data. And they said, what is this? We just can't see anything. So even at that level, you cannot explain security. How do you explain security to a layman on the street? And this is the biggest challenge you find. So although security has been around for you know longer than these techniques that have been brought in, people find it very easy to manipulate data using visualization tools to show you know, how this ML or AI is having advantage to a specific business. But every time I do either an academic pitch or an investment pitch or an innovation pitch, it's so hard to have you know, Alice and then go and then people get lost. The minute Alice walks away and the numbers come in, People see what crap you are showing now. It's all after there is encryption, decryption, coding, key management. No one understands that. Even in simple terms, you try to explain in a layman term. People still, even yesterday, I had a great meeting with the government. They said, Raj, you have an amazing technology, but I still can't understand what you are trying to explain to me. And this is after three years of me explaining this tech. And this is not just myself. This is the problem with security. It's so hard to communicate security to the layman, or even to the you know enterprise managers. I've spoken to so many CTOs at senior level at Thales, IBM, Microsoft. They all understand it at a very high level. But when you start going to the nuts and bolts of security, even the CTOs don't understand what is going on. And this is the fundamental problem I have. Like being a guy who has academic hat on and trying to be an entrepreneur is very, very challenging. It is you know that education part, even at a CTO, CIO level, or C level guy is a big challenge. And I'm with two of my PhD students building a tool for quantifying risk to show senior C level managers because risk is something that I don't like it because you say one to 10, somebody says one to five, and on the sky you say four or three and two, and then you come with controls. What bloody risk is that? So I'm trying to quantify the risk basing some Bayesian networks. And then the minute I started talking Bayesian, and the CTO says, what is this professor? Some mathematics now, is it? Or statistics. They lose the interest. So now what I'm doing, I'm with my students, a nice sexy tool because you put some numbers in, it grows some nice. This is the economic impact of this kind of cyber attacks on your network. Wow, that looks like, now my biggest threat is this. They don't want to know the Bayesian belief network because they don't want to go into that. They just want to see this nice tool. And I think this is the same information that we did 20 years ago but this nice tool with some numbers they plug in, they think now they can measure the risk. So they are more you know, qualified to make an investment decision where the company should invest in the next five years. So 
for me, AI and ML is taking off much faster than cyber because it's hard to explain cyber. But at the same time, there is no ML and there is no AI without cyber. But people are now starting to realize with more AI. Now, we submitted five proposals. Everybody is asking, Raj, we need to do federated learning. But everybody is asking privacy preserving. How do you do this? I said, you'd use the same bloody privacy preserving that's been 10 years ago. But now the federated learning has been around. Even Google, Microsoft, IBM, they're all working. But they all want now to focus on privacy because they can't mine the data unless you protect the privacy first. So it is always an afterthought because personally, it's so hard to explain to even you know technical people and C level managers that, or even CTOs, CIOs, what security means to the organization. And this is the challenge, you know. And multidisciplinary is a very interesting angle. I, you know, the main reason I set this institute at City, uh, we I, I'm the director for this, and we cut across all areas from law to sociology to, and Faruqi spoke about and Tal spoke about. So I recently submitted a UK government project on fintech with my business school. It's about how to establish open banking platforms so that fintech can grow so that you don't have the, this something like an aggregator or a broker in the middle. So I think, and we, I work with law colleagues, you know, after Brexit, we don't follow GDPR. So how do you look at, trans, at national laws when it goes the cyber across the boundaries? You know, we did a, you know, I spoke about radicalization project. I couldn't harvest data. If anybody from Facebook, you can sue me. We couldn't harvest data in European uh, territory because by law, I cannot collect. I went to my friends at ICT in Israel because it's outside European community. And we crawled through and created enough data sets and we still did the project. And then the European Commission asked us, where the hell did you find this data? I said, this wasn't collected in GDPR. This was outside GDPR. I said, if worse come to us, I'll go to India and I'll collect more data and do further research. And they really got annoyed and we still passed through the project. So these are some of the fundamental issues. But I think cyber is a very multidisciplinary topic now. And we teach, you know, I teach across psychology, sociology, because I think technology is out there. Cryptography is there. You know, we have amazing cryptographers, but the bigger challenge are human factors and psychology. I think if you can understand these two, then you can really solve a lot of cybersecurity issues easily. That's my so thing. thanks for that. Lots of, lots of questions that are coming up from what you said. And uh, I wanted to ask a question on privacy, but before I do that, I'm going to ask Professor Kazi and Pavel, uh, Professor Pavel to come in on this whole thing of how do you explain security? Because if you cannot explain it, how do you inspire people to learn it? And what's the whiffing for actually, uh, you know, for governments to propose it, for uh, companies to pay for it, for people to learn it. I mean, it's at the heart of the question. If you can't explain it, how do you explain the value? Do you find that too? Uh, I'll go to Professor Kazi and then to Professor Pavel. Yes. So a very interesting answer I can give it to you because exactly the same thing we were experiencing for almost a decade or so when we were working with many energy utilities, basically. So when uh, some five, six years back, we started interacting to power utilities and telling them that cybersecurity indeed is very important for you. And they used to uh, outrightly reject our all ideas of cybersecurity, saying that, no, 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 we are air gap network and this kind of things cannot happen with us. And luckily then the Stuxnet and uh, Ukrainian power grid attack happened. So the best way to convince people about cybersecurity is in your presentation, put the first slide about the Stuxnet and the second slide about the Ukrainian power grid attack. And then suddenly the attention span of all your audience will be something like you are trying to, means God only have actually come through you as an avatar and you are trying to uh, save them from the next cyber attack, which is going to happen on their organization. So if you start talking, as Professor Raj said, that in terms of cryptography, in terms of mathematics, in terms of other things, they will never understand. And the only way by which you can convince these people to look cybersecurity more seriously is about portraying all those cyber attacks which has happened in the recent past and then try to drag their attention towards this menace called as the cyber uh, vulnerability and cyber attacks. Particularly when I uh, work and interact with the people working in critical infrastructure, my journey has been made much smoother by the media coverage which has happened for last two years or so, including uh, the recent Mumbai incident uh, of last year. 
so now convincing people about the cyber security has become much more easier ever since such kind of cyber attacks are now growing so in fact uh, in a what we can say silver lining we can say that the awareness about the boardroom people who are main key decision makers in terms of releasing the money funding and the budget for such kind of research projects and awareness program has been actually our life is made simple by the a uh, couple of cyber attacks which has happened in the recent past so i agree with you and with professor raj as well that earlier unlike ai machine learning which was supposed to be much glamorous and the uh, investors and venture, venture capitalists and the board uh, decision makers were pumping in billions of dollar for ai ml the kind of appreciation that cyber security domain was receiving was nowhere anywhere proportional to that but thankfully with the recent uh, cyber incidences which has happened suddenly their attention has came to the cyber security as well so i think maybe our journey for next couple of years will be made easy by those cyber attacks so in a wrong sense we say that periodically <coughs> some kind of incidents to awaken uh, people and policy makers in this direction so i was just i was just going to say that it's only in a cyber security conference where you can consider that these attacks are a good thing in some shape or form we'll all take it in the right spirit professor pavel is what is your view on this indeed i totally agree with uh, both professor that on one hand all those um um uh, very um tech aspects of uh, cyberspace and uh, cryptography as, as you mentioned professor are sometimes hard to explain um, to sea level, as you mentioned. But I uh, totally agree with uh, 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 Professor Farouk that um, we need, and it, nowadays I think it's easy because there are so many uh, uh, sub events and sub incidents nowadays, day by day. And um, even uh, for my presentations, you know, when I want to prove something or to demonstrate something, you know, I just need to find the relevant uh, um, hack, the relevant uh, uh, cyber incidents, and to demonstrate my my cause. Um, the issue is that um, to motivate, in this case, the students to expand their knowledge and. Uh, if I look from our academic institutions, um, I'm the head of sub studies under the information, information system school. Um, we are now in a peak of a number of students and we have a kind of a, um, um, day uh, track and we have an evening track for students that work uh, during the day. And um, we have now a, a, a peak of uh, the number of students because there are, uh, are much more students that uh, uh, would like to study about cyber and cyberspace. And what we are trying to do in this, as I mentioned, the umbrella approach of mine is to include courses uh, and to provide uh, a wide range of knowledge. For example, my courses are uh, the first is, uh, is, uh, is um, social aspects in the subspace. And the second is tourism in the internet, tourism in the subspace, <clears throat> which means to give them broad uh, a perspective of what is the subspace. Um, I encourage my students try to read about daily cyber events, not necessarily from local media outlets, it can be uh, um, even uh, WhatsApp, Telegram uh, channels, uh, Facebook group, uh, or uh, of course, a global uh, media outlet. But please read, because when you expose to uh, cyber events that happen, you have not only much more knowledge, but your perspective is totally changed. You do not look from your local perspective, but you now understand uh, uh, just for example, that the cyber attacks during COVID-19 against uh, 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 the healthcare sector uh, from the global perspective. So uh, basically nowadays, as, as uh, uh, Professor Frog just mentioned, it's easier to demonstrate the importance and the necessity 
of uh, cyber studies, cyber knowledge, and um, not only from uh, uh, not only within the academic institutions. I do believe in all my heart that um, we need to provide those. It can be called cyber hygiene. It can be uh, you know uh, be uh, issues of uh, uh, um, anonymity and privacy, but we should provide relevant digital, even if it's not uh, to call it cyber, but we need to provide digital knowledge to everyone from the kindergarten to the third age. Um, it's our obligation. But thanks for that. And I think I've just, uh, you, you touched upon uh, privacy and even uh, Professor Mutubishan talked about the GDPR in some countries, not in some countries and where data is available. But if we look at it from the whole cyber first and, you know, coming back to the title of the session, cyber first and this and the next generation, is our current generation, I mean, I want to say the young generation, but actually I would include all of us into it to say this whole issue of privacy. Uh, is it a is it a continuum of when we talk about cybersecurity? Is it a part of cybersecurity? And what is it that we need to do? Build how do we build awareness around the importance of privacy? Where do we even begin? And uh, so uh, you know, I can we have about three minutes left. So if I can just have. Uh, I can start with Professor Muthuprishnan on that and then just go to Professor Kazi and uh, Professor Pavel on this. So what, what do we need to educate people on privacy and how? I, I don't think we can educate people. I think people know what the privacy is. So I think this is somewhere I think governments can make an uh, upper hand on it. And I see, for example, the level of pressure that the big boys have been put under by the US government, the European government, they really make every attempt now not to uh, tamper with personal data, with right to be forgotten. Uh, there is a new GDPR, uh, uh, sorry, there's a new change that coming for uh, AI models in Europe, which is just in draft stage. And uh, I was part of the uh, commission, which was reviewing this draft document that, uh, how do you make sure that the data that you're processing is transparent to the individual, transparent to the individual who actually owns this data? And on the right to be forgotten, if they ask you to remove that data, how do you then still maintain the accuracy of the machine learning models? Which is a very hard problem to address in terms of maintaining privacy at the same time, creating the utility of the data. So I think the way I see privacy can be influenced is through government policies and laws, which as far as I see in Europe, it is uh, the level of fines that has been imposed in the last uh, year or so during lockdown, starting with the British Airways fine uh, and colleagues spoke about, and then the ICO, our information commissioner's office put a heavy fine on Marriott hotels. And now after that, I teach on the business school, Cyber Essentials, which is every company, I teach around 300 plus startups in London, to get cyber essential, which is a certification to show the government that you have the basic hygiene in place to protect against any external or internal cyber threats. So this kind of certification and kind of uh, laws and uh, guidelines defined by governments is the best way. Then once it's like been pushed by the government, we all have to follow. But otherwise people are aware in the Europe, more people are now aware than five years ago, how Facebook or other big players use their data, but still, we continue to use it because we want some of the services they provide. And that is where this kind of, we are willing to share our privacy for specific utilization of, of services we have. And that's the biggest challenge. As I say, the only way is to you know, unplug our computers, which none of us will do. We'll all talk everything. But in the next minute I will do is go back into my Instagram and see what is the next message. So we cannot live without this connectivity. So we are aware of privacy, but I see the only way is not through education. I think people are aware in the European or Western world, it's just the government policies have to be very stringent and hard so that uh, you know it gets into the system quite easily. Thank you. Very interesting. Professor Pavel, your thoughts? Well, um, of course, there is uh, an importance of uh, laws and regulations and, and certificates and uh, 
uh, initiatives like uh, GDPR and the right to be forgotten, um, no doubt at all. Um, but um, as you say, uh, Professor Rajaraj, Rajan, uh, I do not know if you'll take the layman in the street and ask him what do we know and what um, does he know about the right to be forgotten or GDPR or um, a cyber policy or anonymity or privacy, he'll know something about it. So it's important to have indeed regulations and, and, and certificates and governmental initiatives. But I think that, um, I don't know if more important, but at least the same importance is to education, because if you have the right to be forgotten, but if you ask someone on the street, what is the right to be forgotten? Are you aware for your right to be forgotten by Google, for example? And he knows nothing about it, so he has no right to be forgotten. And um, if there is a, a, a GDPR, but nobody knows about it, I mean, the ordinary end users. So, so what are our rights? And do we use our rights um, as well? So regulations are important, but the implementation of such and is through education. We can have certificates, but if it will not infiltrate into the end user, the importance of certificate. Go study and, and, and improve yourself and knowledge. It will be just, you know, certificate uh, 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 without infiltration of, uh, of the knowledge. But can I just uh, challenge you on that point? Because I think as a layman, my wife will never go and read a GDPR. So even if I educate uh, the 42 pages of GDPR, she still doesn't know what it means. Of course, so the only way I see is how these companies like Google and Facebook have been pushed in to put, you know, alerts and things. And the way I think the education happened is we have been warned that this data might be used. And I quickly see a cap snapshot of this data and I say, OK, this means they are going. So when that is being enforced by policy and that expect the company has been expected to follow those guidelines, then otherwise none of us are going. I'm not a lawyer. You're not. You know, many of us are not, we are never going to read all these laws and regulations to go through it. So I see this has to be a built in part of every system. Privacy has to be built in so that it protects us rather than me thinking, oh, do I have right to be forgotten? Do I need to, you know, look at my cookies? Do I need to go and delete my history? I should uh, be thinking. Professor Raju Rajan, I'm sorry, I have to come in between here. Uh, we are, uh, our time is up. So we need to wrap up. Uh, uh, sure. Just a quick, uh, humble reminder. Yeah. We have to wrap Thank up you. this right now. Sure. sure. Thanks a lot. I just, I just request Professor Kazi for any last closing remarks uh, for a very interesting discussion. But you know, uh, everyone's had their say, so I just leave it to you to end this session. Well, I totally agree with what Professor Ra said with respect to the privacy, because this is something which is required to be enforced by a strong regulation by government, because the players who are involved in this are having superpower basically. So we need to have at least country like India, we need to have strong regulation uh, so as to ensure the privacy. I do agree with whatever Professor Ra said with respect to that. Well, thank you so much. Uh, as I figured out, even when I met you earlier, was this is a topic that is very vast, very broad, but tremendous insights. I've learned a lot in this session personally, uh, enjoyed it thoroughly. Thank you very much. And I'm sure this is going to spawn a number of panel discussions and talks. So looking forward to educating this and the next generation. So thank you very much and namaste. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care, guys. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you, everyone. With that, uh, we have come to an end of our today's uh, program. This last session of Cyber First, this and next session of the next session. We would like to thank our moderator and uh, all of our panelists for being uh, on our uh,
Hello everyone, I would like to thank our tier one partner, Microsoft, for supporting SERI and publication partner, Taylor and Francis, for publishing the SERI paper proceedings. With 60 plus speakers and 13 plus enriching sessions, I hope it was a great experience for all of you today. Promoting cybersecurity research is one of the main agenda of National COE, and we have launched utilities for the cybersecurity enthusiasts like you all. So please feel free to visit our website, www.ncoe.in, and click on utilities on the top navigation bar and enjoy 45 days of free trial. I look forward to seeing you all next year. Till then, please take care and be cyber smart. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you.